topic. Corporate counsel play a critical but often underappreciated role in the company's success. They must interface well with a wide range of stakeholders and balance competing interests to help their business stay ahead of the competition. In the post-pandemic world, outside counsel will need to recognize new challenges and opportunities and remain effective and relevant. And they need to have a global mindset because whether it's patents or trademarks, privacy or other tech issues, uh, even in the hospitality and food industry, and we've been reminded even in chips and computers, supply chains are global and the pandemic vividly reminds us of how interconnected we are. In fact, this morning, President Biden in the White House at this very moment is also convening his own gathering of leaders for uh, climate change. So we need a roadmap to figure out how best to go about navigating this post-pandemic world. And I hope today we'll start finding uh, solutions to work together across industries and across countries. And I can assure you that we at the IP Centre have marshaled the best minds for this, and we are at the forefront of that effort. Uh, today's programme features experienced in-house counsel as well as outside counsel. And we'll touch on issues in IP and tech through honest and practical means. It's a discussion format, not talking heads, and we'll be touching on really pertinent and timely issues, thinking globally, acting locally, best practices and strategies, tips for patent prosecution, licensing and litigation, brand versus budget, and diversity in the profession. And of course, we'll have a keynote session with uh, Jan Flozek, 3M's Chief IP Counsel and Advisory Board Member Esther Lim will be the moderator for that session, aptly entitled Innovation That Sticks, Engineering IP Internationality and Inclusiveness, which really touches on all the key themes we're going to talk about today. Third and finally, I want to also acknowledge our annual sponsors and partners uh, and event sponsors and our international institutional sponsors category we've introduced to recognize nonprofits that do great work in contributing to uh, both the IP fraternity, uh, IP uh, group that we are in, both nationally, locally, internationally, but also other non-IP nonprofits like Rotary International, for example. A special shout out to the IP Law Association of Chicago, uh, President Erin Lothson, who is with us today. She'll be here on the second panel. We are very collegial here in Chicago. And in fact, uh, IPLAC is having a talk next week for folks who are thinking of making the transition to becoming corporate counsel. So do chat Erin and she can give you the details. I'll probably stick to my job, but I have signed up for that talk yesterday and I'm looking forward to it. Also want to recognize advisory board members Adam Kelly, Joe Marie Fredericks, Lisa Dunner and Mark Campania who have all stepped up. You'll see them on the program and they have helped me find the best people for the panels you'll be hearing from today. So, And finally, I want to thank uh, our student ambassadors and staff for helping work hard behind the scenes and make the on time. So again, welcome. I look forward to learning about the developments in the world of IP tech from a corporate council perspective. I hope you have an enjoyable day with us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to kick off this conference um, with a truly global um, panel. I'd like to introduce the panel. Uh, First, uh, Christopher Chan, EVP Legal and Government Affairs at Lazada and General Counsel of Lazada SG in Singapore. Ali Yuljin, partner Neil Gerber and Eisenberg out of Illinois. Sarah Lochner, Chief Trademark Counsel at Ecolab in Minnesota. Peter Moody, Principal of Red Pie Consulting in the UK and Kenneth Eng, a client liaison principal USA, Davies Collison and Cade out of Tennessee. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 
Good morning. Good morning. Hey. Good morning. So, excited Good evening. To discussion. Good evening. Yes, Christopher. Um, one thing that has, has struck me is when you go in house, sometimes you are the first, sometimes you are the only IP or trademark counsel. And when that happens, I'd love to know what, what's the first thing you do? Panic. <laughs> You're like, oh crap, what do I do now? Who do I ask? And, and what do you do when you panic? So when the panic fades, what is the first thing that you would, you would do on your first day? I can take this one for a little bit, Ainsley. <clears throat> I'm Chris. Um, uh, I, I moved from the United States as IP litigator to join a tech startup in Singapore as their first lawyer uh, and help them grow the business. It's an e-commerce grocery business that we eventually sold to Alibaba Group. And now I'm an EVP within the Alibaba Group under their Southeast Asia entity. Um, my general tip for when you get there is you really need to just learn the business. So I went from doing a lot of pharmaceutical work uh, to having to learn all about supply chains, logistics, e-commerce, and marketing. And then from there, you can actually assess why do you need the IP, show them why there's value, and decide whether you need to file or not. Um, and candidly, in APAC, it's very different how you file IP and the strategy you take out here than what you do in the United States. So before coming in and shaking everything up, my big recommendation is understand your market, understand your business, and then start making a plan versus just acting quickly. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll chime in too. I've never been the first. I have been the only, so I'm a trademark and marketing counsel. Um, but I, I have started new jobs and walked in as being the only uh, trademark and marketing counsel in a, in a company. And, and while it certainly differs from being the first, um, I still, you know, I echo what um, Christopher has said, which is, you know, one of the first things I do, and I probably do it before because I do it when I am interviewing, but I read the annual report if it's a public company, give an idea of where they're at, what they're doing, what they're focusing on, their markets. Um, but I, I look at the portfolio, I cross-check that against the annual report, I reach into the business members. Oftentimes, you know, most companies do business strategy planning on a yearly basis or at least they're updating their five-year strat plan on a yearly basis. So I try to get access to that information to allow me to say, okay, you know, I'm at Ecolab. Where is the institutional business going? Where is the food and beverage business going? What jurisdictions are they focused in? What, what marketing lines, what brands? Um, to really give me an idea of where should my focus be? Where are my gaps? Um, and, and where do I need to, to educate them on, on why my role is important and why the IP portfolio is important. I'll, uh, I'll chime in a little bit, um, um, but um, I, I was in-house for 10 years. I no longer am in-house, but um, I built the trademark department first at Kohler uh, up in Wisconsin, and then subsequently at Illinois Tool Works, uh, two very different companies. Um, and uh, I agree with both Chris and Sarah. The first step really is to understand why you were hired um, and really learn to read between the lines. Um, also look at their strat plan, their five-year plan, um, read between the lines, have your own interpretation of where, you know, where the portfolio needs to be, what tools you need, what sort of budget you need, um, who you need to get the budget from, what they need to hear, um, how, how they hear. Um, so, you know, for me, it wasn't about, um, explaining uh, what I needed, but rather showing what I needed. Um, but, you know, I'd love to turn the question back to you, Ainsley, because you've done the same thing uh, with Starwood and now with WeWork. I will say, I, I don't know if I did that at Starwood, learn um, the business first, which was my mistake. And, <laughs> but, um, you know, survived nonetheless. Um, but at WeWork, I absolutely, you know, learned the business and I just had two new hires. And the first thing I told them the first two days, I want you to read up all about WeWork and about co-working. So if I make the comment, uh, I think it just shows how in-house counsel 
take seriously their alignment with the business, which I, I think is amazing just as a, as a lawyer. Um, and with that, I, I'd love to hear everyone's experience. I know when you go in-house, you are sometimes charged with building an IP portfolio, including the trademark portfolio. I would say sometimes in a, an extraordinary short time. Would love to hear about your experiences with that, strategies and any tips, even as outside counsel, what you would recommend to your clients. Ainsley, can I can I just finish off on the last the last point about Please. what you do when what you do when you go in house? Because it seems to me that, that that actually the difference between what you do when you go in house and when you're external counsel isn't radical whatsoever. Because every client that you work for as external counsel, you need to find out about their business. You need to immerse yourself in the business. You need to do the things Ken said. You need to find out what the budgets are. You need to find out where the gaps are. And, and you need to, to reflect everything the business is doing. So the, the, the basic skill sets is very much the same, depending on the level of time and input you can afford to have, particularly relating to budgets. But it does seem to me that those skill sets in-house or out-house are precisely the same. And, and they're all about management skills, personal management skills and interpersonal management skills. Well, Peter, you 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 have an interesting role because um, you know um, just a bit, a bit of background. Peter represents celebrity chefs in partnering with uh, hospitality companies, um, and I would imagine uh, you tell me that each hospital, each each celebrity chef you deal with, is like its own company, and you are the chief IP counsel for that <laughs> chef when you take him on as a client. Yeah, I have to know what they cook, Ken. That's the, that's the secret <laughs> to my to my role. <laughs> it, no, but that, yeah, that's very true. I mean, but it, but I I think that's across the spectrum. It's not just with my my clients who are who are chefs or restaurant businesses or nightclubs. You know, you you need to immerse yourself in the business to understand what their what the what the objectives are, because that's the that's the way in which you can best deliver legal services, whether you're in or out, outside counsel. I think. Um, but my, yeah, I'm very lucky because my my world is a is, is a fun world, you know. So I'm not and and a variety as well. So that's the great thing about being outside counsel as against to as against in house counsel. You know, I get to see twenty, thirty, forty different celebrity chefs uh, at a time, as opposed to just being inside in, in in one of the larger corporates in that sector, which which does mean I get to eat a lot of different food and see a lot of different cooking. You're quite right. Fantastic. You. Okay. And so um, following up on the question of, hey, how do you build an IP portfolio, grow your trademarks in a record amount of time? Does anyone have any thoughts or want to share their experience and strategies? Really depends on what kind of company you're, you're helping out. But I can speak from the experience of different startups. Um, I've worked and sold a few startups uh, in, and lucky enough to do so. But in an early stage, a lot of people are not willing to put the money into IP issues. So my general advice is, you know, get the domain names, get the social media, the cheap free stuff or cheaper free stuff, and then file one mark that really a word mark in the, in the region you're going for and spend as minimal amount of money as possible. I know for at least my Singapore entities, uh, many different countries have different grants, which actually cover the cost of filing if you're a, a SME or small medium enterprise business. And we were able to get our initial filings, most of them covered uh, by different government grants, which is another great thing because if you're a cash trapped startup, you're not gonna wanna spend five to 15,000 per uh, trademark. And again, the biggest tip I give to startups when I advise them is get the social media accounts that you can at least have some kind of foothold. That's all free. That's very fast. That's very easy um, to do so. Um, but for bigger companies, the strategy is completely different. And you know, I'm sure others on the call can attest to that a lot better than I can. So Chris, I had a question. Um, with a startup, I've only ever worked for billion dollar companies, um, but with a startup, where do you put the things that you've acquired? Do you do you buy the database first? Because uh, I would imagine for the most, you just put in an Excel spreadsheet and figure it out later on. Honestly, startups, they don't have these big data. 
They start with Google Docs and things like that, spreadsheets. Uh, it's when you start raising serious money that you start evolving and, and getting uh, higher standards. So, you know, I, I was hired as the first lawyer for the company, not the first IP person for the company. IP is a small part of it, but the main part is just get the business going. You know, you could have the best IP in the world, but if you don't last and have a profitable, uh, you know, Q1, then you're not going to have a business. So yeah. you make a lot of decisions early on as a company based on what your business model is and what your growth strategy is. So again, it goes back to what I said before. If, you, if you're going to try to join a tech company or a startup company, you really need to understand the business intimately to understand what the growth and exits are for you. Uh, and it's not easy. And a lot of it does not actually require IP early on. Uh, candidly, when you get your first seed round of funding or maybe your series A, that's when you would take it a little more seriously. Uh, but when you're just the guy in the garage, um, you know, get the social media. Just do that quickly. Okay, Ainsley, what I when I am advising clients who are in startup mode, the first thing I try and do from a from a, a, an external lawyer point of view is giving them a shopping list. So I will work out, you know, what their requirements are, produce that shopping list, and then start working through priorities and what's affordable. Because as Chris says, you don't go for the, you know, a worldwide trademark on day one and spend all the money they haven't got before they get up and running. So it's very much a question of, uh, and, and Chris is absolutely right again, that unless you understand the business's priorities, you can't input into that. You can draw up the shopping list, but you then have no way of actually deciding how best you can help a startup and how best you can help them build their, the foundation for the business. And it's really about that. It's that foundation. We'd all love to go away and, you know, have a perfectly formed entity before you before you get running, but uh, but it but it's not not usually possible financially. Perfectly running entity right before the due starts. <laughs> <laughs> and keep your fingers crossed that those horrible things don't come out of the woodwork. The idea of a shopping list, Peter. I think that's a great tip. Um, does anyone else, Sarah? Well, I think, it, you know, from my perspective, it, it differs a little bit. Um, my, my background is probably a little more akin to, to Kenneth, which have typically worked with bigger entities where there's already a trademark portfolio. Well, maybe not for you, Ken, but for me, the, the trademark portfolio was there. Um, what I'm thinking about as you guys are talking um, is, I mean, a couple of things. One, even though there's trademark portfolio there, it doesn't necessarily match what's being done in the business. Um, I think yeah. it can get forgotten and lost. And so you have to, you know, you have to remind people as they're moving forward into new jurisdictions or into new markets, or, you know, they're taking the Ecolab brand from sanitizers and disinfectants to, you know, a different product or service line, service offering, or taking it to, you know, right now Ecolab Science Certified in, in front of a customer, a consumer versus a B2B customer. There's things that we have to look at from a trademark portfolio standpoint. But also, I mean, we're, we're launching new products all the time and whether we should be or not, those new products oftentimes come with new brands. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. there is a little bit of the shopping list, Peter, with each new brand that comes to say, okay, yes, you wanna launch a new brand. Now here's what you need to do to make sure that you're protected. And um, you know, from our perspective, you know, a little bit of what we do is proactive, right? Hey, we're planning on going into these five jurisdictions within the next six months, but where are we planning to go in the next five years? And let's make sure we get that filing, the clearance done, the filing done, and maybe not even where are we planning to go, but where could our competitors and or, um, you know, counterfeiters be as well to make sure that we're covered in those jurisdictions. So it's, it's looking at, it, it, it's, it's a little bit of what you do from a, you know, brand new, but you know, there's just different things to consider. And, and also, I mean, I, I don't have a budget either oftentimes to work with. So it's being really thoughtful about um, prioritizing, you know, where we go because my budget is, you know, pretty small. So where do we need to go first? Um, you know, can we use a Madrid, et cetera? Like how do we get there and still protect as much as we can knowing that it won't be perfect. You will not get perfection, yeah. I don't think, in anywhere, typically. <laughs> get comfortable with it. Totally agree with that, my gosh. Go, go ahead. Was that Lee? I, yeah, it was a really important aspect of 
said it was really just getting like, down a little bit is educating and educating the business team because I think a lot of um, um, a lot of times uh, you know the, the you know, even the smartest business leaders you know if I've registered my trademark in the United States in one class I'm good wide I'm good it's uh, sometimes to to change that understanding but if you can align the business uh, on sort of the the basic it helps them understand help the, helps them align with versus our best allocate our panel about is there's more pressure now than ever to align resource expenditure with with the aim of the business it's definitely the the 80 every day you know where is 80 where are 80 percent of your sales going to come from we need to focus our legal resources you know on, on those endeavors my only comment to that uh, uh to 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 this question really is um one of the most important things i've learned in-house was really change your frame what is your frame is your frame this today this week or five years and if you increase your frame to five years, you give yourself a lot more breathing room. Where am I now? Where do I want to be? Where does the company want to be in five years? And then fundamentally, what needs to happen this year before um, we do things the year after that and the year after that? It gives you the breathing room to develop a long-term um, strategy. It gives you flexibility in budgeting, yes, there's all these, this is shopping list that you need to, 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 you can't afford it. You can't afford it in terms of time. You can't afford it in terms of uh, money. Um, sometimes you just can't afford it in terms of like dealing with so many people. You, you just have to, you know, like I can only deal with these three people right now. Um, and so sitting down and looking at that five-year plan and then prioritizing um, uh, how you handle things, things don't have to be the same. You know, you could outsource a lot of stuff in the first year and then in the second, third year, start to bring stuff in as you gain some uh, structure in your operation. Um, uh, the only other thing I would add is that this task um, is so much easier if you go in-house and you already have uh, a, a group of people that you trust. Uh, I once, you know, brought in. Uh, we we once brought in at ITW a uh, new uh, new group council, and uh, she looked at me and was like, uh, "I don't know how to do this." And I said, "Well, surround yourself with people you trust. And if you don't have people you trust, I'm going to introduce you to people I I trust, and you can start from there." Right? She's she's now general counsel in a in a in a company in Chicago, because um, people you trust not just uh, take your instructions, they take your problem from you, they solve the problem, they, uh, they know how to set up the, 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 the billing to get themselves paid, uh, and they help you manage your budget. They, they take it off your brain, basically. Um, and when you get there, it's, it's, it's super great because they're really a part of, they're anticipating your questions if, if you have a team like that. An excellent point too. I and I think it pivots well to the next question, which is wait, 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 Aisley. We want to oh. hear from you too. You you've done oh. a lot of this. You built the Starwood portfolio. You you Starwood had like almost no trademarks if I if I'm uh, if I understand. Uh, well, I mean, I used to joke like Sheridan had like a registration for jams and jellies, but not W for <laughs> hotels. So what good does that do me? Um, you know, um, my thought is, I think you have to pick good outside counsel, someone like you said, that you trust well, who you can bounce ideas off of, who hopefully will give you a good price point. Yeah. Um, I think, like Sarah said, two words, Madrid protocol. It's so great. I love it. Um, and I think it is making sure you reach out to your COO, head of development, head of operations, whether you're at a big company or a startup and you align. And one of the best things I did, you know, we, we talked here how you have no tools, you have an Excel spreadsheet. I used to have a map. And with the map, I would color in all the countries we had a, a application or a registration and all the countries we didn't, I put in red. 
Hmm. And when they see it's red, it means stop. You do not have the right to go into that country. And it's amazing how red creates a, an awesome budget and it gets people to understand. <laughs> um, so that, that was my tool. And, and with that, I wanted to ask a question. When you are growing and you are building and you have to act globally, which is massive when you think about it, what are the tools and resources that you need and you ask for? Is it tech? Is it people? Anyone have any thoughts on that? I'll say paralegals. That's me. I'm a lion, Ainsley. Um, uh, I have a what I call a small but mighty team. Um, it's myself and then I have a team of three paralegals. We're all located in um, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, you know, we all um, are in the same location, um, which it has its definite positives. I mean, we're all we're all uh, zooming these days, um, but also you know has some has some drawbacks as well. So if I think about where our business is, we're in 170 plus different countries. Um, we have you know really strong presence in you know Europe, for example, and, and Asia. Um, we're not there. And so, you know, going back to, to one of the things that, that both you and, and Kenneth just spoke about is trusting your outside counsel, right? And mm -hmm. so I have a lot of trust in my outside counsel. Um, you know, I have a really good law firm that I work with in China who I allow to, you know, basically work directly with the business. I'm copied in on communications, but I rely upon them to do some of the, on, you know, on the ground on the street education with them to walk through you know clearance and filing with them um you know i have to rely upon folks in you know in my local council in different jurisdictions to be part of my team and to you know understand what we want to do enough to be able to convey it to the business in the same way that we would convey it to the business and so that's a really important piece so i'd say paralegals and really good counsel are two of the things that that I rely upon. We have a thirty thousand plus trademark portfolio, and we wow. have you know four of us in house to work it. Um, and so you know that that is key from my perspective. I, I would also add that I keep trying to get better tech. So I keep trying to get a better docketing system than than what I have today. And one of the things in that docketing system, one of the things in that platform, Ainsley, is a web, is a map. And I feel like <laughs> I want that map. I just haven't gotten to myself to actually do it manually, <laughs> but I might have to. <laughs> I, I did manual at that time, not fun. Don't recommend it. It's not I, for the faint of heart. I'm really glad you mentioned map, Ainsley, because I, I chanced upon a map myself back in 2005, around the time we, we, we would have met, I think. Um, and my map was less so in terms of filing. My map was because the general counsel jumped on my back after I'd spent a million dollars uh, um, uh, largely in China. Um, and, you know, no amount of spreadsheets would... Um, calm her anxiety uh, over the fact that, you know, I was spending her hard earned money. Um, and so I came home, I pulled down a map, it was a digital map, and I create buttons on the map every time we had a case. And I hyperlinked those buttons to a, a synopsis of each case, a photograph. And that took me three weeks to put together, mostly, mostly nights and weekends. And then I sent it up to the GC and the, the CEO. And you know, uh, I, I got a very positive feedback. I never got flack for budget after that. They 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 open the first couple of pages and go, oh, that's what you're doing. Okay, got it. Um, and since then, so this was 2006, 2007. I've just reminded myself: show, don't tell. Tell doesn't tell doesn't always work. Showing uh, these executives in C-suites, they look at pictures. There's bar charts, pie charts, um, trend lines, um, and you use that coupled with storytelling, um, effective storytelling. Uh, you learn to edit your words so that you can say what you really needs to be said in less than a minute, because they don't they don't they don't necessarily always give you a whole lot of time. Um, 
What about you, Peter? Yeah, uh, how do you do it? Uh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. I was just saying that uh, I thought the map was my secret weapon. Uh, we do a map for our client coverage at the end of every year. Uh, it sounds like others on the panel are also using that tool because I, I find that, uh, you know, uh, business executives are visual, uh, just like like saying. Um, the other point I wanted to make, Sarah, building on, on what you were saying, you know, in terms of trying to, to build counsel around the um, um, extremely valuable, valuable and, and what, what there are some counsel in jurisdictions that simply what you want to do what you want to find and then they'll do it it's really not good enough and if if that's what you're all you're along with me or with my colleagues you need to add value you know be proactive come to us you know what is what is the business trying to marks are a priority and I feel like there's like counsel, you know, relationship that that adds can help me understand things work in in the particular jurisdiction we're talking about, so that we can align the spend in that jurisdiction with with getting the most bang for the buck. Yeah, I think I think I'd echo what um, what Lee said in in some respects. What I would have responded to your question, Ken, was say that for for me, having a, an extensive outside council network in other jurisdictions is founded on personal relationships. Mm. Now that's that's very difficult to do from from day one. But you know, I'm I'm lucky enough or unlucky enough to be old in the tooth and have been around a few times. Um, and over the years, I've built up a superb network of, of contacts globally. Um, and, and the ability just to pick up the phone to somebody and speak to them and know who you're speaking to and know that, they're, that they respond in a positive way to you because they don't want to let you down as a friend, as a colleague, that you, you get a different level of response. And I think you, you get that added value when you know people. So it's all very well getting a directory and picking it up and going to the best law firm. But, but law is about people as much as anything else. And if you get the right people on your team, wherever they are, they can add a tremendous amount of value and make your life an awful lot easier. That's so that's, that's, that's how I work. Law is about people. That's awesome. <laughs> well, we're, we're people. <laughs> I would add a couple more things because uh, at this point now, I'm, we're a billion dollar company that started with two guys in a van, uh, or multi-billion dollar company. Uh, but at the very early stage, I would say um, cheap tools. I used to set up a lot of Google alerts on my brand and my business and also my competitors. Uh, and these Google alerts will flash up when things are coming out in the region. And that was a cheap, free, fast tool to stay abreast of the market and know your business, one thing. Uh, I would say nowadays I have many teams that work on things and give me reports and a lot of technology that really makes my life a lot easier. Uh, but one thing that is really crucial for me is actually, we have a pretty detailed competitor analysis map to see what our competitors are doing. Cause we're, I'm in the e-commerce space. It's quite cutthroat out in Southeast Asia. And uh, there's a lot of money being thrown around, a lot of different companies, a lot of competitors, and a lot of potential growth. So we're, grow we're, we're one of these companies that grows over 100% year on year and have been for the past you know, decade. Wow. So with that kind of pace, uh, you're gonna have a lot of uh, interesting ha things happening and a lot of people jumping in the market here. So I know that the title of this is, uh, you know, uh, acting local, thinking global or something like that. but you know, there's a lot of things that are, I'm based out in Singapore uh, and I'm managing Southeast Asia. Most people don't recognize that the population in Southeast Asia is over 600 million, which is double the population in the United States. And this is really one of the high growth areas in the world right now. And, uh, you know, when I had the opportunity to move out here, it was mainly in part because I saw that 50% of the world's GDP is coming out of Asia now. It's no longer so Euro and American centric. And to be able to have the skills of a US lawyer I mean, I was a, a lawyer for Finnegan Henderson for almost a decade, a Fed Circuit clerk. Bringing some of these IP skills out to Asia have been uh, immensely beneficial to my, my career out here. And I think it's something that I'd love to see more people from you know, the US coming out to Asia and, and making an impact. Um, and I think that's something that I highly encourage. So especially for more of the younger lawyers on here, you know, this think globally is it's a real thing that you should try to take advantage of at this point. 
And I would say the easiest way to come out here is to join a early stage tech company uh, or a startup, because at that point they can use all the help they can get and they don't want to pay a lot for it. So you need to re re restart your career out here. It's a fun thing to do. Yeah. I only have one other thing to add, which is, um, you know, I was in manufacturing companies for, for, for many years and they say in manufacturing, if you want a guy to perform 10% better, he's just going to work harder. If you ask a guy to perform 500% um, better, um, the answer is change the process. Um, and change the, the process is what I experienced in-house. Um, how do I mean? If you need a database, you don't have to buy one. I call my buddy and I say, I'm going to rent your database. I'll, I'll, I'll pay you per record or I'll pay you a, you know, a flat fee. Um, prosecution, I took all prosecution off emails. Uh, they became a phone call. Uh, I could fast track um, those interactions. Um, reporting of filing instructions, also completely off email. Don't report to me, report to my database, um, the database that I rented. Um, and along the lines of what Chris Chan said, even though I work for a billion dollar corporation, I was building a department. I didn't have a whole lot of political capital at the early stages. I didn't have um, a really well-defined budget as yet because you're you're, and all the while you you know they're buying companies. They're 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 still ongoing litigation. It can feel like a startup in that sense. And um, I think that was a, a really huge lesson for me is that you don't have to have all the answers if you surround yourself with people you trust. Um, you can cobble together a good enough answer or sometimes even better answer. And I've learned that in the process of, in, in the, the practice of law, the procedures we adopt that we learn in a law firm are not always applicable in a, in a company. Um, you know, if you count the number of steps it takes to file a trademark application and file a, a pen application, there's a lot of those steps you can strip out without losing any quality over the quality of the patent or the trademark. Um, yet you're paying for each of those steps. So if you start to strip those steps out and you go, all right, well, I, you know, out of a portfolio of filings, uh, I'm gonna get 80, 90% of, the, of these filings. Um, and really what I want is that certificate and a registration date. Right? Well, just, you know, put it in the cloud, we're done. Uh, I don't really want to talk about it. I don't want to spend time looking at it. Uh, if you send me an email, I don't know where to put this email. So anyway, that. I love that everyone is thinking of um, inexpensive tools because that goes a long way. Um, before we go to our next question, I just want to note that there are some questions in the chat. Some I will leave to the oh. end and some will weave in throughout. And one of them um, is what what um, software did you use for these maps? For me, it was WebTMs. I don't know if anyone else has that. I use PowerPoint. Go ahead, Sarah. Sorry. I was going to say, no, that's the one I want, Ainsley. <laughs> that's the one I've been asking for for three years now. <laughs> a good one. Um, I, I will say I just did a sub license from my uh, law firm. And it's like a, a very small percentage of the price and it was wonderful and they house it and they take care of all the server issues. So, um, but I, I think WebTMs everyone loves, Lee. Yeah, I think, uh, I think a lot of the docketing software, um, including CPA, CPA, I think they both have uh, map functionality now. And I, I think my, my understanding and I've seen it at function is, you know, it can be done with a couple clicks of a button. So it's uh, it's pretty user friendly. And, and again, the output is valuable for, for giving people a picture of, of what they have. So we touched on it a little bit, but since we are talking about, um, you know, acting locally, I, I'd like to talk about the local council. And well, a lot of us are in hospitality. It's not something I think is common among local council to have hospitality background. Um, I'm just curious, 
How do you use them? Do you do any training on issues specific to your industry? How do you engage local council? Even if you're outside council, the local agents you use, what do you do in order for them to understand the client so they can um, get the best success? My first question when I take well, an outside thing. council is I ask them, what's the last thing you ordered on my shopping platform? And how was your experience? And you'd be surprised how many people don't answer that correctly. Um, <laughs> but for me, I'm in the e-commerce industry. You need to use my platform. You need to know what kind of mechanics I have. After I onboard them, I usually take them down to my warehouses and I have them pack groceries for half of a day and uh, take customer service calls. And so they really understand that what we do. Uh, and this is not for all my outside counsel, but the ones I really want to build a relationship with, uh, or I have a relationship in some other fashion. Going to Peter's point, like I'm lucky to have a good network of international lawyers I met when I was a very young lawyer and that I've taken advantage of when I moved out to Asia, um, that I met through different bar associations. One of them is the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association, uh, also the ABA and also INTA and AIPLA. Those have been, as a young lawyer, those were really great to find uh, mentors and people and business contacts who never knew that that, you know, peppy first year associate would one day be a general counsel. Um, but I'm glad they took a liking to me back in the day, which is, you know, the world pays itself forward in that sense. Relationships are done. You know, one thing that uh, several of our clients do that I think is invaluable is having regular meetings with all of their global outside virtually you know, in, in the pandemic era or um, like Inta, uh, I think getting everyone in a room, being able to talk to all of them about, you know, the direction of the business's priorities, um, you know, the, the way the business functions, all of those, because again, is that each of those outside counsel understands the business, this is, they can, you again, as opposed to just being that conduit of what's really, you need to add more than that. Ainsley, I'm I'm uh, I'm very lucky because the industry I'm in is one which most lawyers are quite interested in as well, even from a personal point of view. So if I go to an outside council in a particular jurisdiction, you can bet the bottom dollar that they're they're out eating in the local restaurants or in the you know they're visiting the the hotels in the region so so inevitably they they have a view on things and, and most of the people that i tend to act for have you know pretty good reputations whether it's in the best 50 restaurants or best 100 restaurants in the world or or michelin stars so they've generally speaking heard of those those chefs and those those restaurants or those organizations so it's so so they there's there's a there's a knowledge there already, which I can build on. Um, it is about educating them in, in, in the particular demands of that particular client and that particular project. But most of my international work is, is the fundamentals of it are, are not just registration of trademarks or, or anything else. It's the commercial agreements normally where I'm taking a restaurant, uh, you know, a, a named chef opening a new restaurant in a new hotel. I mean, I've just I've just finished a, a, a deal in Qatar. I've got a four restaurant deal just closing in Saudi Arabia. I've got a restaurant opening in a ho new hotel in Dubai, you know, Bangkok, uh, Hong Kong, um, Australia, you know, the, in all those locations, they're all quite, they're all foodie locations. I mean, it, it's a, it's a, it's a perfect industry to be in. So, and, and it's a fairly, unusual one to specialize in in the way I do which means I've got a, a, a real um, a real advantage over most of my competitors because they tend to come in and pick and choose small you know small projects and have the odd client in the sector but I've got such a spread of of concentration in the sector which is really why I'm focused on that sector because it makes my life so much easier um, and I, and I think um, working in a sector where people have a, a definite interest like food, um, like uh, like hospitality is uh, it, it it makes for an easy life. That's all I can say, and an enjoyable one. Just one, Sarah. <laughs> do you have anything? 
Well, I'll have to say that I think most of my uh, local council and outside council have become much more familiar with sanitizers and disinfectants and the distinction between cleaning products in the last year and a half. So um, <laughs> that wasn't even my doing. Um, but uh, no, not, not, not much to add. I, I really echo what, what everyone else has said. I mean, there's a couple things that opportunities that that I have when working with council to to make sure that you know they get up to speed on who we are, um, you know, understand where we started, um, and you know we're Eco Lab. Eco does not stand for eco friendly or environmental. It stands for economic or economic. Um, and we started out as economic lo laboratory, um, which actually is a a big distinction when you start talking about trying to uh, protect and enforce the Eco Lab mark. Um, from something that now would be perceived to be ecological. Um, but also, you know, we have the Nelka Water University where they can go and, and see how our products, you know, work in the in in real application. Um, you know, I make sure that 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 they that they utilize those opportunities. Um, you know, one of the things, and I know someone mentioned it earlier, it's a lot about understanding my business and what my business wants to do and where we're going but it's also understanding a lot about how I practice as well. And so having trust with my outside counsel is really important. Um, knowing that we're in it together, that, that they work with me and they work for Ecolab, but you know, we're moving the, but we're rowing the boat together. Um, and you know, they understand my budget and how to work within it and, and what I'm really looking for. Like it's, it's a lot of trust. And it goes to personal relationships and making sure that that I feel comfortable um, that, you know, we're going to both own it. You know, if something goes down, we're both in it together, um, <laughs> you know, and, and we share successes and we share losses equally together. Yeah. Ken? I just I just had one thing to add, which is in the realm of trust. And this is, again, something I learned in house. Um, when you trust somebody to do something, you give them your budget, you give them a case, um, everybody screws up. It doesn't matter how good they are, how much they charge per hour. Um, everybody makes mistakes. And um, I've learned to be more, far more forgiving over the years. Um, and and if, you, if you pick the right people, they screw up, and you take the blame for it, even though you had nothing to do with it, uh, uh, you didn't make the mistake, um, the right people are very grateful for having uh, uh, a second chance to redeem themselves. Um, that essentially, if you don't learn how to forgive, um, you can never really truly build trust. Uh, this is true not just with outside counsel, it's true with children too and the relationships in our lives. Um, <laughs> and let's just say I've learned the hard way uh, on, on that as well. Um, and so it, it's a very humbling lesson. Yeah. Uh, that's great, Ken. I will say I am not as forgiving. So <laughs> that is something I will work on. <laughs> Top of the list. Um, but one, one comment I have is I think um, just the world's intelligence is incredible. And so I do not rely on my U.S. counsel exclusively for strategy in different countries. I go to a council in Lebanon that I have a great relationship with, and they help me with tough cases in Ethiopia, in Iraq. And they, because of those relationships, whether it be someone mentioned, I think it was Christopher Inta, et cetera, IP is a wonderful organ, a wonderful type of law because we build these relationships globally and to just reach out to them and say, hey, I loved what you did with this case. I have an issue in this country. It's very difficult. What are your thoughts? What are your recommendations? Do you know someone? And the best example I have is I had to get the Sheridan brand back in Iraq after Saddam Hussein's regime took it over. Um, I needed cool. to do it without any press, any um, issues, and really it was resolved um, just by negotiating and I joke over cups of coffee. And 
it, it was wonderful to see. And that's when you look at your global network and really um, use them and use the friendships that you've um, built over the years. Um, so that would be my one, one point with it. Um, does anyone else have any other um, stories like that? That's hard to top, Ainsley. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you do how did you how did you go about doing that Ainsley? i mean a, a little bit of context here i met ainsley many 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 years ago i think um ainsley knows this i we shared a cab together for like two minutes and she made such an impression and i didn't see her after that for many many years and then you know one year in in, in florida she's sitting next to me and i'm going i've met you 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 I was so impressed when I met you uh, because I was new in house. I didn't know um, how to how 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 to do the job. But my question for you, Ainsley, is um, you know I know that you quite literally built the the, the Starwood portfolio. You you couldn't have had a network as broad at, in the early early days. How did you prioritize? How what was your technique for looking for counsel? Um, um, yeah. I mean, for me, you have to work with people you like, um, who listen, you know, who like what your product is, who appreciate the, the struggles or the stress you have daily. Um, I'm sure when we met that cab in Chicago, I'm sure I was complaining about something and that's why I left it. <laughs> an impression so it's not always easy it was a good impression yeah well you know lucky this time but um I, I think it's that you know i i too had someone say to me early on in my career when i was naive and a sponge and it was uh success is built on personal relationships and you know ken you and i are still friends so many years later and i think you're friends with everyone on this panel I think that's the beauty of IP. Frankly, we have such deep personal relationships that span the globe. Um, so I would say it's it's in line with what everyone's talked about today. Um, that that's how you succeed and in, in, in any organization, startup or billion dollars. Um, and and with that, uh, Lee, did you have something to add? Well, I, I'm sorry. I was just going to, everything you guys have said about personal relationships really resonates with me because there are going to be those thorny issues that arise like, you know, Saddam Hussein's uh, taking your Sheraton brand uh, and, you know, having the, when those issues arise, having those personal relationships ahead of time um, so that you know when you, you know, you at the bad, um, you're in it together and there's already a trust and I think is is invaluable and that's why professional organizations like Inta and others in in this space are so important for helping as a as a younger attorney helping you build those relationships um you know the, the, the that pays dividends in in the decades ahead in in everyone's career thank you and before we go on to another question christopher there's a question for you you mentioned Think Global when it comes to career path. Is being licensed in a country something to consider? It's a good question. Um, it's very hard to get licensed in another direction unless you went to school in the UK and you're going to a UK jurisdiction. Um, I am not licensed to practice in Singapore, but I'm licensed to practice in the United States in several states. Uh, and I manage a team over most of Southeast Asia, and I think we have like 45 lawyers on the team. Um, it's not a blocker, but I would say that I did have a really hard time getting that first job out here overseas uh, as a U.S. lawyer who's had a decade of practice at like top firms and clerkships and things like that. I would say that out here, <laughs> my Fed Circuit clerkship didn't raise anybody's eyebrows. I didn't get any perks for that. Working at a large firm and doing navigation didn't make much of a difference out here either. Um, so when I joined my startup, I had to position myself as basically a, a startup lawyer and somebody who will get stuff done and help you execute. 
A startup wants to grow fast and they want to hear about how do they fundraise and how do they get high growth early. Uh, so I had to study a lot of the businesses before I applied, of course. But I would say that you have to kind of speak the language that you're you're talking to. Um, the other way to get out to Asia or some other jurisdiction is to go to a U.S. company that's expanding overseas and volunteer. And those opportunities do come up. And a lot more companies are setting up operations overseas uh, because everybody's looking to globalization. Uh, when I was a uh, prior to going to law school, I was actually a management consultant. And uh, I was probably 22 years old. And it was when Thomas Friedman wrote the world, the world is flat and people were looking to go over to India or China to get this globalization movement. I volunteered for my consulting company. I got sent to India for over a year as this, you know, 20 something. And I took that experience and came back to the United States and went to law school. But I would say that that overseas experience really helped me grow as a, you know, gain some confidence, learn to think on my feet, but also when it came to interviews with, you know, in the future, it's something that most other people can't really top. Um, so I've traveled back and forth from Asia and US over the past couple of years. And uh, I would say that if you really want to go out there, you guys can connect with me offline. I'm, I'm happy to share some other tips I took, but I don't think you need to get barred there. For sure, it will help you get a job if you are barred outside. Um, but in-house counsel don't necessarily need to be barred in almost any country I know of. So there are opportunities. What I would recommend is you don't come out as a very junior lawyer, though. I think it's very tough to come out as a first first uh, because you just really can't compete. But when you have some experience under your belt, uh, do that. And I gained a lot of experience from my firm, Finnegan. Uh, I know my, my mentor, <laughs> Esther Lim, is one of the panelists later. Uh, she's somebody who reached out to me at a very really early age and got me involved in a lot of different things, opened my eyes to a lot of things, so I owe her a lot. And I found other mentors that really shaped me. But at the firm, I was able to take on a nice portfolio of work. On the side, I was also helping a lot of my friends who were doing startups on the side. You know, just helping them out, not giving them legal advice, but helping them out. But that's how you get your experience. You have to spend those extra hours learning things and doing things so that you can eventually do it. Uh, now I practice M&A, employment law, real estate, uh, and IP. But, you know, when I was getting my legal training, I was an IP lawyer. Uh, in Asia, you're going to be more of a generalist. There's no real need for an IP litigator out here, at least at this point, unless you really, really are doing something very specific. Hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you. And one thing I'll, I'll add is if ever you are at a firm or in-house and you get the opportunity to work outside of the U.S. or work outside of the jurisdiction, do it. I lived in Asia for a while and it is essential to have perspective, not just, you know, maybe this is a philosophical thing, but not just an IP, but in life. Um, so it, it's wonderful. I don't know if anybody else has any um, other experiences of working abroad, but it's it's just the way to, the way to go. Ken? Well, I, I, I won't say that I, um, you know, planned it. Um, I just happened to be born in Singapore. Um, I did, you know, get offered a job to work at the Supreme Court as my first job out of law school. I was a judge. Um, um, it, it's just been somewhat serendipitous, I guess. Um, uh, my observation there, you know, having gone to law school in England, I have a law, law degree in the U.S. as well. Having practiced in Singapore, um, uh, albeit behind the bench, um, I will say that uh, institutionally, there are a whole lot of differences. Um, and when I was there in the mid nineties, IP wasn't really a specialty. Uh, IP was, uh, you know, there were maybe two shops in town. If so, if you're going to do IP full time, uh, there wasn't even an opportunity, uh, far less IP litigation. Uh, today it's a very different, uh, and, uh, today it's a very different scenario. And I must say, along with Chris, there was a time when I seriously considered moving back to Asia. Um, because of the 600 million, because of the one point, how many billion in China? Um, because of the opportunities for growth in that entire region, um, it's it's still booming. Um, and there are so many opportunities um, for people who are connected. Um, you know, a friend reached out once and said, you know, I'd love, you know, I'd love for you to, you know, 
consider being my general counsel. And I, and he, I, and you know, um, and he he was looking at specific skill sets. And I told him, you know, a general counsel is more about his network of people than um, than what he actually knows. Because, frankly, in their region, uh, if you grow up in, you live in Southeast Asia. Each country is very, very small. You're always dipping your toe and your hand, your arm, your head into another country. And each country has diff slightly different cultural rules, different legal rules. So you, you learn very early on to be agile. You know, you, 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 you're code switching all the time. You're code switching languages, you're code switching uh, uh, cultural norms, um, and it becomes your norm to code switch this, 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 this easily. Um, and that's something I think if you grow up you know, in the middle of the United States and haven't traveled very much, might be difficult to adjust to at the uh, at the outset, but it's entirely doable. Ainsley, can I can I just add to to what Ken and, and Chris have said? Um, I I've got a uh, a French legal qualification, and I wouldn't dream of trying to do anything in France. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, I, 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 I regret that uh, I do have to use French lawyers occasionally for, for things in France. But, <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I think if you're talking about broadening, broadening the mind and broadening experience, uh, a, a qualification in another jurisdiction is great from that point of view. But to think you're going to you're going to practice in different jurisdictions using the, the local law is is a big stretch because I, I find it tough enough to practice in one in one jurisdiction to be honest i'm i'm really lucky because english law it, not only is it extremely well respected around the globe so a lot of the time i get to work in english law irrespective of where we're doing deals but obviously it's a, fun, a a basis for an awful lot of legal systems in a lot of countries whether you're talking about singapore or australia or even even uh, still at the moment Hong Kong slightly but that's that's obviously diminishing um, so I think if you if you're thinking about dual qualifying if you're a US lawyer you know do, doing something with English law would be quite a smart move because that would give you some good additional experience internationally but you know the benefit of local counsel is they're steeped in that law and they know what they're doing um, having a background is useful and, and I think it's a, it's a fundamental actually when you know when I'm doing deals in different countries as I said, most of the time they're in English law, so I'm very fortunate. But inevitably, you still have to make sure that there are no issues in, in local law. So from a commercial point of view, I will always get local counsel to do a red flag review for me on an agreement just to make sure. And, and I learned very early on um, that, that, that you, you need to be very respectful of local, um, local, not only customs, but local laws. I, I lawyered a very big deal in a Latin American country, and it was it was a very complex deal with very complex documentation, and I had it double checked by the, the largest law firm in this country, and they came back and they said to me, Peter, you've done a great job. You know, I'm exaggerating. They made quite a few changes, but they came back and they said, you've done a great job, but remember, this agreement is in English, and unless it's in Spanish. It isn't enforceable in this country. Now, I had no idea <laughs> of that. And that would have been a rather fundamental mistake to make. So that made me um, conscious of the fact that I always need to check local law. And it, in addition, I will always do a bit of a dive into local law myself beforehand. Not that I'm going to take a view on local legal issues, but just so I have a background. I've just done a, a, a deal, as I said, for four restaurants in, in Saudi Arabia. Well, Saudi Arabia introduced a franchise law for the first time in 2020 and i needed to i just needed to know that even though i don't know the ins and outs of it and i didn't know whether this agreement um contravened anything in the in the, the franchise law but just that little bit of local knowledge made a difference to how i interacted with local council and made the job a lot easier for me so that that was it sorry Ainsley, that was, i went on a bit i'm sorry no, that was great. If somebody asked me oh. if you would study, spend one year or two years to study to take another bar in another country versus going there and getting some actual experience, you know, as a something like at a firm or in-house, I would definitely say go to the firm or go in-house if you can. I wouldn't say take the bar. I think it's a waste of your time. Um, however, the contrary advice is if you're from, I would say, an Asian country like Thailand 
uh, or Vietnam or even Singapore, uh, I would say it's quite beneficial to get a UK degree or a US degree. So I might approach it from the different angle. The lawyers that are out here that actually have the local degree and a US or UK or uh, some kind of Western degree, they actually get a lot more mileage out of it than I would say an American or UK lawyer that gets a local bar. The reality is you're not gonna be practicing in a local bar. Uh, it's more of a glamorous title. I know, And I know some lawyers who have multiple bar certifications, all these, but they're not taking the bars. They're getting it through honorary kind of uh, means or kind of appointments. So, I mean, and you will be old and gray before you get a lot of those. <laughs> Well, we've been talking a lot about just the the great um, great part of being local and global at the same time, and now I'm wondering if we could take a hard left and talk a little bit about unexpected challenges that you faced, either when building a portfolio or, frankly, when enforcing, because enforcement in the services industry from my experience is very challenging. So does anyone have any thoughts of what some unexpected challenges have been? IP is territorial, right? So different countries have different ways of respecting IP. And if I'm gonna speak about Southeast Asia, there's some countries where enforcement is very, very lax um, and very, very difficult. So you have to have very different strategies on how you approach it. Um, and how you protect it. And a lot of times it may not be through traditional means. So if you need to buy a trademark off of somebody who already squatted on it, you know, sometimes there are other ways to get it done, sometimes through dinners or having somebody who's well-connected have some. So I think problem solving in these kind of contexts is very different. And I think that you should be very open-minded to it and also learn about the local customs and cultures to figure out how to approach the situations. Um, the Western way would generally be to send a, note, a letter and a demand or whatever. Uh, sometimes that can be taken very, very wrongly here and can really hurt you, especially if you're a Western business doing business in a different jurisdiction. So I've seen a lot of different companies or people make those kind of faux pas um, versus going through a more diplomatic route of you know asking somebody to dinner and having a discussion over it. You'd be surprised how much sometimes those things can solve things much better than lowering up. Uh, it's a different, it, it, the, the, I would say in general, in Asia, it's not as litigious as it is in the United States. And that's something I've, you know, um, I would give as general advice to people who are trying to embark on stuff out here. I just want to say one quick thing to that. Um, when I first went in-house at ITW, um, I inherited a case that had been percolating for about six years. Um, it was a, a raid against counterfeit products, infringing products. And uh, what had happened was we had an American on the ground, or maybe a Brit, old white guy, who went on the raid um, and attended the raid and essentially showed his face, offended the business owners um, who were local Chinese Cantonese based in Malaysia. Um, Malaysian courts being Malaysian courts, the thing just moved at a snail's pace. So trial came up um, and I saw fit to fly out to Kuantan of all places, which is not easy to get to. You fly to KL and then you're like in a car for two or three hours to get to Kuantan. It's a seaside resort. Um, go to a local court and I struck up a conversation with counsel and his client. Um, and you know, it turns out we have a lot in common. Uh, I have family from Kuala Lumpur and um, you know, it wasn't the case I started. I had inherited this case. This case was of old, uh, it involved product that long since expired. Um, long story short, we settled um, uh, well before the trial even started. Uh, and then they took us out to lunch, uh, which surprised me. Um, and essentially what had happened there, I don't think I did anything special, is that um, our, my client, you know, had offended them culturally. Uh, in the way that we had taken an enforcement action. And it had um, forced, it not forced them, but it caused them to fight out of, uh, uh, out of, out of that, um, that, that, because of that action, because they felt offended. Um, and once that was, 
once that sting was, you know, uh, given time to sort of, uh, and I apologize for that, uh, that was a, a poor choice of actions. That, that was all it was needed to, to close the case. So you're right, Chris, I, I, that was my experience as well. Be mindful that when you're out in different jurisdictions, sometimes the governments may be more for the local brands and companies than other uh, than outside ones. And, you know, I'm not saying that there's corruption, but there can be different favoritisms that happen in different jurisdictions. So it's also something very mindful of where you might have a slam dunk case. For instance, in Indonesia, most people would be very surprised to know that the Polo Ralph Lauren brand, Ikea, Toyota, uh, all of these major companies, those trademarks are actually owned by the brands. They're owned by a couple squatters that license them back to the company so they can use them. Uh, and it's quite well known about this. So if anyone has any free time to Google that, it's actually quite um, something that I, I, when I moved out here, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> it's just a very, very different place. Uh, and we're talking about major, major global brands can't even get their trademarks back in certain jurisdictions. Um, so yeah, know your, know your, know your environment. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I'd add to that, that um, not just uh, governments or courts can be pro pro local, but uh, so can media, and that can play a big part. I know, you know, trying to trying to stop people opening restaurants using extremely well known names, um, you'll often find that the, that they that, that what the the, the 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 infringer does is run off to the local press and say, "I've got this big organisation, international organisation, coming in trying to swap me," um, and they get an awful lot of traction. Um, just, just by way of a very quick anecdote, one of the, one of the, you, you should never underestimate the ingenuity of people who, who, who want to ride on the coattails of brands. I acted for a, for, well, I act for a restaurant which was, has had the number one spot in the world um, at various times called the Fat Duck in the UK, and we had a one of the, one of our customers contacted the business one day and said, "Do you know that there's this restaurant called Fat Duck in the southwest of France which has opened?" We contacted the the, the 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 business, and it was a it was actually somebody British who'd set up a restaurant in the south of France in, a, in an area full of expats. So really, you know, really taking advantage of the reputation that this this international reputation of this this very high end three star Michelin restaurant, and the, the the ingenuity was that the the chef patron of the little restaurant that had opened up, his riposte to use of the the name was. That they, these were the first words that his daughter had uttered and he actually got traction in the press that his daughter's first words when she was when she started speaking was fat duck fat duck <laughs> and if you believe that you believe anything <laughs> but he actually managed to get traction from the local press he said this terrible english business uh, are trying to swap this wonderful restaurant in the southwest of france so you know local media can play a big part as well when you're trying to enforce so beware of that and wow. to add on that social media too, uh, you'd be very surprised how effective it is to get a message out through social media one way or the other. And, uh, you know, one thing I would definitely recommend for a startup company is to have somebody who's quite savvy in that and have connections to Facebook and Google and TikTok in case you need to respond very quickly. Because once news gets out, it spreads quite, you know, the algorithm take, take control from that point on. So that's another thing I've learned as a startup that um, when news gets out, it's, it's especially if you're doing something controversial, They'll spread fast. Correct. Sarah, do you have anything you want to share? I don't really have, I mean, not too much to add on a particular topic. I feel like everybody's hit it out of the park on that one. Oh, well, I'll one tell you. I'm sorry, one other thought, but I guess I, I lied. I do have one thing to add. Um, and it's not my own personal story, but I have a, um, a friend who was chief IP counsel for um, a hospitality brand. And I think the social media plays a big role, let's say in, in let's go with quick service restaurants, for example, um, and enforcing your brand and enforcing the look and feel of maybe your restaurant or, um, and, you know, sometimes it's, it, it, not sometimes, it is easier when they've really ripped you off, when they've basically taking your brand and they're using it identically. Um, it's a little bit harder when they get a little crafty and they change a couple of things here or there. And it does become a social media public relations issue because big bad 
you know, XYZ quick service restaurant is going after this, you know, small little restaurant in, you know, tiny town, Minnesota, I'm going to say. And, you know, it, it, you have to balance this act. And I know it was really difficult for her to do. Do you, you know, what do you go after given that public relation, you know, given that backlash and how do you handle it um, when it's not an identical knockoff where it's an easy story, an easier story to tell? Um, then, you know, when there is some minor change in it that people might not pick up on, but is enough to give them a hook in their story. So it, it, it's a struggle. Um, she ultimately resolved it off the books. I know that one particular one and settled with them off the books and confidentially. Um, and they did abide by that and not go into social media, but you don't always get that lucky. I, I think folks would be surprised to know the hundreds of counterfeit brick and mortar infringements there are out there, the copycats there are constantly in real estate, whether you're in hospitality or even in co-working. And one thing that I think is important and no one prepares you for is how if you work for a U.S. company, and for me, it's always been a New York company, whether they're international or not, there's a lot of New York lawyers there. And you have ever heard of the phrase New York Minute? Well, things happen like this. And the world doesn't operate that way. And so, I mean, I, for one, have inherited counterfeit cases that have been 30 years long, that have been five, eight years long. Peter, I, I see you wince. And I want you to know that the, the gentleman on the other side passed away yet still found the energy and strength to sign an appeal the day before he passed. So it continues and continues. <laughs> um, so, so things happen um, over a very long period of time at times. These are not deals. It's enforcement that could affect a deal. And so one thing I've learned is to always make sure folks understand that IP is highly strategic. Um, it involves people. It also involves comms or your PR um, team. And so I, I don't think anyone fully realizes it. I've had people before in my career saying, I didn't think a name was so, what's so complicated about a name, right? And it is. And it, sometimes it is not expressed or not intuitive to people. So that would be my one, um, you know, uh, uh, an, uh, enforcement hurdle that I've had to get over. Ken. Just one comment. Um, one of the, I want to hark back to maps. Um, one of the things that you, 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 um, the more important map than the map of where your filings are, uh, where your infringe enforcements are, ultimately is a map of where your client is in the, the competitive field. Uh, I'm not talking IP right now. Um, so how many players are there in this space? who's charging what, who's uh, marketing what, how are they positioned in the marketplace is a uh, super interesting map once you can get your client to share that with you. Because then what you do is you can take your knowledge of IP and overlay that onto the map and you go, okay, knowing all these players, which IP, whose IP, what IP, is doing what for whose margin in this map? And I'm coming back to enforcement here. Once you understand how this map operates, and mind you, A, this takes a lot of time. B, I don't think anybody ever has a perfect map because things are very fluid. But to have a working map in a particular industry, in a particular geography, is fascinating uh, as an IP attorney. Because frankly, if you can put that business strategy together and marry it with IP, now you know who you really need to fight and who's just biting at your ankles. Um, and you are in a position to look at your client and go, that's an ankle biter. Save your money, move on. Um, and that you've told me is key competition. That's either litigation or licensing. Um, you basically are able to then separate the signal from the noise. So from a strategic standpoint, um, there are opportunities to map out um, this. I didn't, 
I wasn't nearly smart enough to know this. I, I got dragged into a particular industry. It happened to be the the plastics industry. Uh, and within a few years, we had a dossier of all the licenses, all the major competitors, all the past litigation, and it felt like a dashboard. Can I, I can move this up here and this will happen. Uh, I'm gonna try and make this happen. Uh, and this person is coming in because there's a there's a there's a demand out there for for this, but for the IP um, that we had at the time, there wouldn't even be Ameri American manufacturing. And this was particularly important for me when I was in house because Obama was talking about the the the, the strength of American manufacturing, and I saw that there were eight pieces of IP in this industry that basically thwarted foreign manufacturers from coming in. But for that, we would have no market and the margins would collapse. We could see a direct line between those eight pieces of IP and you know a double digit margin in the industry. So kind of fascinating. Ken, we have a question on that story. It's when you are the industry leader, how do you convince your company they aren't all ankle biters? Um, you, how do you convince your company that they aren't all ankle biters? Um, <clears throat> my experience has been more often than not, they are ankle biters, um, or your client hasn't put a map together and has no clue what the map looks like. Um, and it may be an ankle biter. It may not be an ankle biter. In my experience with IP enforcement issues, uh, you know, I worked for a Chinese firm for many years. Very often, more often than not, it's an ankle biter and you can ignore it. Um, sometimes, you know, it's significant for politically, it's your company brand and like, this is not going to happen. Um, you know, like the cases in, in, in Indonesia, Chris, Chris, Chris reference. Yeah, those could make the news. They 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 could cause a lot of trouble. Uh, so even if the competitor is an ankle biter, there are political ramifications that have to be considered. Um, but your run of the mill counterfeit issues, if you walk away from it, will they be there in five years? Yeah, they will be there in five years. There are hundreds of them, quite literally hundreds of them. They are mostly ankle biters, because the the true players in the marketplace are usually not engaged in stuff like that. So uh, if you don't mind, I'll just jump in on that as well. Um, kind of the, the, the thought process too being, you can, you look at where you're going to enforce, so proactive, proactively enforcing, you know, who are your primary competitors? Who should you be looking, potentially have a trademark watch on? Um, you know, there is that side of it. The, the one thing that I have been reminded of, you know, by, you know, learning, is that those smaller competitors, even if they're not really competing in the business, they're competing with you, right? So remember that they're looking at you and saying, how can we go after you, industry leader? What steps can I take to make, you know, to, to move myself up? So sometimes they're the ones you have to have your eye on because they're the ones that are gobbling up maybe a phrase that you're using that you don't really think rises to the level of filing a trademark application on, but guess what? They like that phrase, they're going to file it and now they're gonna sue you. And now they're a nuisance, yes, but now you're stuck in litigation with them. And so this be mindful of those smaller players of how they're looking at you and what steps they might be taking to be, to, to compete with you, not just you know in the field, like in the market, but compete with you from an IP standpoint. Um, so don't lose sight of them. Um, and I have some of our smaller competitors on a watch for that very reason, because you know they have taken some, you know, some IP action that has resulted in some heartburn from my perspective. Um, one other quick, quick comment on that is if you're lucky enough to have a competitive analysis group in your in your company they're a good resource to go to, at least from a high level strategic standpoint. They're like, hey, who are we looking at? Where are we going right now? Um, just one other you know, place to go to have a conversation about who are the competitors and, and you know, where are you going? 
Great oh, comments. I agree you. with that too, Sarah. That's a great reminder. Thank you. And one other um, thought with it is, so I used to not get upset at a lot of the infringements. I used to say, put it on the pile. But the ones that were on, that were very significant, that could impact our development, growth, and frankly, money. Mm. Those are the ones I rang the alarm bell. And, you know, I will say just psychologically, they take you more seriously when you don't ring the alarm bell that much. But um, I used a lot of data. I used to say, well, here's an investigation. These guys are making 500000 a year. Wouldn't you rather get a piece of that than give it to them? And sometimes that, that data really does help support the, the case if you want to take an infringement action. Okay, I know we have about 10 minutes left. Um, there are a couple of outstanding questions, but I just wanted to ask, and if folks could give short thoughts on this, when you are doing a global deal or when you are licensing your brand globally, how do you do a one size fits all for that? Um, does anyone have any tips or, or strategies on how to do a license that accommodates and mitigates risk on a global scale? Anything with indemnities, reps, warranties? What are your thoughts on licensing globally? I, I work licensing matters and it's really, um, you know, un understanding your client's portfolio, your business's portfolio, understanding um, where the risks are in the portfolio and trying to align the reps you're making, the corresponding, and, um, you know, and, and also even the choice of law. The portfolio is important to that. Is lucrative enough, the business is, is not going to be looking for uh, a perfect solution where there's no risk. They'll be a willingness to take risk, but the, the important thing is to understand where that, that risk is, is going to come from and whether it's tolerable for business. So I'm, um, we're venturing down a path where we're uh, doing a, a customer licensing program for Ecolab Science Certified. I mean, basically, you know, we're, we're offering audits and, and the like, and then the customer is allowed to use Ecolab Science Certified in um, their restaurant or hotel. And while we started it in the U.S., you know, we're pushing out, um, we recently did a deal with Manchester United, um, and, you know, we're pushing it out into the U.K. and into Europe. Um, and, and, you know, I'm just thinking about licensing and licensing the Ecolab Science Certified brand with that and making sure the guidelines run with it. The one thing that we're really thoughtful about is we may have a template, but to a point that Peter was making earlier, we have that template reviewed by local council and make sure that we accommodate and change that license as necessary, um, you know, as we go into a new jurisdiction. So let's say, let's say we were in a country in Latin America that, you know, it's by, you know, there's both maybe Spanish or Portuguese and English, you know, so just making sure that even when you have a licensing program in place and you may have a template license, that that template license needs to adapt to the jurisdiction that you're taking it. I, I used to, I, I think you should operationalize it. Uh, like I had red, yellow, green pre-done forms, but um, the most you can do broad language and, and tailor indemnities so that pretty much anything works with a couple of sentences. And I know that sounds crazy, but if you push yourself, I think you can do it. Um, I think for those who are negotiating the licenses, knowing that they just get this pre-done color-coded just creates trust with the business. So that's just my thought, Ken. I'm big on uh, I'm big on data. I, lo I, lo I love the, the, the stuff that data can. And so what I mean by this is um, if you've been in practice for a little while, um, you know certain things to be true, even if you don't really have the, the data in front of you, uh, if you put, put the data. So, for example, if you file a thousand trademarks every year, are you going to get all of them uh, registered? Probably not. But if you've done your, your, your job well, probably a high percentage are going to come through. 
90%, maybe 95%. Um, um, now, when you, you know, outside of prosecution, you have matters, licensing matters, enforcement matters in different countries around the world. And I venture to guess that those of you that are in-house or you are outside and managing large portfolios, those number in the thousands. Um, there are patterns in these, if you, do, if you docket them in a matter management database, there are patterns from this data, um, spending patterns, uh, time percolating through the courts patterns, settlement patterns, uh, number of cases patterns. And uh, this is something I built because it didn't exist at Kohler and then again at Illinois Tool Works. This body of data um, allows you to start hedging. Um, you know, money's not uh, infinite and you can't have, you don't always have the liberty to reach out to outside counsel in every country in the world when you, you need a global license. But you, you do have this data that is in your possession and each year that passes, you get a little bit more data. Um, I would use it all the time. It, the data would feed my filing strategy. Uh, the, the the enforcement data would feed my renewal strategy. It would feed my um, strategy with respect to um, how much time I spent on a license agreement in a particular jurisdiction for a particular client. Um, that client doesn't like, you know, that client falls every time. Like, okay, we're, we're, we're not gonna push very hard for that client because that client falls every time that, you know, he never wants to stand up to a fight um, versus uh, versus this is a jurisdiction where a lot of nonsense happens. It costs the company a million dollars a year, every year for the last five years. That That's something significant to flag. So when you have data like that, it very really quickly, um, for want of a better word, 80-20 is your problem. Look for the 20% of countries, jurisdictions, clients, that take up 80% of your time, create 80% of the headache or stresses of anxieties and start there. You solve those, the rest is cream. Thank you, Ken. And I think we're in the final few minutes. Um, so I want to have the, the two questions outstanding answered. Um, the first one is thoughts on acquiring a CIPP US certification. I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that. Um, I will say data privacy does roll up into me at my current company. And I I think anytime you grow, it's wonderful. Um, I don't know if anyone uh, hangs their hat on any certifications. I think it's just pivoting on what Christopher said. Christopher said, it's, it's really just your growth and the things you do to grow. But does anyone have any thoughts on that? Data I think there's no shortage. I, sorry, go ahead, Lee. Go ahead, Lee. Oh no, I, I, there's going to be no particular in the U.S. for privacy. I think that that certification will have really uh, a lot of value for people in in the coming decades. Uh, for especially for anyone starting out on their career, I think it's it's a worthwhile thing to pursue if there's if you have an interest. I, I would add that like um, I don't have one, uh, but I'm about to take one. And uh, I've been data protection officer for several of entities. You don't need it, um, but it is as a if you're a junior lawyer, I would definitely say you should. It's most it's going to be the norm rather than not uh, for future. And data privacy does touch upon everybody. Um, if you're in the if you're going to become general counsel at some company, um, I'll say an interesting thing. There's the, the question specifically asked: Should you take the CIPP US? Um, there are many different ones. There's US, Europe, and Asia. Uh, I'm based in Asia, but I'm actually planning on taking the European one because of the GDPR and it's the probably the strictest one. So one thought to keep in mind is maybe you consider taking the European one, which is probably considered one of the more difficult ones rather than the US one or Europe, I mean, or Asia one, uh, but just something to consider. So at least my team and I have decided to take Europe over Asia. All right, so welcome everyone to uh, the second panel uh, for today. We uh, will be addressing
best practices and pitfalls. My name is Adam Kelly. Uh, thank you, Adam, for the introduction. As you mentioned, I'm a partner at Loeb and Loeb. I've had a long-time relationship with the school. I appreciate the opportunity to moderate this panel. Um, I'll introduce each of our uh, panelists, and they can share a little bit about themselves and their practice. And so we'll start first with Aaron Fox. Aaron, who, who is Aaron Fox? Where do you work? What do you do? Hi, everyone. I'm Aaron Fox. Um, my title is Group Technology Council, and I work at Illinois Toolworks, which is a manufacturing company based out of Glenview, Illinois, which for anyone that's not from Illinois is a north suburb of Chicago. Um, I essentially handle all intellectual property man matters, such as patent and trademark prosecution, agreement work, litigation, anything that comes up or is tangentially related to intellectual property on a global scale for our automotive OEM segment. Uh, I joined ITW about three and a half years ago. Uh, before that, I spent many years in uh, law firms and am quite enjoying the other side of things. Well, thanks, thanks for being Adam. On the panel. Yeah, thanks for being on the panel this, this morning. Uh, next on our panel is Aaron Lawson. Morning, Aaron. We're blessed with two errands. I know. It's like, it's yeah. the best day ever. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Nice to see you and everyone. Um, and nice to see so many guests. Uh, I'm recognizing a lot of familiar names. Um, my name is Erin Lawson, and uh, my uh, I am a legal director at Uber Freight. And Uber Freight is a subsidiary of Uber Technologies. My official role is in the product legal organization, which is a very fancy way of saying software lawyer. Um, in my day to day, I manage a team of legal generalists and we are a first line of defense and review for the entire business. And this is very interesting from my side because we literally get to touch everything. Um, what does that mean? So when we are reviewing product features that are being built, my job is to make sure, my, my job and my team's job are to make sure that uh, what we're launching is legally compliant. So when we're getting ready to build something, things that I'm thinking about include, are we getting appropriate consents? Um, what are the data sources that we're feeding in to the predictive models? Is the marketing copy okay? Do we have the right disclaimers? Um, is what we're doing covered by the website T's and C's, which we wrote? Um, recently, we did a really cool M&A deal. It was the second biggest deal in Uber's history, and we bought a $2.2 .2 billion competitor. And so right now I'm doing a ton of work to get the deal approved and work on integration, which is going to be uh, a very active uh, process. And uh, I share all of this because, right, the list goes on and on. But the main point is that it's super fun from my perspective because every day is a new day and there's always new challenges. Um, as a legal generalist, like I said, we're the first line of defense, but we loop in our subject matter experts at the parent company, Uber, when we might need advice. So think of this as an inside outside council model. And it's fabulous because right, Uber, big Uber has a fabulous bench, extremely bright lawyers. They give really practical advice. They know my business line. So you might be thinking, Erin, what the heck is Uber Freight? Um, and I'm excited to tell you that you are going to probably hear a lot more about Uber Freight in the coming months because we are moving in as the anchor tenant to the post office. So if you are anywhere near the post office, you are going to see Uber all over the building. And uh, for my business line, our global headquarters is in the post office and I am the lead lawyer there. So what is the point of Uber Freight and what are we trying to do? Um, the answer there is Uber Freight is trying to digitize transportation. So if you can imagine, the trucking industry for decades has run on fax machines, phone calls, handwritten you know, signatures. And so we're trying to make things far more efficient and also to equalize the marketplace so it's more accessible by allowing um, trucking companies to write book a load by touching a button and uploading paperwork by just taking a picture on their phone. 
And so why is this important now and why am I excited about this? Um, imagine a world not very far into the future where autonomous trucks are moving uh, freight across the country. Think about all those wide open states in the middle, right? The Dakotas, Idaho, Montana, et cetera. And truck drivers are could sign up to take a trailer and drop it off so the AV truck can start that long trip or the trucking company can pick that load up and then take it right to Target or Walmart. And so not only does this um, efficiency help control costs for the people that are buying, but it also helps truck drivers who spend days on end away from home. Now they get to see their families, sleep in their own beds, have a normal life. Why am I telling you all this uh, for us today? Um, so it matters because everything you used this morning to get ready for your day was delivered on a truck and everything in the store that you buy comes on a truck. Um, the TAM for the trucking business is an $800 billion uh, addressable market. So behind the scenes of everything we're doing, there's truck drivers moving things on the highway to make our lives easier. And so that's why it matters to me and why I'm so excited about uh, my day today. So with that, and I'll turn it back to you. And having just returned from a Clark Griswold-like family vacation of driving out west and then driving uh, through Minnesota, South Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska, Wyoming, I'm well aware of, of lots of trucks that are on those, uh, those interstates. Um, and also uh, a plug for Aaron, Madam President, would you maybe want to share yes. in 30 seconds what you're president of, what yes. you're doing when you're not doing your day job? <laughs> right, because I have so much free time, as we all do. Um, I am super honored to serve this year as the president of IPLAC, which is the oldest IP bar association in the country. It stands for the Intellectual Property Law Association of Chicago. And so before I became into my legal generalist role, I am a recovering uh, IP attorney, and I follow in the very famous footsteps of our moderator, Adam Kelly. Hopefully, I didn't ruin it too bad, and then you can fix, uh, fix it. <laughs> it's a mess. Uh, uh, next on our panel, uh, Ann Chen, uh, who's joining us uh, from TransUnion. Ann. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Um, fun fact. When I say my name, people often think it's Aaron. So I guess I could possibly be a third Aaron. Sure. Um, <laughs> but um, hi, I'm uh, Ann Chen. I'm some general counsel at TransUnion. Um, most of you may know TransUnion as a credit reporting agency, but we also have a lot of businesses in the space of fraud solutions, digital marketing, and customer analytics. And it's headquartered here in Chicago, but we're um, a global company. And um, I, I really love my role because I get to wear many different hats. Um, IP is one of the hats. I'm the main IP attorney um, at TU, but I also manage corporate litigation, um, labor and employment. I support our DEI efforts and also manage real estate and tax. So I, I think my job is super fun. Um, before joining TransUnion earlier this year, some of you may know I was at um, Abbott Labs and also um, at Mars and Wrigley um, going in-house. Um, and I was at a couple of law firms in Chicago beforehand. Um, and uh, I started out at Abbott as their full-time social media digital attorney. So I, I, was so, I was IP adjacent. And then I took a couple years break from IP, but I'm really, really glad and excited to be back in IP. So I'm and not a recovering. And we're glad you're back. Yeah, we're glad I'm like back. Aaron. I'm not a recovering IP lawyer. I'm like a, you know, jumping back in um, with both feet. Well, we're happy to have you on the panel, and thanks for joining, Ann. Uh, and I won't call you Aaron. Uh, we have <laughs> enough Aarons. Um, and and uh, lastly, uh, Jim Johnson. Jim is joining us uh, from Chamberlain Group. Uh, Good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. Um, I feel like I'm a bit of an interloper as uh, I am not an attorney. I am an information person. I've been a patent researcher and analyst for about 35 years now. Uh, the past 15 years, I've been with the Chamberlain Group. Um, you probably know us best from uh, Chamberlain and LiftMaster garage door operators, gate operators, access controls, things like that. Um, and uh, 
Before that, I was with Baxter Healthcare for about 18 years. And uh, my role within Chamberlain is we don't have inside patent counsel. Um, we lean very heavily with outside counsel. So we're talking to them on pretty much a daily basis. But uh, there's four of us in our group, and uh, we sort of get involved in the whole IP process throughout the company, from invention disclosure evaluation, working with outside counsel to write our applications and, and prosecution. We get involved in supporting litigation. We are part of the design review committees, uh, new product development, work with marketing, pretty much anybody within the company. And uh, for me, that makes it really interesting because there's always different things and different perspectives coming around. I think that's it. Yeah, well, thanks for joining us. And it, it's, it was important when we were um, putting together the panel, that, Jim, the fact that you're not a lawyer, that's perfectly fine because we're, you know, the, the, the topics that we're gonna be, um, you have firsthand uh experience with and um a significant amount of experience so we're we're glad you have you and i'm um, glad to be an interloper always enjoy you that. you are you are not an interloper no um so uh, i know that we have and, and to everyone who's attending thanks for tuning into our panel um you know we sincerely appreciate your attention and hopefully uh through the course of, of the next 60 minutes we're able to discuss uh, a few topics that you find of interest and for those folks who are in-house, uh, hopefully we uh, discuss something that you can uh, incorporate into your practice. Um, so let's, and I know that we have uh, several students here. So I'm gonna ask the, the first question really for the students um, to really uh, to allow them to have a, a better snapshot of the window of, of each of your practices and where you work. So, so let me ask a, a hypothetical and then whoever would like to take it can go. And that is when an issue comes to you and you're going to be advising, quote, your client, talk to me, how does that process work? Like what, within the inner workings of your employer, issue comes to you, who are you communicating with? What's the cadence of communications? Okay, I'll, I'll jump in. Oh, go ahead. Um, it's not necessarily, um, I'm going to, broaden that out a little bit, not necessarily when an issue comes up, but just uh, our basic, how we communicate within the company itself. Sure. And, uh, you know, one example um, for us is that we have a quarterly meeting with each of our business units. Um, they're not very long. Um, we also include the regulatory group in these meetings. And the reason for that is uh, we're always trying to make sure that we understand exactly what the business units are doing, what initiatives are coming on the horizon, um, where they may be pivoting, um, because a lot of times that information doesn't necessarily get driven through the corporation. Uh, and so it's uh, just a half hour, 45 minute touch base on a quarterly basis. Um, we also um, are part of the design review team. So we are always involved in all those design reviews, which is really great um, because we see exactly what's happening. Um, I will say one thing that for us is a bit of an issue and we're still struggling with is that we've become more and more of a software app um, platform, platform services company um, you know, with our, our MyQ uh, technology, which allows you to control all your devices pretty much anywhere in the world. And um, for us is that the software part, the app part of it is they're running agile, right? So they're moving really fast and they're adding features and changing features. And um, for us, it's a little bit of a struggle. So if anyone has any good suggestions on how to help deal with that issue, be very grateful. Um, and uh, then another part of the communication is a lot more informal. Um, we just sort of stick our noses in people's business. We, it's harder now when we're not in the building, but when we're in headquarters, we tend to walk around and just drop in on people and ask them how is the project going, uh, what's happening with this initiative, just to make sure we understand the flow of things throughout the company. Because there's a lot of projects and a lot of things going on. I think Jim um, nailed it on the head, which is, the, I, for me, the first thing you want to do is step in the shoes of the business and really understand what their business objectives are, what's driving the business and innovation. 
Um, and so I, the last panel, Ken talked about code switching and others talked about code switching, you know, between cultures. I think as in-house attorney, you have to code switch your language too between being an attorney person. And so um, I, the first thing I do is I try to understand the subject um, and, and the background facts. And if and sometimes, sometimes you don't know, know, you have to have that co conversation and partnership with the business. And then you you um, overlay your legal strategy, your legal thinking, your expertise. Um, and so um, that's why I also say for the outside counsel out there, if you really want to be a, a valuable outside counsel partner with your in-house clients, you know, you should also try to understand your client's business. And, and I know it's harder because they're removed, but I always give this advice that as outside counsel, you should ask me what my business's top three priorities are, because that's my goal to know that. And then I want that and our big biggest three challenges. So um, for me, it's, always trying to think like a business person and then adding your legal expertise. And then the other thing is, um, it's sort of like a game of chess, even though I actually don't play chess, but it's like always trying to uh, think two or three steps ahead and seeing where your competitors or other issues might come and then um, taking those into account as you move forward. Aaron or Aaron? Yeah. Go ahead, Aaron Fox, and then, yeah, I'll go. Yeah, so I, I agree with everything that Jim and Ann have said. Um, uh, uh, for me, a lot of my communications are, are two types of communications. One, where I'm pulling information. I'm going out to the businesses, having meetings with the businesses to understand what's going on, and I'm pulling, I'm almost pulling work from them, right? I'm making sure that you know, any agreements we need in place are in place. I'm making sure that we protect any of our intellectual property that needs to be protected. But then on the flip side, you know, I, I train my businesses so that when, when they have IP issues, the first person they call, the first thing they do is to pick up the phone and call me. So whether it's, you know, they're, they're showing something tomorrow and they need to file for patent protection, you know, they pick up the call, they they pick up the phone and they call me. Or if the customer hands them an, an agreement, they are picking up the phone and they're calling me or they're emailing me. And so, you know, I think it's really important too in those interactions to make sure that all the businesses know what to do when they have something IP or even legal related in their hands. That. And what I'm about to share is right on the same tone. Um, I think that we would all agree. I consider my primary function every single day is to communicate effectively and build relationships. And I spend most of my time on Zoom talking and uh, right, making people feel comfortable to come to you with problems or come to you with innovation and then working together to solve the problem or anticipate what's coming next. Related to that would be uh, to Jim's point of pace. And when I first joined Uber Freight, I was extremely overwhelmed by the amount of communications and how fast things moved. It is a skill I have developed, but the default is that, you know, a PRD comes in, there's a two day window, and then the PRD is moving on. And so, I think uh, as in-house lawyers, we get very skilled at managing many competing priorities, focusing on top priorities, those top three, um, interjecting when needed. Um, yeah, and it really is- of interjection, what is PRD? For those Ooh, who don't know yeah, you, uh, you, you non-software people. <laughs> yes, the, the, the primary way that my clients communicate with me if they're going to build a feature is to create a product review document. And the product people, are the fabulous people in the middle that interface with the business and then the engineers and they take engineer speak and talk plain language and it is awesome. Product people have a fabulous skill set. So they're telling me what it is in plain words and I'm like, yes, I understand this. Um, so yes, uh, the, the pace of communications is uh, fast and the, the, the business is moving on and you, you need to right, be adaptive. Finally, I would say uh, one skill that I have gotten very comfortable with as part of my speaking, writing, communication, and relationship building practice 
is the art of drawing out the information and asking good questions. So to Erin's point, sometimes, right, I am not the smartest person in the room and many people can feel insecure or you can take the approach to embrace that you have access to fabulous subject matter experts that are here to teach you what you need to know. And what I am bringing to the table is what Aaron Fox said. I'm thinking about all these things in the background and I'm drawing out and asking precise questions to see, hey, are there some other risks here? Or do I need to flag this to somebody? And that skill, although is something perhaps not trained in law school, it's a really interesting and fabulous one and one that I have embraced. And it sounds like you have thoughts. Well, I was going to say I I agree with you because I'm a I'm a litigator too, and you know if you're a litigator, you're trained in deposition. But I view it as like a friendly deposition because sometimes, you know, and I agree with you. I will often say, especially since I'm fairly new to my company, like I don't know anything. Explain it to me like you would explain your to your kid in high school. Help me understand this. And then you you know for those of you who are litigators out there, you use your litigation skills, but in a friendly way because sometimes you may have to ask the question multiple times in different ways to actually get the answer. And sometimes you ask a question that's yes or no, and they don't say yes or no, and you just want to say it's a yes or no question. But no, you build a relationship. You're patient. And you're like, well, help me understand. But that's I agree too, Erin. You brought up the point that communication. Um, is is really important in that relationship building because you build that trust and then they they'll come to you when there is a problem. Right. And, and, uh, you, always, the, you can always ask the old leading question: Help me understand X. <laughs> Tell me you more. Know? Yes, yes. <laughs> Keep talking. Help me understand. Sorry, Jim, I cut you off. Totally. Yeah. No, no problem. Um, one of the things uh, just talking about the communication, um, I feel a lot of times we're sort of the conduit. In the company because we touch base with all the different groups and um, another aspect that Ann sort of touched upon was we work very closely with outside counsel so we are translators we're trying to help everyone understand what everyone else is doing and um, and even with outside counsel uh, one of the things we've been doing recently uh, a firm that uh, we use they've assigned a couple more uh, younger attorneys to our group and so we've been doing chamberlain or garage door history with them so walking through the development of garage door operators and access control systems over the past 40, 50 years, uh, so product-wise, and also from a patent point of view. Here are some of the key patents that were in the past. Here are some of the key patents that are now. And that helps our outside counsel really understand what our business is and what we do in our technology. Um, and it makes a huge difference when they're drafting applications and working with us through prosecution. One last tidbit on communication. Jim, you hit it right on the head. Connector and educator. Um, legal, right, this function is uniquely situated to see a lot of things across the business in those business units may not be making those connections. So part of my job is facilitating bringing in stakeholders, getting the right POC to communicate with so that those two people can talk, right? There may not be a legal issue, but I can right see around that corner and connect those folks. Um, second would be the education part. Uh, many outside counsel or young attorneys may discount, right, that historical perspective, but knowing where you came from and those challenges is so valuable, especially when you're planning for the future. Um, so I, I cannot recommend enough, right, if you're outside, learning about the business, and if you're in-house, um, right, understand and where your innovation is going. So to any of our students who are taking notes, good communicator, you're a conduit between business and legal, you have to be able to, uh, to chat with the technical folks, uh, you, you need to be able to interact with a variety of different professionals. Um, I think that's a, that's a theme, uh, that an early theme we're developing here. Um, let me ask the panel what and again this is coming from the perspective of the students what are aspects of your job that you like i could start that um for me um my favorite part is really partnering with the businesses i feel like every day i am part of each one of i have 24 different businesses really that i 
that I support and I feel like I'm a part of each and every one of those businesses. They call me, they email me, they, you know, they don't feel like they're harassing me. I don't feel like I'm harassing them. It is, um, it's a partnership. And I, I feel like when I worked in a law firm, sometimes I felt like I had partnerships with the business, but oftentimes because of the fact that, you know, budgets were constrained. It was hard to get out to see the businesses, to see your clients. Um, you spent less time working on, you know, certain projects. You just didn't get to know um, those clients in the same way you get to know your businesses in-house. I mean, I can pick up and go to any one of my businesses anytime I want. I can schedule a phone call to sit down and and get the, the, the primer on whatever I need to get the primer on. Um, you know, I can spend as much, I can spend five days, you know, researching every little bit about my businesses if I need to. Um, I wasn't able to do that when I was in a law firm. So I, I feel like I can much better advise my businesses the more I know about the businesses, the more I know about the people, the, the more I know about the strategy and the growth. Um, I, I feel like that's a real partner. And I, I, it's a different feeling when you're in-house than when you are in a law firm. I would say hands down, best part of my job is people. Uh, I am an extrovert. I like to be with people. I like to talk a lot. I like to get to know people. Um, and when you are surrounded by very high performing, talented experts, it's super energizing, right? That's exciting. Um, so for me, what are, what's the best part about my job? Awesome people to work with. Second, being mission driven, um, you know, Work can be stressful. There's a lot of it to do. But why I do my work every day is because I believe in what I'm doing. I think it's important. I think it's super interesting. I think I'm making the world better, right? Not worse. Um, and I think related to that would be building, right? Uh, the best, the third best part of my job is I feel I am one of many people coming together to build something that matters. And that's a good feeling, right? It's it's good to, um, yeah, to be to take an expansive uh, growth oriented position. Dan or Jim? Okay, um, for me, it's, it's again we're going, the steam. It's still running through from the communication is being sort of in the middle of everything, seeing all the things that happen, seeing how they develop, see how everything is interrelated. Um, I, I, I love seeing how you know the business plan starts meeting up with the technology and how we can protect that from an IP point of view. And uh, it's just really fascinating. And for me, my previous job with Baxter Healthcare, we are very large and I would do the research and sort of throw it over the wall. And then I would not hear anything or find out what was going on with it. And yeah, sort of hold your fingers up and pray something went well. And um, now, um, when going to Chamberlain, I was actually the first information person they ever had. And it was sort of an undefined role. And when I went for the interview and the person that uh, I worked for, uh, I said, you know, it sounds great, sounds really interesting, but it sounds like half a job. And the half a job makes me nervous. And he goes, oh, don't worry about that. We'll just make it up as we go along. And uh, we've been making up lots of stuff has been going along. So, but that's the whole thing is all that interaction and um, being able to see how all the pieces fit together. I just, I think it's fascinating. And Yeah, I, I agree with everything they said. Um, just being in the mix, you know, when you're with a company, you have that mission, having those relationships. Um, and I'll add one thing for me with my personality, I get bored really easily. So I just like that I get, you know, a lot of different things um, handed to me. And I'll, and it, I think it's just also personality. I mean, for me, I felt like being at a firm, like I was dealing with several marathons and then being in house, I feel like I have like a hundred sprints a day. So it just depends on what you're attracted to. But I, I like having all those, all those sprints, although sometimes it can be too many sprints. <laughs> you get tired of, all, of sprinting all day. Yeah, and let me let me ask uh, back to the panel the flip side of my question. What are things 
that I don't want to may, maybe use the word annoying, but what are what are parts of your practice that maybe um, yeah, annoying? That's a, that's a good one. Maybe, maybe a little annoying. Maybe is it, you know the warmest and the fuzziest part of of your responsibilities. So I'll start this one. Um, honestly, there's there's not much that I don't like. Uh, but the one thing that I really dislike is creating and managing budgets. I mean, I needed to do that a little bit on the law firm side, but in-house it's, you know, it's creating those budgets and then sticking to those budgets. And then every month having to analyze where you stand with respect to those budgets and making sure that um, you're not going over budget. And it's, it's really, really hard to do because there's certain things that you can predict like you know um annuities for example you you can you can predict within probably 10 percent how much your annuities might be for the year but you have no idea if your 24 businesses are going to have you know 50 inventions for the year or 500 inventions for the year right so kind of spacing all of that out as well as the number of products and the number of like clearance related searches or you know, you don't know that you're going to possibly get sued. I, I mean, there's there's so much unpredictability with legal in general and thus with your budget. And it's just it's it's very difficult to manage. And that's not one of my favorite things, especially being an engineer and and not being kind of a, a financial oriented person. I, I will add something about the budget point, because that's an excellent point because I've had conversations with my, with several outside counsel recently. They, and I, I don't know if this is the truth for the rest of you, but I suspect it is because I've worked at now my third, my third big company and it's the same. You know, I think a lot of law firms see me at a big company and they say, well, if something unexpected happens, oh, you'll have $50,000 for this matter, right? Because you guys are making all this money. You. I see your financials, I see your stock price, just, I'll just, just grab some. And I've had explained to law firm lawyers, that is not how financial principles work in the corporate uh, world, right? Like you are given a budget, you have to stick to that budget. Even if like Aaron said, you get sued, where are you gonna find the money? You know, you gotta work around your budget. You, you're not given the extra check. You have to find it somewhere else, which means maybe, you're not going to file in 60 countries. You're going to file in 20 countries because you got to save some money. And I, I just realized that somebody else at council didn't realize that because when I had to have budget conversations with them, they get more money. I'm like, no, I can't get more money. Um, so I, I, I feel like I'm giving a lot of pointers to any outside council out there. Uh, but that, that's really, I think, the challenge we all have. And then. One other thing I'll add, it's it's sort of annoying, but then if you if you do it right, I think it becomes a plus. Like one of the things that can get really stressful in house is um, as opposed to being um, outside counsel, you, where you have like a buffer, right? Like you don't really have a buffer in house. Like the president of the business can call you up and just say like, I need you to do this, and it might be like the worst idea ever. And so you're just you're just like in the mix of politics or bureaucracy or whatever. So that's Annoying. But I say that you can turn this into a plus because like Aaron said, you know, huge parts, a huge part of our job is relationship building and building trust. And if you do that the right way, then the, those conversations become, they're, they're less annoying because you have that relationship and you have that trust where you can say, I hear you, I get you're really concerned about this, but I think, you know, there are other ways we might be able to deal with your frustration. And I wish we had that magic wand. Just get more money. Uh, if I also had a magic wand, the other thing that I would just grant my greatest wish, um, one thing I miss from the law firm, I do not have administrative support. Um, and it's annoying because uh, it's so time consuming and inefficient, right? I have other sort of what I consider to be more important stuff that I need to do, right? For my relationships that I wanted to live, I wanna do what I said I was gonna do. And it can be frustrating at times when I am doing those menial tasks. And it's not so much that, right, I'm above it or I'm too good for it. Um, 
it's more a function of, is this the best use of my time? And oh dear, I don't have time. So then I end up doing it at, you know, off hours or whatever. So some examples, right? I build my own slide decks. I manage my own calendars. I'm the one sending the invitation. Um, I'm submitting my own expense reports. Um, I'm learning how to do formulas and merge my own Excel sheets. None of this stuff is problematic, right? This is just part of the day to day, but it would be nice if I had that magic wand to have a little extra support. Um, we do have paralegals on my team, but those paralegals have to find roles and right, their job is not to make my life happy, their job is to do their job. So uh, if I had that magic wand, that's what I would get. More money in the budget when you need it, ding, and then administrative support, ding. Really relieved to hear that nobody has a super secret slush fund where they can just draw money out of because I've been, I've been hoping for that, but I guess I'm disillusioned and it'll never happen. Um, but uh, for me, uh, a couple of the things, uh, I'm gonna go back to what Aaron Fox was talking about. You never can tell the like, number of disclosures that are coming in or what, what's gonna be happening. I mean, because that the pace of that is really driven by new product development or R&D and, and things like that. You don't really have control over that. And that goes into a larger issue of uh, KPIs, which I will define for you, Adam, is key performance indicators. Right, um, we're in the engineering group here, and they are super keen on KPIs because they have all kinds of KPIs to track their engineering performance. We're in the engineering group; we don't do engineering. That's not what our role is, and so we spent about three to four years trying to fight that off. We won. We don't have to do those KPIs, but the idea of like you need to have X number of invention disclosures a year. It, it, that doesn't really give you any value. You know, what you want is good disclosures that really cover your business and your products, but not, we have to hit, you know, a hundred of them this year. So for me, that would be the biggest pain in the butt. KPI, key performance. Key performance indicators. Indicators, got it. How many of you? That's my new cocktail party uh, jargon. I'll just throw in KPI and see the blank faces staring back at me. Um, and uh, that's by a the good way, point, actually. That, oh, I was going to say that's a key point too with KPIs. Is a lot of us in house. I'm sure everybody can attest to it on the panel. Is we always have to measure our output, which is really hard sometimes when you're a lawyer, right? And a KPI because we're a cost center too. So. I'm always trying to find ways to slice and dice like data, KPIs, and apply it to my work um, when I'm not like a traditional business generator. So that's also maybe a challenge, sometimes annoying. Yeah. Sorry, go um, ahead, Adam. Yeah, no, I was, uh, to, to those folks who, um, who are listening, uh, if you have any questions uh, for any of our panelists or there's something that's been discussed you'd like for uh, our panel to follow up on, please use the Q&A feature or uh, send me a, a chat. Um, and you you mentioned something that I want to follow up on. You talked, to, you talked about trust. And when you have these relationships where there's trust. And so uh, my uh, following up on that, because I think that's important, how, how do you build those trusted relationships? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure the other panelists have some good tips too. Um, for me, I think it starts just by like being um, a human and just getting to know people. And um, and I, you know, I try to get to know my clients and I've been very lucky because every single in-house job I've had, I've become friends with my clients. Um, and I don't view them as clients, I view them as colleagues. Um, so getting to know them as a person, but also asking them, like I said, I think outside counsel should ask, I ask too. So, um, you know, what are your challenges? What are you, you know, I'll see them, you know, in the hallway during normal times and grab a coffee. It's like, what are you working on? You know, or what's, what's annoying you and just really understanding the challenges of their jobs and then just being responsive and helping them solve problems creatively, um, being the yes person. I mean, you know creative yes person, not yes, just to say yes. And so they understand over time that like you are actually there to like support them and partner with them. And, you know, one example is, uh, 
when I first joined TU, um, I was working on our global trademark portfolio and they never really had somebody helping them focus on that. And I had suggested a strategy. They didn't even ask me for it. I was, they just told me something and I'm like, well, have you thought about this? And they're like, what? Like, no one's ever mentioned this. This is amazing. And, you know, and they knew that, okay, she's on our side because she's just bringing up ideas and ways to help us just by IMing us or being at the meeting or being in the room. Any other thoughts uh, on how you build a trusted relationship? So I just wanted to add, you know, paying attention to them. I, I, Anne had mentioned, you know, being responsive, but I find that just giving them attention, whether it's, um, you know, calling up every, you know, year or two years, depending on the location and saying, I want to come out and visit. I want to you know, take a tour, I want to give some training, whatever it might be, I think that they feel um, respected and, you know, again, your partner. Um, so I think that that's very helpful. Um, I also think um, being able to give them advice that is understandable. I mean, we're, we're lawyers and we tend to write um, oftentimes or even out, outside counsel will sometimes write things in a way that I have to revise to make it understandable for the businesses because they don't understand legal, right? So I, I think providing them with advice that they can understand without having to ask a million questions, I think then they, they start to trust that, you know, you're, you're there um, to help them and, and get them through their issues. I would yeah. add, yeah, so I'm, I'm with you both. Um, frequency of communication was on my list too, uh, right? Circling back so that they know you're on it. It's, it, you know, you're not just going dark. Um, other things I would add for building a relationship and building trust, being open and transparent. Based on what you've told me, here's the issue I'm concerned about. Let me look into it. I'll come back to you with some options. Be back to you by end of week. And then the second thing that I would say to building a relationship is, doing what you say you're gonna do. So, right, you're open and transparent, here's some issues, I'll look into it, and then you actually get back to them by Friday, or if you need more time, you tell them, hey, early next week. But, right, you follow through and uh, do what you say you're going to do. Um, third thing I would say to building a relationship is owning misses. So, when something doesn't go the right way, or you give the wrong advice, right, hey, I, th I thought this was the issue, this is what I thought we should do. Looks like that's off base, based on what you told me. Let's go this direction, right? Owning it, being transparent, and then moving on. Um, I think those are really helpful because it leads to Anne's point of authenticity, right? I'm here for you. I haven't forgotten about you. You're on my list. I'm gonna do what I, I'm gonna deliver for you. And if I'm wrong, I'll tell you. I, I don't know how much more I can really add to that, um, but one of the things is um, being involved and, uh, as I mentioned right at the beginning, sort of sticking your nose into their business. Um, they want to know, I think, that you are interested in what they're doing and that you're involved in what they're doing. And um, if it's even just the, the, the more fun, if this is interesting and cool type technology or product, but also, oh, this is going very badly you've had a, a, something happen out in the field or there's a product that's struggling and you know being able to relate to the fact that yes i understand it's happening and then sort of jumping in to try and help you know because you know, they, we're really there to help them and they have we help support the business the businesses are the, the marketing people and the product development people we're there to help those people get that product out so that they can have a successful business. All oh, great. Steve. And Adam, Adam, just real quick, someone asked um, if any yeah. of you work remotely, how do you build relationships with the business? And I would answer that by saying that I think everything we've said here is relevant to if you're remote, you're working remotely. I think you just need to get out to those businesses. Um, see them in person, meet them, get to know them a little bit. And then when you do have conversations with them, do it via Zoom, do it via video so that you don't feel as disconnected. Um, I'll say that 
I mean, me personally, I go to the office in Glenview, but 95% of the people that I support and the businesses I support are not in Glenview or nowhere near Glenview. So, I mean, I, I use all of these, you know, all of this advice every day. And I feel like I have the trust of the businesses because I'm, I'm there for them. I'm seeing them. I'm, I'm communicating with them. And I think that's key. Yeah. yeah, I started this I started this job in the middle of the pandemic and I was super nervous about how am I going to do this, right? Cuz like like we've all been saying a huge part of just starting out and setting yourself up for success is building those relationships from the get-go. And I will have to say it's gone really well because we all have Zoom fatigue, but you you really need to for me, I feel like you need to be on video. You need to see people's facial expressions. You need to see if they're reacting, if they're, if they're understanding you, or if you're coming across clearly, or if you see the frustration on their face. Um, and, you know, I use IM too, so I can sort of real time. It's sort of like the virtual version of like a swing by by your office. Um, and uh, I even, I know I'm talking a lot about outside counsel right now because, you know, that's such an important part of our jobs. But when I talk to, I've had to meet a lot of new outside counsel because I've inherited the portfolio and other work. And now I'm very explicit when I, it's the first time I'm talking to them. I actually say, I prefer to see you on video. Like I, I have been on CLEs where outside counsel said, I don't want my clients to be on video. I'm so tired. I'm like, yeah, but I'm trying to establish a relationship with you. I'm trying to establish trust with you. And I also want to see you on video. So I, I actually request that at least for like the first one or two meetings when we're really trying to get to know each other or discuss something critical. I would add, right, as an optimist perspective, Zoom can help build relationships because you can feel comfortable in your home. You can be with your kids. You can be anywhere. You can be in any city. All of my work is in California. Everything I do is in California. I don't feel like I'm left out by any means. If anything, I feel like I'm more integrated because, you know, the communication never <laughs> never stops. <laughs> um, the other point I would add on Zoom, right? This is the world that we live in, and it's probably going to be like this for a very long time in the future, which, you know, is something we can embrace. And I say that because not only do my coworkers know me as the work that I do and the advice that I'm giving them. They know my kids. Y'all probably saw my husband who just walked in a second ago. I know Adam Kelly's dog. You know, like the beauty of being home is that we are humans and people first with other things going on. And it's a beautiful thing when you get to see a glimpse of what's going on. If someone's expecting a pregnancy or there's a baby or, you know, a kid's home from college, those are the sweet spots of what life is made of. And it's nice. You can use that the next time you see them to follow up on that human connection. Yeah, um, for, for me, um, it wasn't that difficult um, once we went into COVID because I'd been at Chamberlain for 15 years. So I had built up a lot of these relationships, you know, unlike Anne and people have started like jumped in the middle of COVID and starting a new role in, in a new company. Um, but especially with new employees that have joined Chamberlain during that time, um, let's say it's a new uh, program manager, a product manager. And so the first time I'm on a call, again, to uh, get, the, get the Zoom, let them see you, let the, have them see you and you see them. And I also always start out with, uh, yeah, you know what, I'm going to introduce myself. So this is what the meeting is about, but let me spend five minutes telling you who I am, what I'm supposed to do for you, how I'm supposed to help you, and how I fit into the company. And then ask them, where were you before? What have you been doing? What's your past history? Um, again, it's that aspect of people want to know that you're interested in who they are and what they're doing. I think that makes a huge impact on relationships. Yeah, a lot, a lot of good advice. I don't think there's one particular right answer for how you establish these uh, trusted relationships, particularly when you're doing it remotely. Um, but there's a lot of good advice. Um, my buddy, uh, Lisa Dunner, well, has a question for us in the Q&A. We'll, we'll break it up into two parts. Uh, so for our panel, what networks do you use when you're looking for new outside counsel? I think um, for me, because I get asked this question a lot, I think for me, my biggest resource is other in-house attorneys. 
and we talk all the time. We're always, you know, we're always networked and I'll, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'll, I will be reaching out to all three of these people, I'm sure in the future and saying, you know, I have this issue. Who do you like? Um, I think that's really helpful because you could read a firm bio, but then you want to know how practical somebody is or how strategic or whatever needs you, um, you're looking for. And then regarding diversity, um, for me, that's really important. Um, it's 2021. There's no reason why your firm or your company should not be focused on diversity. One of the reasons I went to TU is because of their commitment to DEI. I will say I had an RFP recently and we eliminated two firms right away because they did not talk about diversity at all in their RFP. And, you know, when I was talking to my procurement partner, she agreed with me, but she said, well, should we have flagged it? And we talked about that. I said, I don't know, in this day and age, we shouldn't have to flag for you that you need to discuss diversity and that you're intentionally looking at cultivating diverse talent and offering that talent to us and in in your services. That's my personal view. At, at Uber, we have a very large preferred panel uh, council and uh, right, the process was looking at a number of firms and then narrowing down. And I can 100% identify with what Ann said. As part of the panel council review, many uh, firms were uh, reviewed and, uh, you know, um, some made it to the pitch stage, but uh, there were diversity criteria. And if you do not meet those criteria, you are not advancing forward. Um, and that is an objective standard that you can measure. And it is a very easy way for firms to not meet those standards. So I was just going to add to Anne's comment about looking for new outside counsel. And I definitely look to other inside counsel for referrals. Um, I also look to people I've worked with in the past. Um, I, I like to understand and know the work product and you know how, how people function and, you know, are they good at um, agreements? Are they good at just patent prosecution? I, I think when you've worked with people before and you've seen their work product, it's a lot easier to kind of understand and know if that fits within, you know, your strategies and kind of your level of expectation. So that's another source as well. But, you know, oftentimes, you know, it kind of depends on how many firms you need and how much work you have. Um, and who you who you decide to use. Oh, and oh, real quickly on uh, the diversity side, um, you know, I I agree with everything that was said that you know in this day and age, uh, every firm needs to be looking at diversity and you know who what attorneys they're hiring and um, that's definitely something that uh, I think most companies are focused on now. I, I can't really speak to. You know, looking for new outside counsel because I've never really been involved in that kind of process before. But as uh, just from the company perspective, um, one of the key themes and key drivers in our business is diversity. I mean, if, if you're not paying attention to that, then uh, you're just going to end up in trouble. It's just we're not going to deal with that. We try and get as much diversity as possible. Um, and it's really great. I mean, from in all of areas, engineering, marketing, regulatory, oh, executive leadership team, it's across the board. And I just don't see how a company is gonna be able to really survive much further into this, the future without that kind of approach. Uh, so I appreciate the question. Again, any, uh, any of the folks who are attending please uh, either send me a chat or a QA, and a and we'll be happy to review your questions. Um, I want to switch topics just a little bit. When, when we were putting together, we were having some early discussions about this panel. One of the things that we talked about uh, with respect to intellectual property is knowing what intellectual property that we have at our company and then knowing what the intellectual property may be for our, at a competitor. And we had discussed the, the, the difference between being proactive or reactive 
in learning about your own IP or a competitor's IP. So if I just ask the panel, just share with us your thoughts on, on whether being proactive or reactive and either knowing your own IP or that of a, of a competitor, um, what, your, what your experience has been and what your preference is. For me, as an information person, I'm all about let's get the information early, let's identify it, let's disseminate it. Um, so we have a wide range of patent alerts that we have set up. Um, we don't necessarily uh, distribute the results of the alerts themselves, but when we go through them, our team goes through them, and we go, oh, well, you know, the delivery folks are working in this direction, let's go talk to their engineers or their firmware people and see what's happening there and make sure that this isn't going to be an uh, impediment or some sort of issue for them. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a little bit ad hoc about what we disseminate, but it's very specific um, discussions with the businesses and product development people. Um, another aspect of it is um, when you're talking about like patent landscapes, um, we, we do a fair number of those, but we do them more what I call tactical landscapes versus more strategic landscapes where you're trying to look at thousands and thousands of patents and trying to figure out where the white space is and things like that. Um, our industry, our business isn't really geared towards that. I mean, I can see big pharmaceutical companies getting some value out of that. But for us, it's, it's all about where we're going next, and, and things like that. So with, um, we know there's gonna be, a, say a new initiative and we're gonna be looking at uh, technology X. So we start looking at technology X and maybe especially some of the key players put together a, a landscape and it has all the you know usual patent information, but also little technical notes about it. This is the key feature that it's trying to cover. This is what they're doing and trying, you know, is one company involved in this a little bit more? This is the niche that they're trying to go after. Um, from both product development, so we know what the potential hazards are, but also our business development marketing people love that too, because then they go, oh, so so-and-so is working in this area, and so-and-so is doing this, and um, they may be a, a better potential joint venture or partner with us down the line. So a few things I wanted to add, you know, obviously on the proactive side, there's landscape searching, as Jim had mentioned, there's periodic competitive searching, you know, where you go out maybe quarterly to see what specific competitors are doing. But there's, there's other types of competitive analysis uh, that might vary dependent upon company, technology, or any other number of factors. Uh, for example, you know, if you work at a consumer products company, you know, just going out to the local target and scanning the shelves to see what competitors are doing um, can oftentimes be important just from a, you know, to understand what they're doing, but also to see if anyone's infringing. Um, one of the competitive tools that everyone uses in the automotive industry is a software called a 2 mac one It's a platform for viewing teardowns of vehicles. You can literally go in and see every single component of, you know, maybe not every vehicle out there, but numerous vehicles. Um, and it is used by, it's paid for and used by probably every OEM or any company really that touches uh, automotive. And there's also consultants out there that do teardowns and they walk you through vehicles and what's happening on those vehicles. And so, you know, that's very specific to automotive, but I think there's a, especially in, in view of the internet and everything being, you know, kind of out there, I think depending on the industry, there's other resources that you can find um, and utilize uh, depending on your industry. And a follow up when you said, you know, going to the store and looking what's on the product shelves and what, that um, we do that quite a bit and I remember my daughter was about 15 and I was out at the store and bought a couple things and, and she said why are you buying that dad I said well 
um, they're competitor products, so we're going to take a look at them, start taking them apart, see how they work. Then my daughter goes, you're spy buying, which I thought was just <laughs> a, a wonderful little thing. So we do a lot of spy buying. Yep. When I, when I was IP counsel at uh, Mars and Wrigley, I would do that, and it would be so much fun because I would be buying candy bars and gum and candy. <laughs> but um, I, I completely agree with what's said, and I'll just say that I think being a, having proactive competitive intelligence and monitoring is, for me, like a sign of a mature um, IP strategy, um, and that just helps you but helps the business. So that's something that um, I strive for um, in my job. Um, especially with like the patent alerts, because our industry, you know, it's gotten more complex over the past 10, 12 years. But, you know, you know, garage door operators, things like that. Um, and quite a number of years ago, we saw a couple patents from a company and we go, we don't even know who that company is. Who are these folks? And we took a look at them and ended up, they rolled up into a larger business unit that was one of our bigger customers, right? And so we went to them and we said, look, we have a lot of IP. You have these two applications and it looks like you're trying to develop a product. You know, how about, you know, we work together and just make this relationship better. So because we had a heads up that they were thinking about it, we were able to be more proactive about how we went forward and uh, tried to deal with that issue. Sort of preemptive strike, if you will. But it builds up a better relationship and our relationship with them is, is still very, very good. And I think, Jim, to use Anne's language, that what the, the description that you just gave about being proactive, that definitely demonstrates a mature, IP strategy where you're you're looking at pending patent applications and then making a business outreach uh, to try to collaborate. Um, that is for sure. Uh, we have a, a question that just popped up in our Q&A. What kind of resources is everyone using or recommending for competitor IP research and monitoring? And I think one was just Aunt, uh, Aaron, AZ Mac one. I think that was if my memory's correct, that's what you said. Uh, any any other C folks use? It's A2 Mac one, and it's it's A2. very specific to automotive. I'll, I mean, if you're not in automotive, it's not going to be helpful. Um, but I mean, I I think software wise, internally we have I think Thompson Innovation that we can use. Um, we do have, and I don't know exactly what the resources they have, but we do have what we call an innovation center at Illinois Toolworks that does some of that searching, that landscape searching for us and can do, um, you know, different types of things. Um, a lot of, you know, competitor analysis, that type of uh, searching. Um, but I don't know exactly what tools they use. I know there's some, you know, some search firms, uh, but Generally, I mean, we try to avoid paid searches if we can, but oftentimes we need to do that. It, for us, our main tool is um, Thompson Innovation. Um, it's a really nice platform. It's web-based um, and um, it has search capabilities. It has some analytical tools involved in it. Um, it has all the information, like all the input on family information, legal status information, um, so it's a really nice comprehensive tool, um, but there are a lot of other really great tools out there um, that are, are similar. Um, but we also supplement that with STN Chemical Abstracts um, because it's a more traditional online search tool um, that I've been using for many, many, many years. Um, and another part of it is I do a lot of patent searching, but we also do um, use other research tools that are more broader based. We do a lot of company profiles. What, what is this company doing? What's in the news? What is they, what's their history? Who's the, the CEO? What have they done in the past? Um, and because in a lot of ways, for me, one of the interesting things is putting together the picture. I mean, when I start getting, I, I start getting, I can feel my, my legs getting a little bit, all right, we're getting close. We're about to put together a picture about how all this fits together. And so there's just, you really need to use a, a variety of tools to be make, make sure you're comprehensive. 
Yeah, one, I think some of the disadvantages of being in the house is you don't have all those platforms. So I definitely talk to the outside council law firms to see what they have access to. And sometimes they have access to tools that I don't even know about. But I say, this is my objective. This is what I'm trying to do. What can you do? What can you do? And then I agree with Jim. It's sort of like, it is fun because it's like you're trying to put the pieces together and trying to predict what your competitors are doing. And sometimes like Googling, you know, go on Dun and Bradstreet. Um, and then I, I will go to the business too. And I say, this is what I'm seeing. Like, Forest, what are you hearing? And sometimes they'll say, oh, well, I've been talking to my customers and this is what we think might be going on. And then, and then when you have that conversation, I think that also helps build the relationship because they're like, wow, you're really thinking about my business and you're trying to get my business knowledge and incorporating that. It is really fun. I mean, it's time consuming too. So it's, it's, um, it's hard to find time, I think, to do that if you've got a lot of other hats. I do. And how do you manage all of this information, all this, we'll call this competitive information that you have? I mean, it, it could be exhaustive or it could be a little bit, but how would you, how do you manage it? Um, I'm not sure how management overall, but one of the things you really can't do is just throw, throw raw information at people. You just can't like do a, a dump and go, hey, there you go, we're done. Um, a, a big part of my job is to put it together, start putting together that story, trying to explain how the pieces fit together, bring it, get rid of the extraneous information, um, put together the documents and highlight the areas that are probably more key and more important, and have a, a separate write-up that talks about what I've done, what the pieces are, what I think are the important aspects of it, so that they can get right to the heart of the matter. I mean, they have a lot of other things that need to get done, right? Um, so as an information person, I looked at that as that's my job to make it into a cohesive package for them. This goes back to writing and communication style, but at Uber, we use uh, the acronym TLDR, too long, don't read, right? It needs to be a one sentence. Here's the problem. Here's what you should, here's how to fix it. Right, so it's too long, don't read it. You gotta get it to a sentence. And then the other thing uh, would be, it needs to be actionable, right? Lots of things are interesting. We get a lot of information. Information is interesting. What next? Why are you telling me this? Why are you spending my time, right? So not only does it need to be a TLDR, but it needs to have a call to action, right? Here's what this means, here's what you should do. Or go, right, escalate or do whatever you need to do internally. Yeah, that, it's a little bit like uh, I you know, read about uh, writers who write novels and things like that. And sometimes you have to kill your babies because it's not going to get the book where you want it to be. And so sometimes I find really interesting nuggets of information and I go, oh, I don't get to share that. That was a great piece of information, but it doesn't add anything to what we're trying to explain and get to. And I would argue saying focus is the greatest way to drive innovation because although interesting, maybe not actionable or not actionable right now. So Aaron, I, I like that too long, don't read. I would also say on the flip side of that, if you're outside counsel, when you're communicating with in-house counsel, I think that applies just as much or even more because I get things from outside counsel sometimes and it could be due tomorrow. And I, if it's too long, I don't even want to touch it. <laughs> so I think that's- yeah. I have Go a ahead. workflow management technique that I will share with you all. And this applies to outside counsel, but just generally anyone. If there are too many words, I flag it as right uh, follow up. And then I just look at, I need yeah. to look at it some other time. Because if I cannot touch it and make some yeah. type of action, I do not have time. The flow of communication is too great. So if there are literally, yeah. visually too many words, you just need to cut it down. Yeah, I yep. skim to see if anything's on fire. And if it's not, then I'm like, I can't deal with this. And, but it yeah. needs and to then, be at the top, right? If it's on yeah. fire, I need a TLDR. Exactly. Yeah, this I'll is flag it for another day, custom date. Yeah, I do that. 
Um, and then the, I've, I've said this and I think it sounds harsh, but I've said this to outside counsel and I've said this to in-house people who are starting in-house. I'm like, if it doesn't fit on this little screen, it's not, it, it's got to fit on the little screen. Otherwise you're not an effective communicator and people are like, what? And so I, like, literally, if I can't see it on a little screen or if you're communicating the business and it doesn't fit on the little screen, it's not going to be actionable in Aaron's words. Fabulous tip. Because, right, to just take it one step further, I may be on a Zoom call and then checking my phone, right, if it's something that doesn't apply to me, because there's just to say, you know, to manage email appropriately. So that is a really, you know, the little screen test. That's a great heuristic. Well, I think it, it, practical advice, and I think for, for all of us, you know, whether we're in person or we're working remotely, you know, we were just inundated with so many emails and so much information and you need to have ways to uh, manage your own sanity uh, first of all in in dealing with all of these communications coming at you and if there's a way to prioritize them that um, you know you don't have to respond to every single thing the minute you see it uh, I know for me personally if I if I receive an email that's after a certain time of the day um, I I tell myself, you know, I'm not going to respond. It's going to be tomorrow. Um, now, again, if it's on somebody's hair is on fire, that's a whole different deal. But, you know, at least for me, I might keep my own sanity by not having to have this need to respond right away. Uh, but I see Adam, Adam is here and uh, I'm, I'm sure we've probably reached the end of our time, but b before Adam uh, moves us away, any, any last thoughts from anyone on the panel before we, conclude. So I think if any... I'll just make a plug, right? I think you are seeing for our audience and from the first panel, fabulous examples of all the different ways that you can practice IP and how exciting and energizing the practice can be. Um, and so my message, I think, to students would be, even if you don't know your path now, hang in there and write uh, your career can take many different turns. And ultimately, it can be very fulfilling. To explore the timely and important issues of IP, internationality, and inclusiveness, we are delighted to welcome Yen Florzak, Senior Vice President and Chief IP Counsel of 3M. Yen has an impressive resume. She's been with 3M for over 20 years as a lawyer and altogether nearly 30 years in different roles, first as an engineer in 92, then a law clerk, then a lawyer, and later appointed as chief IP counsel. In between, Yen has led 3M's Asia Pacific IP team and was based in Shanghai, China for several years. Yen, your connections to Minnesota go back a long way. You earned degrees from the University of Minnesota, both in chemical engineering and material science and engineering. Then you went to the University of Minnesota Law School and you decided to stay in Minnesota with 3M. Tell us about your background, where you grew up, what brought you to Minnesota and what made you stay? Well, thank you, Esther, um, for that kind introduction. And I am delighted and honored to be a speaker at today's uh, session at the John Marshall School of Law. Um, so my background, I was born and raised in Saigon, Vietnam, and uh, emigrated in the 19, mid 70s due to the Vietnam War. Um, when we left Vietnam, uh, we actually ended up in a real small community in Hutchinson, Minnesota, where 3M has a substantial presence. We have our manufacturing plant there. Hutchinson, Minnesota in, 19, in the mid-1970s was population 7,900. Now I came from a city that's about, you know, a million um, up just outside of Saigon. So a very big metropolis to a, a farming community in Minnesota. And it is there that we just um, had to integrate uh, had to learn uh, how to be so um, refugees, basically, and really integrated into the community. It wasn't easy, but we, we were on our way integrating to the community. You know, so then thereafter, as you noted, um, I went to school at the University of Minnesota, loved, loved science and math, just, just really enjoyed it. Um, 
not because I'm Asian, you know, you, there's this, this characteristic that all Asian people like science and math. It's just, I just really excelled at it. I understood it. I was connected with it and decided to go into a field that I knew um, that I could be passionate about, which was chemical engineering and material science engineering. Now, mind you, at the time, um, you know, I have, I come from a very large family of six boys and, and three girls and, you know, engineering, you know, was really, really popular at the time, but I knew, I knew that I could get a job. I mean, at the end of the day, I had to find a job and, and uh, support myself. And I knew that I could get a job in engineering and which I did. I was able to uh, find a job of all places in a pharmaceutical company um, in, in Chicago area. I worked there for a couple of years, really loved it, made life-saving drugs and pharmaceuticals for premature babies, um, really understood the idea of what a process engineer was like, uh, working in the plants, uh, getting all suited up to make uh, very high uh, clean and pure pharmaceutical products. And then I was drawn back to 3M. So I worked two years first at a pharmaceutical company before I came back to 3M, where again, I was a product development engineer working on some really neat products, really vehicle safety products to help uh, consumers and drivers like you would need to see large vehicles at night. And it was there that I really was intrigued in patent law. Um, I just knew that uh, the intersection of technology and law was really interesting. 3M at the time had a plethora of uh, patent attorneys, so I connected with a few of those patent attorneys and thereafter really decided to go into the legal field. Now, I will share that my husband is also um, in a technical field. He has a, a, his PhD in physics. And so the two science people, my husband and I were like, well, well, do we really want me to go into law? And I did, and it was the best decision I ever made. Like I said, the intersection between science and, and um, legal and, and the technology was super fascinating, really uh, fun to learn. And, and then I went to law school, as you indicated. And what's made me stay in Minnesota is just, um, you know, minus the weather, minus the weather <laughs> i would say it's a it's a very nice place to live and it's um it's the company itself and the area itself the company that i work with right now really values intellectual property so that's why i've stayed as long as i have um with 3m and to turn it back to you yeah and what an amazing journey um from being in vietnam and coming over to the u.s under those difficult circumstances and growing up as a refugee in in middle of America, uh, mm -hmm. with a in a very small town, and you found science, then you found law, and you found 3M, mm -hmm. and those three things have led to a very long and successful career with one company, which is quite a rarity these days. I've been at Finnegan for 25 years, and I often get surprised reactions that sometimes make me feel like a unicorn for having stayed at one company. Um, as someone who shares that a common longevity, um, what key things do you think have made you stay with 3M your entire career? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, one thing I've said before is um, intellectual property is really embedded in 3M's DNA. I will say that if you look at our history, 120 years, nearly 120 years in existence, our very first um, chief office uh, CEO, William McKnight, he really understood the value of patents. In fact, in the, in the uh, 1930s and 40s and 50s, he's, he hired lawyers who um, obtained patents for uh, our sandpaper products and also enforced patents. And he really understood the value of intellectual property, in this case, particular case, patents, as to protect 3M's um, businesses and, and, and market share. And so protecting the company's unique products and services has been a priority for 3M over 100 years. Um, and as I said, through our, our, our um, CEO, William McKnight, this is a company where innovation is the growth engine. It really is. And new products replace predecessor products at a very fast rate. 
So intellectual property is just a vital asset to the company's growth. Um, and also, we naturally, I, IP lawyers, not very many companies do this, and I have looked around, but IP lawyers in 3M have a seat at the table when it comes to leadership and what we call leadership teams. We are invited to the table because the company and its executive top leadership understands the value of intellectual property as an asset that propels the company's growth. The sense of purpose too, going into work every day is so important to us. We have a clear purpose. So what is our purpose? And this is what I tell my organization globally. We are here to create intellectual property solutions. That's what we're doing. We're creating solutions to help our company grow, to protect our company, and to advance our company's vision. Pretty simple to roll off the tongue, help with growth, protect the company, advance the company's vision. And everybody rallies around that. I find that um, expressing that vision to our, our teams globally over and over and over again um, is very, very helpful. Well, that's wonderful yeah. to hear that you have such deep passion and appreciation and recognition for the importance of IP from the highest levels of leadership, which is really critical to um, managing and, and enforcing IP rights. And you have to do that in your position, not only in the US, but globally. So please tell us about how you manage such an extensive IP, IP portfolio for US and abroad. Yeah, so um, we, do, we do have a portfolio, as you say, a very substantial portfolio. Um, as of today, where our portfolio in the patent is about 35,000 assets. And we, when we trim that portfolio, it's, remember, it's an asset that has to help the company grow. And so we manage that, and I don't do it alone. I, I manage that with my global team um, around, uh, around the world. Um, you know, part of it is understanding what your portfolio has and how it protects the business, first and foremost. Second, how it keeps the competition away. How does your portfolio fundamentally keep, have you build um, a picket fence to keep your competition away? And I do that, uh, not personally anymore, but me and my team do that around the world. We do that on the patent side. On the trademark side, it's quite different. It's really um, strengthening our brands around the world. So it's knowing your portfolio very, very well, knowing your business very, very well, and making sure those matched up. And then also knowing your competitors well make sure you can keep competition away. Those are very good points of a three-legged stool. Um, how is 3M's IP team structured? So yeah, so thanks for asking that. Um, we are, uh, we very much support the R&D function and the manufacturing function. So we have 160 employees, a little bit more than 160 employees globally. And we're mainly in four areas in the US, we're based here in the St. Paul area. In Europe, we're mainly in Germany. In the greater China area, we're in Shanghai. And in Asia, we're mainly in Tokyo with um, offices in Seoul and Bangalore and Singapore. Um, so that's how we're structured. That's how our team is. Um, we are, like I said, aligned with our business groups. So I have a top-notch team of 11 IP lawyers, four of whom are aligned to our four business groups. Um, and they, you can think of them as chief IP counsel for that business group. So they run that business group or run that company basically. And they are, um, they are responsible for all the IP rights, minus the trademark rights, but all the IP rights that that business group requires. So we have four business groups. You may know that 3M is a huge manufacturing company. So we have this group called Enterprise Operations that includes our sourcing, our supply chain, our digital operations team, and we also have a team that supports that. And there we very much focus on our manufacturing team and our engineering teams as we deploy trade secret technology around the world. We have a pretty robust trademark team um, based mainly here in the U.S. and in China. And then, uh, like many large uh, legal operations, we have an operations team, an IP operations team that look, looks at our end-to-end -end process, streamlines that process as much as possible for efficiencies. 
and automate um, the work that we can automate. We also leverage a really strong asset, which is our legal support center in Bangalore, India, that does many of the back office uh, tasks for us. So with, with that, that's how we run the organization globally. That's fascinating. Yeah, and you also raised trade secrets, which often goes missed or under-recognized when we talk about IP, we tend to focus on patents. Uh, what's the split between patents, trademarks, and trade secrets and other forms of IP in terms of time and cost for 3M? Uh, that's a good question. So the way I think about it is I put um, patents and trademark in one bucket. And in terms of people, the 160 plus people that we have, about 80% focus on patents and trade, and trade secrets. So about 20% of our people focus on um, trademarks. And the same, is, uh, same goes to our budget. About 80% of our budget, of our global budget, goes into um, patents and trade secrets, mainly patents. And then 20% of our global budget goes into trademarks. Okay. Um, we are in 2021 and we can't skip over innovation and IP challenges and opportunities without talking about the pandemic. You were appointed as Chief IP Counsel for 3M Company in June 2019, just nine months before the pandemic. How has the pandemic impacted innovation and the workforce at 3M? Let's first work about focus on innovation. You know, oh, in uh, in um, in January of 2020, when the pandemic first hit China, um, we were scrambling because we didn't have the manufacturing capability. We had 3M had 3M does a very has a very unique practice in that they will have manufacturing capacity that will sit idle, that will do nothing um, until we have these surge events, whether it's the SARS pandemic, a wildfire situation, or in this case, a pandemic. And we immediately activated that. If you think about that, that's very counterintuitive because you have capacity sitting idle, doing nothing, right? That's, a, that's a, not very costly, but we knew that we had a social responsibility to, to have capacity ready, and we did. But even when we ramped up all the capacity, the demand was so astronomical, so astronomical mm -hmm. that we could not meet it. And I would say, um, you know, on the one hand, the pandemic has caused a lot of stress and a lot of uh, pain and anguish with lot, lot, lives lost. But on the other hand, I would say governments have really stepped up to help and realized and partnered with us in helping uh, us cre um, increase our manufacturing capacity. Uh, within one year, we went from, we, we made our first billion respirators within nine months. I mean, we, we doubled our capacity, then quadrupled our capacity within nine months to meet the, the pandemic uh, demands. I will say the other thing that, that was really hard and may have been covered in the news is, you know, because supply was so low and demand was so high, at some point we were asking various governments to be able to import, because we make these respirators around the world, China, Singapore, the UK, Germany, and we had wanted to import some into the US. And that was very, very hard because you know the Chinese market wants their respirators there. So having governments help us in pre increasing uh, supply uh, was, was very, very important. And then you, I think you've also saw that during the pandemic, you know, 3M was in the crosshairs of some criticism from the prior administration for exporting our products made here um, into countries where there was no uh, no manufacturing capacity. And you know, our CEO took a lot of um, criticism for that, but that was the right thing to do. These, these countries needed the the, um, the respirators just as much as we did, and we were. We just felt like we had an obligation, a moral obligation to supply to also very uh, countries where the demand was so incredibly high to protect the uh, frontline healthcare workers. So from, a, from a, that perspective, um, if that was a, a huge learning experience. Never before did we have hundreds of dream employees stand up around the world to help. And what is so gratifying is that our employees willingly stepped up because they knew how crucial this was. 
you know, and these are our lawyers, our paralegals, our support staff around the world. Um, besides our, our manufacturing people having to make making these products. So that was just really gratifying to see that employees, they just all stood up and, and regularly rolled up their sleeves to help uh, with the pandemic. And we had a huge, huge um, workload because unfortunately, um, people price gouged, people produce counterfeit products. And we really had to fight that to make sure that the customers, the end users and the hospital workers were getting genuine 3M products. So that was um, on the, um, on the, on the uh, innovation side, a lot of things that we did to meet the demand of the market. What an enormously uh, intense and challenging and difficult and very fluid period um, you and the, the 3M team have undergone. And thank you and everyone at 3M for stepping up and um, helping the community, not only in the US, but globally and being a, a, a true corporate citizen around the world. During that period, even though the pandemic challenges were new to all of us, I, I know um, one aspect of your background must have really helped with that um, period and, and navigating those challenges. And that is your international experience working in Shanghai. You led 3M's Asia Pacific team in Shanghai, China for three years between June of 2016 through June of 2019. First, how did that opportunity come about? Yeah, so um, I actually raised my hand when I was much, <laughs> probably much before I was qualified. Um, I made it known to my managers and bosses and who would ever listen that I was looking for an international experience. And I was very intentional. I just didn't want to go international anywhere. I really wanted to go to the Asia Pacific, specifically to China, because I knew their legal system was very, very different than ours. Um, and I also know that we really have to build our bench strength. You know, what an opportunity to build a bench strength um, in our Asia Pacific team. So I raised my hand in 2014, at least two and a half years before I got the job. Well, um, I, I know we share similarities in our Shanghai experience as I also uh, lived and worked in China for about six years. Um, opening the Finnegan's China office in Shanghai, and we didn't live too far away, uh, even yeah. though our periods did not coincide. And um, there, the international experience is just infused with a, an array of experiences. But I'd like to ask you, Yen, what did you enjoy most about living and working abroad? I think, um, well, first of all, I'll say this, is that um, I raised my hand, but I never knew how hard it was, Esther, in terms of getting my family over there, right? I had to convince my family. Um, and I think that was very, very hard. I, for all the students out there who wanna do this, if you're gonna bring a family, I would say my biggest learning is make sure that the family understands what you're trying to do. And, you know, I think when you went, your kids were relatively young. My kids were, um, uh, they were in eighth grade and 10th grade, so, so I was, uh, creating a lot of havoc in, in their life. But um, I would say one of the best things I learned is just the different legal regime. Just, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a nerd that way, I'll admit it, but I love to learn about different legal regimes and just understanding what China has been able to do in its patent and trademark protection and how fast they've been able to do it is just phenomenal. Just learning um, their IP framework is very phenomenal. I think I, that was one of the biggest learnings I have, having boots in the ground, really understanding what drives the, the, the IP system in China, what, what are the important things that they, they value um, is, is very, very important. So I had a, I think that was one of the best takeaways I had. Also, I, I mean, building the local team, right? Mm -hmm. um, and staying connected with the local team, especially now, I think it's been very fortuitous that I was there and I know everybody in the local team um, to have them feel like they're also part of the big 3M um, is really important in this time of pandemic. It's, I, I have to say, it's of utmost importance that our people in the areas are supported and developed. They know that they're going to be supported and developed. They believe it, they see it, and that they have a career path with 3M. Um, and I think that's really important to me to make sure that I uh, make that connection with the local team and build a local team. So those are just a couple of things 
um, that were my key takeaways. How true those messages resonate with me as well. And as an American lawyer uh, working abroad in a different legal regime, um, it also helps you understand where U.S. fits within the system and how you look at the issues more broadly rather than through a narrower lens. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that experience. Um, I, I do want to pivot to another very important topic which is the undeniable challenge that the IP profession and STEM have confronted for a long time, lack of diversity. According to the ABA's 10-year trend in lawyer demographic study spanning 2008 to 2018, women comprise only 36% of active attorneys and racial and ethnic minorities constitute only 15%. Findings by the USPTO and leading researchers show that women, people of color, and veterans are significantly underrepresented as US patent inventors. And you know that probably from your own experience. Several key factors contribute to greater attrition by women and attorneys of color from law firms and legal practice, including explicit and implicit bias, lack of mentoring, and inequitable work allocation. Yen, would you agree with that assessment and what are your reactions? Yeah, so the data does bear out and show that there is a lack of diversity um, in STEM and in IP. 3M, working through the Intellectual Properties Owner Association, is specifically developed a toolkit to help remedy that. And it's an extensive four-part toolkit to help uh, employers, mainly uh, employers, um, really increase the diversity and inclusion in innovation. And at 3M, we also have this issue of lack of representation of women and people of color in our diversity ecosystem. And our, I know that our, I, our chief technical officer is looking at this issue very, very closely. How do we promote and, and incentivize um, women and people of color to do more in, inventive work? A lot of that has to do with mentoring, I would say, and showing people the way of how to write a good invention, uh, capturing a good invention. Women in particular are very, they think that they have to get the invention all the way up to, um, you know, uh, to enablement in order to write something, to really flesh it out. And that's not always the case, especially as we go into um, other areas that we're inventing, whether we're looking at computer um, generated uh, inventions. Uh, so it is an issue for us. It's an issue that 3M is working on um, quite intently. Um, we also wanted to learn a little bit more about your personal experiences um, and um, working as a diverse woman in the fields of STEM and intellectual property challenges you face and how you navigated through those. Yeah, I would say um, I, when I stepped into the IP field in the late 90s, it was, I would say it was, um, our, our ratio here at 3M was probably more male dominated. And um, I would say that it was a challenge. It was more of a challenge, more, more than anything else, it was a challenge sitting at a business table where you were the only woman. That was really a challenge. And I can't remember how many business trips I took to Tokyo or even to Austin, where I was the only woman, um, only Asian woman to speak, especially in Tokyo, that was more difficult. Um, that was just very, very hard. In the legal field itself, I think, you know, in companies like 3M, our numbers are, are quite that much better in terms of women representation. And I'm proud to say that our, our representation outside of the US is predominantly female, it's probably 60, 40. Um, where we really lack um, representation is people of color. And we're working really hard uh, on that. And how are we working on that? It's really about intentionally, at this point, measuring who we're putting, or not measuring, but keeping track or really having a, a key performance indicator for us is who are on the slates that we are interviewing. It's really important to have representation and we're taking the time to do that now. Before, 
where we, we have rushed through to get someone to, to hire someone, right now we're really taking the time uh, to find the right candidates. And also our talent acquisition team has really helped us to post in very unique places. So for example, we just recently wanted to hire a software person and we would want to post in areas like women who code, for instance, if we can figure it out. So we're also bringing our talent acquisition teams to like, okay, you have to figure out, help us figure out where we could post uh, appropriately. Uh, we're using the bar associations to help get our, our requisition out there. Um, and LinkedIn has always, always been a, a very good place for us as well. Um, I just want to say one thing that's really important and that I'm going to ask, I've asked Adam to put into the chat one initiative that 3M has really, uh, we haven't really, we've driven it, we're, we, we've really tried to help this new organization called the Minnesota Coalition of, um, uh, it's the Minnesota Color Bar Association. We're newly formed last year, we've really helped put that organization together and this October 5, October the 5th, we're having another data reveal um, presentation and what we've done here is we've asked the local companies to really show, to really reveal their data and demographics. I mean, that's, that's kind of a, so courageous companies and organizations, you know, they have to have the courage to do that, to really put their demographics data out there. And we're gonna measure or keep track of these companies and law firms who are very Minnesota based year on year to see how we've progressed, right? It's bringing sunlight to data and without, you have to know where you start and having that data um, is very important. So I've asked Daryl to put into the, not Daryl, I've asked um, Adam to put into the chat here, the registration to our October 5 presentation and our last year's data as well to show how 3M and Medtronic and other companies in 3M in Minnesota are doing on their demographics along with 18 other law firms real easy read. So please just look at the PowerPoint and see how certain companies are doing in their DNI efforts. Thank you, Yen. That's so important to highlight the data and raising the awareness and and also trying to fill the pipeline early on in STEM and IP so that we mm -hmm. can grow and nurture um, that talent as they come through the pipeline. It's been a wonderful um, discussion with you, getting to know you better and your backgrounds. Thank you for so openly sharing your experiences um, as well as 3M's initiative um, on a number of different fronts. It's been a delight having this fireside chat with you. Adam, you. I turn it over to you. Thank you, Esther. And thank you to um, John Marshall School of Law for inviting me. And Mori, the first question I'd like to ask is, what strategies do you have for keeping patent prosecutors engaged in driving business objectives? Thanks, Mark, for the question. First of all, can everyone hear me okay? I just want to make sure. Oh, great, yep. thank you. Um, well, thank you for the question and for inviting me to be on this really fantastic panel. Um, was I, when, as I was thinking about that question and, and strategies for keeping patent prosecutors engaged, I kind of harken back to um, to my career, which I think many of us have the same the same path, which is you start out doing prosecution and then you might branch out into into other things. And over time, if you're working on the same technologies over and over again, it, it can get a little bit stale. But there's two things that I think that always are a wake up call when you're doing patent prosecution. And one is getting close to the customer, not necessarily just the business, but reminding yourself what it is that your business provides to the end user and what value that brings. And it's hard to do, but some of my best experiences have been going on sales calls with sales reps and understanding just in real life terms, how our products are used or how the services really provide value. So, so that's one thing that if you can build into, into your, your quarter or your, or your month from a patent prosecution perspective, I always think that's a big jolt to remind you why you're doing what you're doing and, and furthermore, giving you a better sense of, of what your claims should look like. Secondly, and, and I invite my, my panelists to comment on this, uh, there's nothing like lit litigating a patent that you wrote to remind you about all the things that you could have done or would have done had you known that these arguments were gonna be put in place. So um, 
um, many of us don't have the opportunity of having a patent that we created in, in litigation. But if you ever have that opportunity to, to participate either on, on something that you wrote or, or something that is in your business, I think it's a real eye opener in terms of strategies and, and, and claim construction. For sure. Yeah. And do, do we have other panelists that have any input on that? Mike, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I want to echo from the litigation standpoint, the importance of the feedback loop between patent litigation and patent prosecution, as well as patent licensing, if that's part of your business model as well. It's really important to see the difference as to how, for example, the patent office, whether it's patent examiner or the APJs and IPRs versus the district court versus an ITC judge uh, evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of a patent. Yeah. All right, that sounds good. Any other uh, panelists want to comment on that one or we can move to our next question? I just wanted to remind everyone that the feedback loop still has to be a positive feedback loop. <laughs> um, people aren't going to change if they're constantly criticized or they might not even get better. They might entrench instead. And so it's really important to provide positives where things can be, um, uh, where things went well, as well as uh, potential for improvement where things could go better, but in a way that's not finger pointing, blaming and causing a lot of defensiveness. Yeah, no, that's a great point. All right, Sylvia, I think we're, we'll start with our next question for you, which is, um, what are some prosecution tips for other in-house counsel? And you talked a little bit about feedback loops and you know, possibly um, you know, having a clean file history and how do you, how do you achieve that? Um, I'm gonna build a little bit off of what Moni said. You know, really knowing what the business objective is for a portfolio, and this is a whole collection of patents, not just one patent. Um, and so knowing the end user, I thought that was a great piece of advice. Um, also knowing the business uh, objectives of the, the business unit that you're working for and also the company that you're working for. You know, I break down the purposes of a patent portfolio into four parts, and it does go with what the business objectives are. If you're a new company, a startup, if you're a new business, even in an existing company, you need a patent portfolio just to gain a, a, a toehold of, for reputation. You are innovative. You've you've come up with something that's passed through these patent offices. Once you get a, a product, a leading product, a product that you um, think is going to really drive some profits, you want to get patents that protect that product or that feature that drives the, the ad adoption of that product with your customers. And after that, right, as your company, you've got that um, flagship product, you want to develop a portfolio of products around it. Well, kind of what you need in order to expand into the market is a portfolio of patents that you can kind of trade and cross license with other people who are kind of around the fringes of where you are. That way you can kind of go cost free into other places where other people have patent portfolios. And then finally, if it's part of your business unit, you know, you can make income with your patent portfolio, either as licensing or selling them. Um, you know, in some ways you can say also you can reduce your cost as a cost center because patents are very expensive. A portfolio is very expensive to, to obtain and maintain. So, you know, that's that's a really good tip for inside counsel. And the other thing is leveraging your outside counsel, right? Making sure your outside counsel knows what this particular patent family is, how it fits into the portfolio, how that portfolio fits in the business, and then how that satisfies the needs of the customers. Very good. I've got a follow-up question to that, which is, you know, you, you can have kind of three areas for patents, right? You can have a defensive patent portfolio, you can have a patent portfolio for kind of cross-licensing, and you can have a more offensive patent portfolio. Do you have any, you know, do you differentiate between patents with looking at those three things, or are there any differences if you're going to focus on one area as opposed to another? So for, for me, um, Yes, those three areas, and, and plus the one of just reputation. I mean, sometimes you just need a portfolio to develop a reputation, but those four purposes, um, it really depends on what your business wants, right? Because I have to say that as you go up in those portfolios, as you get more and more offensive with your portfolio, the cost and quality expectations are higher. Um, if, if somebody who is opposing you, as opposed to collaborating with you, is going to look, take a look at your patent portfolio. You don't want to send them 10 mm, 
patents that don't look very good, even though there might be two that are fabulous, right? If that's your portfolio, it doesn't give you a lot of credibility. Now, if there's somebody who just says, hey, let's let's collaborate, let's do some cross licensing, then that might be fine to have 10 that are eh, okay and two that are really good. Um, and so the, the quality and the cost, by the way, increases as you leverage your portfolio more. Yeah, good points. Any other thoughts on that? Actually, I have a, I have a follow up for Sylvia, which I think I think that's really insightful advice. Just based on your experience, how long do you think it takes to start from zero to a portfolio that's high quality and and uh, has enough critical mass to be an offensive portfolio? Yes, that's. I mean, it depends. I've for Motorola and Google, which were fairly um, well established as companies before I joined. But even then, I would say that for any particular new business that we started, it takes on the order of like a decade, right? Because even from idea to your first patent family is what, three years, even with accelerated prosecution and paying extra money and all that kind of stuff. And if you want a portfolio that's more than just one patent, right? Because that first patent is just to develop a reputation, just to get through the patent office. You can need three, four or five in order to protect an actual product six, seven, eight in order to have a portfolio, protect a portfolio of products, nine, 10, 11, 12, in order to have any impact on potential licensees. So, you know, keep adding three years, three years to that, quickly get to 10. And, and I guess a, a kind of another related question is, a lot of companies have uh, agreements with law firms where they kind of have standard pricing for their patents, right? And, and we all try to do it as inexpensively as we can, obviously, because of budgets and other things. But how do you trade off the, you know, the, the quality potential and the cost potential when you have a large portfolio? And and are those sort of managed law firm relationships the best way to do it? Does anyone have thoughts on that? Looks like Sylvia maybe having some technical difficulties. I don't know, um, Lauren or, or Mike, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Well, I can I can speak to to yeah. cost containment yeah. um, and quality actually, um, and it, it has to do with teams and team diversity also. So so there's a lot of things that are involved that um, Google does flat fee. A lot of companies do flat fee for patent prosecution, patent portfolio, patent filing. And in a flat fee situation, the p people who are most fiscally um, efficient are the people who know what they're doing, right? They know what the business objective is. They know the customer. Um, at Google, we, we try to make them the customers, right? So if you are doing stuff on YouTube, you're gonna load stuff onto YouTube. You're gonna try to be a creator, yeah, just for two weeks or something like that. But you're gonna learn how to do that. You're gonna watch YouTube, you're gonna pay for YouTube, all sorts of stuff like that. But you wanna, you know, people who are fascinating, we love our firms who are fascinated with the products that they're serving. They wanna be customers, they buy stuff. Um, I think some of the previous panels talked about spying. We, we have our firm spy on our own products. Um, so people who are really excited about the innovation that they're working on for patent applications generally provides a really great really great work product. Um, and then what happens is when we give them more work because they're really doing really good work, they can be really efficient. And so, you know, they, we, we do, because we do flat fees, we also give the firms the availability, the option to say, you know what, we don't want to branch into this new technology. We would love the money. We would love the work, but we don't have a little group of associates who are super interested in, I don't know, audio codec processing. Maybe you might find a different firm for that. Right. Just following up on that, I, I'd like to, I, I, I totally agree with what Sylvia said and flat fees, I think, um, for the three organizations that I've been in have kind of tended to be the norm for patent prosecution. But I, but as I think about building the IP function specifically at a company like Danaher, which is a, a, a multi, which is a various number of businesses under one umbrella. I, I wanna put a plug in for doing 
patent prosecution in-house and, and really developing a career path where an individual contributor that really knows his or her business and is writing patents based on customer visits and understanding the business objective, as, as Sylvia said, is a path that's celebrated and really, I think, ultimately has the ability to, to produce the best result. Yeah, I think that's great advice. All right, why don't we go on to another topic? Um, so John, I think this one's primarily directed towards you. What are the, um, well, actually, I'm sorry, Mike, actually, I think this one's directed towards you. What are some of the strategies for managing complex patent litigation, including multiple cases, jurisdictions, and co-counsel? Sure. Um, very broad topic, but I, I'm going to focus, so I'm going to focus on some areas that I actually think are very critical, um, frankly, universally applied beyond just the IP context. And a lot of it's frankly common sense, but it's always good to reiterate it and reinforce some, some good practices. But in my experience, one of the most important aspects to managing uh, litigation of any size, but especially more complex and large scale type litigation is communication. And communication in my mind falls into a couple of buckets. One is your internal audience and the other is your external audience or external resources. And you always have to be able to vary how you're communicating with either of them and understand what their primary concerns and focuses are. So, you know, internally, you may have to address the business owner that you're, you're representing, your client, uh, senior executive management. There may be IR and PR folks you have to interface with. Um, it may be sales and marketing, product development and engineering. Depending on the nature of the litigation, I happen to handle right now a lot of offensive uh, patent plaintiff side litigation where these issues are um, relative, you know, relative to protecting markets and, and revenue growth. So it, it's very important making sure you know how to communicate with those folks. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and then of course, you've got outside counsel, whether it's the lead lawyer, the managing attorneys on an, an account, multiple uh, different law firms. And I'll get to that in a second. So, you know, um, one of the best pieces of advice I got when I was a very junior lawyer, I was in private practice for a long time before I went in house was that executives can handle bad news. They just can't handle surprises. And so one of the challenges and most important aspects of managing litigation is trying to avoid surprises. Litigation, as everybody knows, is inherently uncertain and risky. It's in everybody's 10Ks and 10Qs, right? We know that. But if you can adequately advise your internal clients of what to expect, um, so they can risk adjust their thoughts and their behaviors and aren't surprised with good news or bad because they have um, constituents they're responsible to, which may be investors or analysts or bo the board, right? Um, so those things are really important from an internal stand standpoint. And the other thing I would say is don't shy away from the tough conversations. Sometimes that means giving advice that is inconsistent with the executives narrative because you need to give them the tools to perhaps make a different or more informed decision. Ultimately, it may be their choice, but don't, and when, you know, in litigation, you lose sometimes. The best of them lose. <laughs> even, even the very best lose sometimes. You have to be um, prompt and timely and face it head on. Because again, if you've done your job of avoiding the fact that that, that might happen and avoid a surprise, um, usually, um, you can help work through the solutions. You know, my, my experience is always a solution to every problem. You just have to get people focusing on the solution uh, uh, more than, than history. Um, so, you know, with outside counsel, I have a lot of views and it's, it's hard sometimes to narrow them down. But my overarching philosophy is to try and be a partner with your outside counsel, not an adversary, not an arm's length transaction all the time. Because if you're functioning well with your outside counsel, you're enabling them to do what you want them to do, which is win or position the case for you, um, both you and your client, your company. Um, it also means that when you have to have tough conversations, it's actually easier rather than harder if you have an effective relationship with your outside counsel. It, you know, yes, we all have had to have those or been when I was in private practice on the receiving end of them every once in a while. But, you know, you hope they're far and few between, but it's actually easier, again, to solve 
for complicated or tough, challenging situations. Um, uh, the other, um, but when you're managing, let's say a big piece of litigation, you may have two law firms involved on the cases, the primary cases for different reasons of expertise or conflict representation or what have you. And you may have separate IPR counsel in the patent litigation context. It's clearly communicating your expectations for how they're gonna communicate with you, how they're gonna communicate with each other, what their clear roles are. So you're not um, seeing inefficiency in billing and, and over, unnecessary duplication of work. Uh, and, and just being clear and honest with folks and making it, you know, trust but verify that they're going to do that. You're hiring hopefully senior skilled people who understand the importance that we, the client, are, should be the focus. And making it very clear that behavior that's, that's contrary to that, behavior that tries to, a firm tries to leapfrog another firm for the quantity or, 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 or the type of work you're giving them is actually going to hurt them rather than help them, right? And, and encouraging behavior that's focused around you, the client, and not so much around them trying to grab the next little slice of the, you know, a little incremental slice of the pie more. Um, uh, make it very clear um, what your preferences are, your practice preferences are. Uh, you know, I have a particular aversion to lots and lots of memos. I tend to find that they're more for the, for the lawyers covering their own behinds than they are for the advancing the client's um, services. So I make that clear. Um, and, you know, I, different people, reasonable people can differ on that philosophy. But if they want to document it for themselves, fine. But on their dime and on their time um, is the way I look at that. Um, and then another... Uh, uh, and the last point I'll make, well, two last points, uh, sorry, there's two points more I want to make. If I'm going too long, Mark, just shut me up. No, that's fine. Um, um, one, one of the issues is, you know, your communication preferences and practices. Understanding that certain situations call for thoroughness and depth and high quality and time, but sometimes speed and bottom line. And that feeds back to the loop I was talking about with management. Sometimes management just needs to know the bottom line and time to be able to manage good messages and take advantage of them and manage uh, uh, negative results and prevent uh, harm to the company on the, on the marketplace or in other, in other circles. So understanding the difference, understanding who should be delivering certain types of messages and making that very clear with outside counsel if they don't understand that. Um, uh, and typically they do, typically they do, but it's really important to make sure that you're not just assuming. So, you know, it doesn't require the senior partner to feed, to provide their input on every single matter that you're going back and forth with on the firm. That being said, the really big issues, the results, things of that nature, the significant results, they ought to be there and they ought to know what's going on and they ought to be able to communicate it to you. And if necessary, if you pull your clients into the conversation, they need to be able to do it. And, and the other thing that I'll say is, uh, you know, I'm sure we've all either were or have retained firms with very high billing rates. Part of the, my expectation with that is, I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't have a problem with it, frankly, but my expectation with that means there are times that because of experience and knowledge of the law, the senior, senior lawyers ought to be able to just answer the question without an expensive research memo. Um, that it's, it's antithetical to, I would say, the old school way of doing things that date back, you know, to when I started practicing and, and earlier, <laughs> over 20 years ago. But uh, to me, that, that gets lost. And it, it's shocking to me sometimes how many sophisticated big firms fail to appreciate that, that there ought to be the, the practical reasoned answer sometimes is the more effective one than the detailed academic answer. Um, then finally, this is the last point I'm going to throw in here, um, which could be its own full day seminar, is learning to embrace data. I have to admit that was uh, a challenge for me, and it's something I've learned to do. And it's because, uh, you know, most of us can fall back on the old saying, you know, lies, damn lies, and statistics. If you don't know what's underlying the data, it can be harmful, it can be meaningful, it can be used, weaponized, whatever. Um, but oftentimes your clients, your internal clients, that's what they speak, that's what they understand. And if you know how to 
do both quantitative and qualitative, effectively communicate both quantitative and qualitative concepts, you can still make the points you want to make that you may be more comfortable with your lawyer or litigator training, but you can also get other folks more comfortable who are traffic in that data and data communication. So I'll, I'll, I'll put a pin in it there. I could keep going, but. <laughs> no, that was great. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. So let's, let's go to a, a related topic, which is litigation finance. And, and so Lauren, why don't you tell us a little bit about litigation finance, yeah. what it is and, and why we might want to use it. Sure. Thank you. So litigation finance is essential. It's a, it's a finance tool that essentially allows you to take your attorney's fees and costs off of your balance sheet. So litigation financers are, we will provide the funds for attorney's fees. Sometimes we work directly with attorneys. Sometimes we work directly with companies. We can mix and match. It can work different ways. So we can provide the money for the attorney's fees and costs. A lot of firms like it for costs because firms are not in the business of, you know, estimating how much experts are going to be and things of that nature, right? And we all know that co expert costs can be quite expensive. Um, so there are all sorts of areas that can be monic that uh, litigation finance operates in, and IP is certainly one of them. So often, so let me just say uh, commercial disputes are on the table, any kind of breach of contract, trade secret, you know, antitrust, international arbitration, all of that is open game for litigation finance. But in the IP space, what you see is a lot of plaintiff side litigation finance when you have, you know, a portfolio of, of patents or, you know, just individual one by one litigation, you know, especially in what I'll call the EE or, you know, big tech semiconductor area. Um, and then you also see on the defensive side, defendants using litigation finance because, um, you know, maybe you have a big comp, it's a way of leveling the playing field, right? Maybe you have a big company suing a little company, little company just, you know, doesn't have uh, the budgeting and or even maybe even all the products to provide what they need in terms of defending themselves appropriately. So that's in a nutshell what litigation finance is. Um, when you should consider it is basically at think of litigation finance in many ways like what mike was saying for communication you got to consider it early and often so we will look at cases that are before a plaintiff is even you know maybe they've just gotten a patent let's say or maybe they're on the cusp of having a product approval or maybe they're on the cusp of watching a competitor get a product approved that's a time to go talk to a financer. They can look at your portfolio. They can figure out what are going, like what is a strategy here? And for very sophisticated financers, you can engage, they can help you through the process of getting licensees in place, right? And if they won't license, then you can get into the litigation. There are some companies that will not license unless they are sued, right? So there are financers who can help you through that entire process. But you don't, so you can do it early. I think most people think that litigation finance only comes into play when you get sued <laughs> or when you are on the verge of thinking who to sue. And what I would say is, you know, again, early, but then often through the case. So I often have client, uh, counter, we call them counterparties because they're not clients. Um, counterparties come to us early in the case, or maybe they're in the middle of the case, uh, they're at the trial court level. And they're realizing that they took on maybe a bit more than they could chew, right? <laughs> so maybe there's a lot more, maybe they want to add more patents to the case, or maybe more defenses have come up that they just didn't anticipate, right? This is another reason. This is also a place you can get litigation financers involved. And then finally, we'll even do um, appellate de-risk. So say you've won your case at the district court stage, and you're going to be entitled to some damages. We can pay you your damages now, and then, you know, of course, we're going to take a fee out of that, and then the case can remain. So the money's at risk for us, right? So you get you don't have to wait for your case to play out. So those are kind of some areas. We'll also fund IPRs and PGRs. So, um, so this is pertinent to prosecutors as well, um, because oftentimes the prosecutors, right, are kind of that phase in between the you know, going to the IPR, PGR, you know, and then into litigation. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. 
let me kind of talk practically. I sat in-house at Teva for almost 10 years and at Abbott for uh, two and a half years. So I know what happens with budgets, right? We all know that um, law firms are known to increase their fees and their rates every year, right? It, it, it happens, right? Guess whose budget doesn't increase every year? Internal budgets don't increase. So this is, so you can think of litigation finance as a way if you're looking at a $10 million litigation and depending on, you know, how you, um, you know, how you distribute and allocate, you know, those, um, you know, those budgets, this is something you can take off of your balance sheet because it's not a loan, all right? The, the litigation funders are putting the money up at their own risk. Okay, of course they want a reward at the other end, right? But if you lose the case and the litigation financer spent $10 million financing it, you're not paying them back that $10 million. That's a part of the risk reward. Now, if you win your case, and again, you can structure the return to the financer can work in many ways, but oftentimes it's a portion of the damages if you're a plaintiff and you're entitled to damages, it's some portion of those damages. If you're a defendant, we often structure those as, you know, if, if you're a defendant and you have a product that you're trying to get to market or keep on the market, some kind of royalty fee, royalty on the product sales that are maintained, or maybe your product sales grow, right? So you're a plaintiff, you have a product on market and you keep a, def you keep a competitor off. Maybe you pay back the financer based on a proportion of your sales growth. So there are all sorts of ways that you can kind of tailor this. But what it means is that if you're looking at, you know, a big trial coming up, you know, a, in a quarter where, you know, we know that our um, finance colleagues are very concerned with quarter by quarter data, right? You're taking it off the balance sheet. You're taking it off the P&L, right? So that's the main um the main use of it. And that's why you should think about it internally. Now, litigation financers, they want to make money, right? So we're not looking for you to just send us all your cases that are dogs that you don't want to pay for anymore. Okay. You know, I mean, obviously, but you know, sometimes what happens, and this is what's pretty cool is if you develop a relationship with financers and they have expertise, you know, in this area, we can turn a case, you know, it's always good to have another set of eyes on the case, right? So we have looked at cases where we look at it and we say, you know, have you ever thought about this kind of claim or approaching it from this perspective? Or, hey, we noticed that you have this other set of patents. What about wrapping those in? And it actually can, you know, we're bringing a kind of experience and, you know, expertise to the table that can help maybe turn those dogs, you know, into puppies. I don't know what is the right analogy, but making them cuter and nicer and you win in the end, right? So, so that, that's, that's what litigation finance can do for you. So I'll, I'll stop there and um, entertain any questions or if anyone has any, you know, any comments about it. Yeah, no, that was great. And thanks for explaining that it wasn't, it's not just for plaintiffs, right? I've always thought of it as a plaintiff sort of situation. And so it's, it's it, interesting to structure it in a way that helps defendants also. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's great. And so I'll, I'll just let everyone know. So obviously, if there's anyone on the panel that has a question, please chime in. Also, if there's any participants out there that have questions, um, put it in the Q&A area and we will uh, we'll try to weave those into here. Uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So um, any questions on the, the litigation finance right now? All right. So if not, uh, John, last but not least, um, what are the different methods, you know, focusing on patent hey, license? Mark. Hey, Mark, yeah. sorry, there was someone added in the chat a added. question. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. It's in the chat. So here. thank you for the, yeah, look, the question is, um, what kind of IP diligence do litigation financers do? That's a really good question. So the diligence, and this is a, you know, if we had more time, you can talk a lot about diligence, but the financer is going to look at this as if, you know, they're going to want to evaluate the legal merits, obviously, of the case. And they're going to look at the commercial uh, considerations around it, right? So if you're if you're representing a defendant, you really need to understand the commercial picture if your returns are based on a royalty of sales, right? So they're going to want to look at, you know, they're going to look at the whole, if it's a patent case, right? We're looking at the whole file history. They're going to want to understand the story here. You know, if you're a plaintiff, they're going to probably want access to some of the witnesses. You know, they're going to, they need to be able to justify that there are, that this is a meritorious claim, okay? 
But we're always, and I always caution, we're very mindful that do not want to put you in a position of waiving privilege, right? We don't want privileged information. We're going to come up with a position on our own. It's what do we think about the case itself? And so most of it is, a, you know, you, we're going to want to see, you know, claims, claim charts. We're going to want to talk to, if you already have counsel engaged, we're going to want to talk to counsel. But again, it's for us to evaluate on our own the, the merits of the case, you know, and then we can come up with a, you know, a financing structure. Does that help? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm moving over to licensing, kind of the last piece of the pie here. Um, John, what kind of different methods are there for evaluating a patent license um, to a patent portfolio? Uh, sure. Thanks, Mark. And, um, you know, I've had the chance to do uh, a bit of, of licensing of portfolios in, in my career so far. And so, uh, I, you know, I have some thoughts on this topic and I guess the first, the place I would start is I, I'd sort of note that, you know, people don't really value a portfolio, you know, a patent, a license to a patent portfolio in the abstract. It, it's fairly situation dependent. And I thought Sylvia's comments earlier in our discussion were interesting because she kind of set out, you know, a life cycle or kind of a progression of times in a, in a portfolio owner's sort of, com, you know, company growth that, that you might that you might be dealing with your portfolio, right? So you have an early moment when you're sort of focused on getting some patents for reputation, a little bit later on, maybe protection. And then the, the later stages, you know, were sort of licensing for trade or access to kind of a, a field perhaps. And then, you know, maybe after that, even licensing or, or selling patents for income. And I think it's really in those third and fourth stages that you are probably presented with the idea of trying to come up with a value for a port, you know, portfolio of patents. If you're lucky enough to have a portfolio, you know, enough assets that you're going to kind of conceive of them together, um, and a business rationale for doing that, um, and you're going to sort of try to to put a value on it, either for a license or perhaps for sale. Um, there's a couple of ways that you can go about it. In my experience, I think that, um, you know that context is important to, to really kind of crystallize in your mind as, as you start the project. The goal is to convince a counterparty of the, you know, a value that you think should be placed on a license to that portfolio, or if you're on the receiving end of somebody, somebody coming to you to, um, to get you to take a license, you know, to decide what the value is to you. I think in that latter situation, um, I think it also involves a understanding the value to the, to the, the party proposing the license, right? So it's not simply just what is this to me. I, I think you can get to that in part by really understanding, okay, what does this counterparty think? You don't have to agree with it. I don't. I don't mean that at all. Uh, but really being able to understand how that party is viewing it and and kind of what their what their thought process is going to be is going to help you make your decision about where you're ultimately going to end up on. You know, uh, if you decide to take a license, what value you would put on it. Um, I think there are sort of three easy categories of, of valuation methods, um, at least ones that come to mind very quickly. There's a litigation damages method. If, if you think you can kind of spin out a litigation scenario where you're able to successfully assert a patent, um, what would you get, right? You can do that workup. Um, you can have your outside counsel do that workup and you can get a number that way. Um, if you've been lucky enough to license the portfolio in the past, you also have, um, licensing history as a source of valuation number. And I think there are some issues with that, but I think that's, you know, clearly another uh, another source that you'd look to. And then uh, in some cases, the counterparty's business will actually provide another independent kind of value. So um, I've been a part of licensing discussions where, um, you know, the counterparty, the, the party that we thought needed to take a license had a service um, and they had in their own materials, in their own business practice, you know, talked about the value of the parts of their offering that we thought were covered by our, our patents. And so in that case, you have a very easy, um, a very easy way into a value that should be persuasive to the counterparty. Uh, you'd certainly also use that in a litigation situation. But if the, if the counterparty has, you know, their own words or their own kind of discussion of, of the, the features or the products that you think are covered, that's another way. Um, so here you've got three 
you know, three, there's probably others, but you've got a couple different methods of getting to a value. I think the, the main point I would make in this area is your goal is to have multiple analyses, two or, or three, if you're lucky, converge on a single value or converge into the neighborhood of a single value. And the reason that I, I suggest that is because if, uh, if you've done some licensing, if you've been on the receiving end of a licensing proposal, um, you know that people can be very dismissive, right? Uh, the license, you know, the, the proponent of the license can seem very inflated, not very well grounded. Um, people don't want to hear it. They may not want to take a license, right? So depending on, on the context, um, you might be working uphill a little bit. And one way to counter that is if you can show several discrete theories of a value to a patent, a patent portfolio that sort of converge into, you know, uh, a neighborhood, then I think you start to make progress um, in, you know, in showing the value. Um, Sylvia made a point about credibility and quality. I think that's, that's incredibly important. Um, you know, there's some, some things to think about when you present a portfolio. Um, how, how do you decide what assets to, to share? Uh, how many do you present? If you have a large portfolio, do you select your greatest hits? Do you acknowledge weaknesses? Um, do you uh, only focus on the ones that you're certain of? Or do you show some ones where you think, you know, the coverage might be a little bit more speculative, but you, you do think there's a value there. So you want to show those as well. I think those are all things that you would have to run through in your analysis. Um, so those are some thoughts that I had uh, that I, I wanted to share. I, I know Lauren, you may have some thoughts as well from the, you know, from the financing perspective on how you take a look at a portfolio and put a value Absol on it. I'd yeah, be absolutely. curious. To yeah, absolutely. I think both of you uh, summarized it very well. I think um, one thing to, that I would add there is, you know, you have to, cons and, you know, I think both of you said this, but you have to consider, you know, what's, put yourselves in the in the shoes of the licensee, right? And I think, and, and what I've seen some missteps, you know, in the financing area, but even without is that, you know, some people try to play cute, right? They're, they're trying to hide the ball as to like, what's really the, the gem. If you're working with sophisticated side on you know on there they know what the gem is right don't wait and i think it goes to sylvia's credit both you both made the point about credibility right let's put in there you know what is really the asset that you're looking i think you're going to advance right and it's the same thing if you go to a funder and you say to a funder here's a portfolio right that i want to you know engage your help in either a campaign to license and then litigate you know the funders gonna they're sophisticated or if they don't understand the technology they're gonna get experts who help them understand the technology right so i think it'll and it gets you know you're going to get i think more substantive conversations in the licensing you know once you get into the negotiation if you take that approach now again you got to think about it clearly it's you know this is kind of my approach because i've seen too many times where people just kind of we lose time we waste time uh, you know, on this game playing of hiding the ball when we all know what ball it is that we want, right? So, yeah. you know, but I understand sometimes there are collateral issues, et cetera, but, um, you know, but there, I think, I think it goes in also there's relationship building here. I mean, I, you know, John and Sylvia, and I come from a pharmaceutical and medical device background, but I assume you know, in my background, I was seeing a lot of the same companies over and over again, right? I'm seeing the same um, attorneys over and over again, whether they're on my side or the other side. And there is, that cre credibility is going to extend beyond this particular situation. So keep that in mind too, you know, like, you know, you be, it will follow. You will be surprised when you hear <laughs> how discussions from one licensing event, somehow similar concepts come up later someplace else that you thought, you know, it's in, so my point is, I think, you know, be clear eyed about it um, because it's very obvious when you're hiding the ball or when there's when you're trying to get rid of a mangy dog. Let's put it that way. I know I have I love dogs, by the way. Don't get me wrong. And cats. OK, I have a dog, but, you know, I keep, I'm stuck on dogs. So sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. That's a good point. It is a very small IP community. So all of our yeah. reputations are at, are at risk when we when we do things that are, you know, suspect so it's a good point we do have, i like, wanted to make one other oh sorry sylvia go ahead 
I also like John's idea of, you know, you're, you're trying to hone in on two or three approaches that end up with uh, substantively the same value. And I also want to put in that it's really helpful to have one that's a, a positive pi increasing approach, as opposed to some approaches are more like zero sum game approaches. You know, the money that I give you is the money that loses. But there are some licensing opportunities where you can say, hey, if you have maybe not this patent, which might be a minus um, value thing to whoever you're talking to, we'll also give you this that might provide you a plus value um, in order to increase your ability to enter an adjacent market. Or I notice that you are interested, you know, you've done research in this field, we can give this to you as a positive. So balance out your negatives with your positives when you're when you're providing the value to um, a counterparty. Yeah, I like that idea. That's a really, I think that's a powerful tool. Uh, the only other point I wanted to add here on this discussion was, you know, I, I made the point that uh, you can look to the counterparty's own discussion, discussion of its business if you think you've got you know, coverage of aspects, you know, products or services that, um, you know, that they've talked about and, and value that they've, that the counterparty has framed up. Uh, I think the, the corollary to that is if you're in the earlier stages of the, that life cycle that Sylvia kind of laid out in the reputation, or maybe, you know, you have a, you have your patents, you, you get your first couple of patents, you know, just to establish yourself, get get a name, or you have a little bit larger portfolio and you're using it primarily defensively, maybe keep an eye on what your uh, your executives say about your portfolio, uh, say about any individual patents to the extent that they're making public comments about them. Um, you know, you there are situations where people will come back and, and, and tell the, the licensor, yeah, but you've talked about this patent. You know, here's a, uh, you know, here's something that you've you've said. Here's you know, you here's how you characterized what this covers or or the value here, um, and you may not in the early stages of developing a portfolio um, know necessarily where you want to take the those patent assets later, uh, or where the or you may not see all the places that they really apply. Um, so, you know, just be cautious. I think and, and leave yourself you know, freedom to to show the value proposition in different contexts later. You have to be a little sensitive to, to maybe how you frame them up or discuss them earlier on as you're, as you're developing it. Yeah. So we have a, a question from the, the panel here from, the, from the, the audience that I'd like to get and get your reaction, John, or anyone else that has a reaction. So have any of you had the experience using the Patents for Partnership licensing platform by the UP, United States Patent Office or other marketplaces um, for licensing IP rights. Does anyone have experience with anything like that or similar? I, I don't have experience with that one. I don't know if anybody else in the panel has. Anyone? Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one myself either, but um, you know, there are different groups out there that, that help with these sort of things, right? There, there's RPX, there's, you know, there's a lot network, there's a lot of different, depending on what you're looking for, right? And so I think you've got to figure out like, what's your strategy? Are you being more offensive? Are you more defensive, um, you know? And, and, and find the one that's kind of right for you. Yeah, so, the so one thing I would add to that, Mark, is you're right. I mean, there tend to be several that are more defensive oriented than there are um, uh, for you know, obtaining <laughs> royalty and license rates. I think sophisticated licensors are not gonna wanna share <laughs> that. Share that. They're, they're probably got a better model for how to license, but um, be very curious to learn if there are some out there or maybe regionals out regions outside the u.s where it might be an effective tool yeah exactly okay well let's move to our next topic so um moni i think this one was directed to to you primarily um what's the role of in-house counsel uh when it comes to selecting the best law firm or the best team it, it more generally uh, so so just to clarify we're talking both internally and external team um you know that, that that's a that's a really important question, especially these days, as as we start to try to build out our IP teams and the various companies that Danaher has. And if, if you're familiar at all with Danaher, you know we're very acquisitive. Um, and what we're finding is, and this is no surprise, I'm sure, to, to this crew, is that IP talent is is hard to find. Um, there's lots of options. There's uh, it's it's a great job market, and and attracting the person who is going to be successful in your organization, I think first from an internal perspective, you have to know your organization. 
And more, uh, more often, and this kind of harkens back to the comment I made about celebrating people that want to be individual con contributors. I think if you have an org design that allows people to shine in whatever way they want, some people want to be managers, some people want to stick with the portfolio on day one and see it through uh, for their career. Other people have different technology interests and want to hop around in different technologies and, and contribute that way. Um, I think understanding your organization, designing an IP organization that allows for career progression in various formats, whether that's management or various ways to grow as an individual contributor, um, is an important starting step. And once you have that, I think you attract the right internal talent for the position that makes sense for that person. And it's always a hard conversation when someone uh, wants to be in, in management, but hasn't either had the opportunity to develop skill sets re required for that, or maybe doesn't have um, some capabilities yet to, to do that well. But I think if you're honest with the, the person and, you, and you've been thoughtful about your org design, there's always ways to move people into the place where they can and should be. So that's from an internal perspective. From an external perspective, I think a, 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 a few things are, are, are required and some of it mirrors what I just said. First of all, you have to have the capability um, and the competence to be a good external uh, counselor and, and, and advisor. And that goes to a lot of what Mike said, clear communication, um, some level of rapport and the external counsel understanding how your business works, I think is helpful as well. Uh, but at least at Danaher, we want our outside law firms to look the way we look and we're completely committed as i think many as all of us are on this panel and and, and the audience to diversity and inclusion in the, in the ip profession so we're looking for a diverse um a diverse law firm that's going to put a diverse slate of people on any particular project that work well with our own slate of people and understand our business um, so those are kind of the highlights of how we think about internal and external, externally building the best team. And, and uh, it's, it's a little quirky, but even one of our sayings is the best team wins. And, and that's, that's really what we're all about. All right, very good. I'd like to jump a little bit onto what Moni said. I feel like um, I totally agree on the team diversity and we look at it uh, not only from minority viewpoint, majority viewpoint, minority culture, majority culture, but also just a variety of backgrounds, whether somebody was a former engineer or a former licensing attorney, worked at the patent office, did litigation, you know, all of that contributes to a well-rounded team, uh, not only for building a patent portfolio, but also leveraging that patent portfolio leverage it through the business, through licensing, through sales, anything like that. We also found that um, different people are more collaborative and more competitive. And it's actually helpful to have a variety on the team because if you're all gonna go along to get along, you might overlook some things. And as well as if you're all trying to get, <laughs> trying to reach for the golden ring or whatever, you might also overlook some things. And the other thing for, I think Moni mentioned it a little bit, is for career development, not only internally, but also externally, you wanna have a variety of experience. You wanna have new people constantly on the team so that they can grow and become intermediates and they become seniors. And then the hope is, is that the seniors can go find another group, right? It's building the pie, making the pie bigger, create their own group with new people. And you know that applies to all sorts of diversity, but definitely we're looking at minority viewpoints and majority viewpoints, people who are comfortable with the status quo and people who are uncomfortable with the status quo. It comes in a lot of flavors. All right, well said. So on a kind of related note, um, I think we'll give this question to Mike. What, what's the best way to, to work as a team? And you know, how do you deal with internal client management issues? Um, <laughs> so, you know, sorry, you directed that to me? <laughs> yes. Um, that's fair, fair enough. Um, so some of this is a repeat of what I said before, but you know, as a team, I, I have a, I come from a different size company than I think some of the people on here. So the team can be is substantially smaller. And as the senior person, what I find is most important with your team is giving people ownership and opportunity and willing to be a mentor, even at 
uh, personal cost of your own time sometimes. Um, I think this just ties back into, it's closely related to the topic uh, Sylvia and Moni just addressed, which is um, understanding that people come with a variety of different backgrounds. Maybe they don't fit 100% what you need from a strictly technical sense, but they're going to, they're capable of growing into it if given the chance and given the mentorship and the opportunity and the sense of ownership and accomplishment. Um, I think it's really important. So on your own team is developing the ability to have the proverbial open door, the ability to hear a diversity of viewpoints. Yours may be the final vote, but um, and be willing to explain why. Um, you may overrule a decision or a thought process or why it's equally credible, but you're more comfortable with X, Y, or Z. Or, and at the end of the day, willing to give credit, even <laughs> willing to give credit to external audiences, uh, no matter whether you feel like your kind of final management or guidance is the reason for a result, you don't need to steal and hog the credit. Make sure other people understand why someone contributed, how they contributed, and why that should in the long run lead to their advancement in the organization um, or additional or further opportunities. Um, within the broader organization, it is again, timeliness of communication, effectiveness of communication, learning to hone your messaging to the audience. Some audiences can read three bullet points. Some audiences can read three pages of emails and analysis. Some want it, some don't. So it's learning how to, and some demand instantaneous responses, some don't. Um, and it's understanding how to um, identify your audience's preferences or your client's preferences, what have you, and be willing to communicate with them consistent with those preferences, styles, and maybe capabilities sometimes, <laughs> especially yeah. up the chain. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So we have a, a question from the audience. I'll give to the panel. Um, does a variety of experience also include junior attorneys who make or, or may lack substantial, you know, subject matter experience? I'll start since I'm unmuted. Uh, I think so to a point. It depends. As I said, I have a small team. So uh, I, I can't necessarily start someone from scratch, um, but I can take someone who has the basics kind of building blocks and help them expand them, hone them, refine them, and develop more advanced um, tools. Um, but I do think that that, can, um, that, that that can feature, especially for large organizations or organizations designed to support that. In fact, one of my favorite former team members I wildly endorsed to take a new opportunity elsewhere because of this. She was, it was an opportunity we couldn't, no matter what, if we wanted to afford her, but she was able to obtain elsewhere. And I think that's important, right? And supporting people if they want to leave for further opportunity that you can't accommodate helps. Yeah. I think I, I would just make a comment here as a person who has practiced in, in patent litigation and licensing, but is not a, a prosecutor you know, I, I think Mike's comment that to a point is, is probably right, in, at least in the field of patents, you know, it is fairly specialized. And so, you know, you, you did, even at the junior level, probably you have to have some exposure to, uh, you know, a, a subject area. It could be, you know, pharmaceuticals or software or technology of some sort, you know, if, you know, to, to, even as a junior attorney, to have that familiarity will help. Um, get you get your foot in the door if, if patents is kind of what you're interested in doing in some form or another. And I think related to that, you know, we talked a little bit about law firms and some of the large billing rates and that sort of thing. When, when you're hiring a law firm, how do you balance getting opportunities for more junior attorneys with, you know, the billing rates that they're charging? That's the $4,000 question, right, Mark? Because it's still my view that a tenure attorney do something with a with a four you know three x billing rate over a junior attorney is probably going to do it six x more efficiently. <laughs> so I think you just have to you, 
Some of it is understanding that's part of how the industry works. Some of it is investing in those law firm relationships so that hopefully those more junior attorneys grow into someone who, um, as other panelists have mentioned, understand your business, understand your technology, understand your portfolio, if that's what it's an issue, understands how to best service you. So it's a little bit of an investment on your part as well, um, understanding that, and then making sure that the firm isn't doing that as just you know, kind of the old pyramid scheme, <laughs> right? That, that, that it is to advance your interests both short term and in the long run. I, I think it starts with people at Mike's position or the in-house, you know, the in-house managers, because it, it's there that you get the, the blessing to have a, a team that includes junior attorneys and supports, you know, that the outside counsel's junior attorneys taking on substantive, substantive matters. You know, I was the beneficiary of a of a partner at, uh, at one of the law firms I worked at who would advocate for junior attorneys pretty regularly and a client that was wonderful and said, yeah, let, let him go take a, you know, let him go argue this claim construction at a, you know, at a moment when I was pretty junior. Um, and it was great, you know, and that's how you get started. So, uh, uh, but I think- I'm... Oh, sorry, John, I apologize. No, no, it did. I was just finishing the thought. You know, I think it really does take a commitment from people in the position to sort of give, you know, make that, um, make that opportunity available to to the folks coming up that it really does it really does trickle down it really is important and by the way this dovetails into some of the diversity and inclusion topics we've been addressing yeah. it's easier to say i'm willing to give more junior folks an opportunity if it expands um uh, sylvia put it really well the majority view and the minority view incredibly well um or maybe i didn't capture that right but what my my point is if that's going to give good people who may otherwise historically have not gotten opportunities the opportunity then it's much easier to sell to me and it's much easier to explain to management that's conscientious about these issues and it's uh easier to justify as well because hopefully well, again you're developing that base that's going to eventually really support your organization and in a litigation front where we can be very very front of the house sometimes literally in front of judges and juries um, that's really important it's really important because you there is a function of experience and skill that's required to stand in front of a judge or a jury on certain issues and in certain contexts that um, can only be obtained through practical experience. Can, can I just add that, you know, I think the law firms need to think about this too as an investment in their firm as well. So, you know, for companies that develop these long-term relationships with the firms, the firms have to be willing to, you know, take a cut of, you know, to get those junior attorneys up to speed and to the place where they can really take over. And, you know, and I think you need to demand that as in-house counsel, you know, and so that's number one. And then number two is one of the things that I have seen happen is that, okay, we get the more junior person on the team, but now I have, you know, the senior person who feels that they need to like do double the work, right? A double bill. And so you, you've got to lay out the ground rules, right? Like they have got to take something of a cut here, right? And again, the idea is like everybody agrees, we need diversity of thought, we need diversity of people on the teams, but also you're growing so that you can keep that person, you know, they become an expert for you, you know, as the outside counsel client. Yeah, and if they're not willing to do that, then I think you need to seriously think about if this is a firm you really want to work with. Yeah, great point. All right, let's move to our next topic. Um, so Sylvia, I think this one's to you, um, focusing more on, uh, you know, patent portfolio management as we talked about a little bit before what's the interplay among cost timing and quality when it comes to obtaining patents yeah you guys know about the kind of like just business management right there's the three c's quality cost and and uh, quantity is actually what the last one is but it's it's timing in some some perspectives and the way that i think about this is i have 10 balls tennis balls whatever and I have to split them between these three containers. So I can't split them evenly. Even if I try to split them evenly, there's still gotta be one ball that goes in an extra container, so there's a four. But I think that you really gotta look at your own business. Like sometimes, who cares about how much it costs? I need the best. That's it, that's the situation. And so 
that's it. And then we've actually talked on this panel, right? Sometimes we just need it fast and cheap. That's it. Quality can kind of be eh, meh, whatever. So you put all your balls in those baskets and it's really hard to get people uh, my colleagues, colleagues, sometimes the, the engineering uh, businesses that I serve to try to do something other than three, three, four. But the truth is that their organization is not built on a three, three, four quality, quantity, cost mechanism. They are, for example, some businesses are just fast. That's it. Fast and low. Well, quality is, you know, great. Get the quality that you can in the time that you have, but it's driven on fast. And so getting the reality, getting everybody on the team to open their eyes to what the reality is and to not ignore the elephant, the fast elephant in the room is really hard. But once we've figured that out, then we can talk with the law firms, we can build our team around speed and reactivity. Um, other situations, it's much more strategic, it's slow, but it's like, Drive, drive the quality. That's really what we want. Uh, we really want to license this portfolio. So yes, it's going to be five, six, seven years into the future, but that's what we want. Um, and I think that a lot of that is just being explicit about it and making people uh, like verbalize actually what they're doing. It's so hard, but it's really helpful. And, and, and how do you guys manage that, right? Do you have some sort of metrics that say, you know, a certain percentage of our portfolio should be kind of, you know, you know, lower end, if you will, and a certain has to be higher end and there's going to be a middle part. Do you do anything like that to, how do you kind of manage it? Yeah, we actually do. We have um, tags is what we call them for our assets. And each asset is supposed to be, not that it is, um, theoretically, it's supposed to be tagged for a particular business purpose. Uh, and, you know, you guys probably have a situation where it's like, oh, this was developed for this product. This was developed for this feature. Um, and then as the life cycle goes, right, because you can figure that out. Oh, at the uh, invention disclosure stage, often you can figure out what the product is or what the feature is that you want or what engineering group is supporting this. But then as the portfolio or as a, even a single patent progresses through the patent offices, ah, uh, well, you know, now it's not really going to serve that feature so well, but it might be helpful for licensing. So you move its its purpose over. And then we also have kind of, a, it's called a kind of a ranking system. Yes, it fits the purpose really well. It fits the purpose okay, you know, meets expectations. And then sometimes it doesn't fit the purpose anymore. And then we have to decide if it doesn't fit purpose A, um, does it fit into a different purpose? Um, you know, is, is it helpful? And do we really need another asset to fit that purpose? There is, uh, I think there's probably diminishing returns for um, uh, uh, reputation, right? You, you don't need, uh, I don't know, pick a number, 10,000 patents to say that you are, have a reputation for being innovative. Um, so if you have 10,000 patents, there should be some that have a purpose other than the reputation purpose. Right, right. All right. Why don't we move on to our next topic? Um, so, John, this was going to you. It's uh, kind of circling back on some of the valuation of licensing portfolios. And the question is, what are some considerations when presenting a large number of patents for license? So if I've got, a, you know, a thousand patents or more and I'm trying to license those to somebody, how do I mechanically do that? And how do I establish the value of that many patents at once? Yeah, it, it does touch a little bit on our prior discussion. I mean, if you're in the lucky position, I guess, probably lucky position to have so many assets that you that you want to offer for license. I, I think there are a few things to consider. You're just you, you're faced initially with a question of how how many do you present, right? In my experience, um, I wouldn't say this is a hard and fast rule. Um, I think once you decide to sort of take a set of, well, let's take a step back. If you have a large portfolio, you, you probably are not logistically able to, to provide claim charts or sort of infringement reads or, you know, a detailed discussion of, of why the patent is important for more than some subset of them, right? You're not really going to ask somebody to look at a thousand, a thousand different assets. Um, so at that point, you're, you're sort of presented with the challenge of what, what do you present and, and how do you, how do you frame it up? I, I don't think it's, in my experience, at least, I don't think showing more than about 20 to 30 total it is very productive and, and even in those cases i don't think you're going to have a, 
you're going to have the other side's full attention on more than the subset of those. Um, so, you know, the next question is, let's say you do want to pick out, I mean, uh, maybe you divide it up by uh, areas of coverage or kind of families, that kind of thing. Um, and, and you can go, you can go about it that way. But, you know, you, you probably have to think a little bit about, do you want to highlight the ones that you think are the most important, pull those out, um, uh, or do you just mix them in throughout? Um, and then on the other side, do you want to acknowledge flaws or, or issues that you think, or maybe acknowledge that a certain set is going to be, in your view, very relevant, and another set is kind of tangentially relevant, and you want to sort of take away a talking point from the other side uh, by anticipating it and sort of acknowledging that point up front and saying, look, we know this, this second set here is probably of less immediate relevance, but we still think there's value here. Um, at the end of the day, I, I think this really does collapse to a question of credibility. Like we talked about, Mark, you made the point earlier and, and Sylvia as well. I, I think you have to, you know, it, it's a tool. Um, and so you're really trying to bring somebody along to your way of thinking. Uh, you want to maintain credibility in, in that case. I, I think in my experience where it's been difficult to maintain that credibility is when you're, you've, I've seen portfolios where everything is presented equally, or there's this sort of idea that everything in here is equally good and equally relevant, and you're sort of kind of bluffing a little bit. You, you know that's not true. And, and to Lauren's point earlier, people, people are sophisticated. I think folks know how to look at assets now. Um, you know, that, that skill set is, is readily available to licensors, you know, prospective licensees, uh, other folks who are doing valuations, like the finance folks, you know. Uh, and, and so, you, you know, if you get too far away from a realistic view, um, I, I think you risk kind of presenting yourself as, as not serious or, not, or not, fully, not fully thought out. Those are just a couple of initial, initial thoughts that I had. I'd be curious to know if anybody has a different view or additional comments. I have a different view, but I'll say this kind of tongue in cheek, um, but it gets to the credibility and, and, the, and the number of patents. So back in the day, um, one of my early stops in my career was at Bell Labs, and I was part of the team that went out and out licensed um, some of that Bell Labs technology. And this was around the time I'm really dating myself when, you know, when wireless technology was uh, and GPS was was the thing. And you know, we literally, and this is a little bit tongue in cheek, but you know, you can knock on someone's door and say, hi, we're Bell Labs. We have 30,000 patents. You must be using at least two of them, you know, and that started the conversation. And, you know, and I think it gets back to the credibility of Bell Labs as an institution and having, doing good scientific work. Um, but then also, you know, having, having a gem that, that people really wanted. So, uh, I, I think those were just really great comments by my fellow pal, uh, panelists, and I and I think it's it's harder to do. There's not very many institutions like Bell Labs today that exist. Um, but if you have a portfolio like that, I think that really takes you a long way. Yeah, great point. All right, so we've got a series of questions here um, on diversity and inclusion. So I'll, I'll throw the first one out to the, the whole panel and, and, and get your reaction, but. How does diversity, including you know, gender, ethnicities, experience, roles, et cetera, how does that impact teamwork? Let me just say that it's just table stakes. Diversity of people coming from a diversity of backgrounds, because what you want is them feeling free to express their different viewpoints. And sometimes you might have diversity of uh, people just looking at them from an outward perspective. But if they don't feel comfortable enough or safe enough to points and push against the status quo, it doesn't really give you anything. So just want to put that out there. Any other thoughts on that one? Otherwise, I guess a related question is, you know, how do you ensure diversity? You know, when selecting outside counsel, when selecting your in-house teams, how, how do you ensure diversity and inclusion? And, and what are some things that you've done as, as, at your different companies to help achieve that? Well, you know, it, in in-house, I think it's, well, it's probably similar for law firms as well, but, you know, to just, you know, to put in place a diverse slate program, you know, on your hiring uh, is one initial way to get you know, just get more candidates of, of different backgrounds in in interviews, in those sort of final stage interviews. Uh, what we've seen, um, what we've seen is that, that we end up 
you know, a lot of those candidates are successful, right? And so um, just make a point of, of, of making that a, a criterion for the, for, the, for the hiring process, you know, an explicit sort of um, program that we're gonna look at and then just, you know, capture that in, in diverse slate on the way in and then that gets you at least candidates getting to, uh, to be in front of people and, and has resulted in, um, you know, the, the target groups that we're trying to, to improve representation of, um, you know, increasing. You know, I think also it's taking steps that you're comfortable, can well, maybe a little uncomfortable, but that you feel like can can make a difference and focus more on actions, at least for me. Um, and so looking at external counsel, uh, I retained and I'm heavily relying on um, a law firm in Canada where it's a, the lead trial lawyer and the lead relationship lawyer. Uh, is, is a female and then the significant part of the management of that firm is women is women managed um, used lead trial counsel in France um, who was a, a hundred percent um, female team and lead trial and in the US where I didn't quite have that luxury given the state of the engagement um, had strong conversations with senior management of the firm about adding um, there, there wasn't <laughs> Be careful how I say this, but basically increasing at least the gender diversity on the team that could in the short run be accomplished where we were in the engagement because they're incredibly talented, um, experienced at every level, um, female team members that could be added. Um, and then in the long run, looking at what they could do to improve things. Because there were some other folks there who are just phenomenal trial lawyers regardless and were expertise with our business that I couldn't just completely jettison. But and and as a result, there were you know, there were significant changes made or additions made to our team. So it's being willing to take those steps um, that you think can make a difference in your own small way. I, I don't work for a place that's gonna hit the top 10 um, Fortune 100 law firms and force them to change, but I did it where I can and be comfortable with that. I'd totally like to commend you, Mike. I mean, just the discussion is really important just to show that clients care that customers care um that people are watching is very helpful I, you know i um think you john you've you've kind of alluded a little bit to the mansfield promise the mansfield rule about making sure there's a diverse slate of candidates people who sign up for the mansfield program through diversity labs it's it's making it explicit Can I just add that it's, um, you know, it, it's with you individually. And so oftentimes it's, you know, thinking about what your own biases are, confronting those. Um, I think a lot of times there are, you know, cultural, uh, especially as we, you know, I, I had teams that were all over the world, right? So you had to be very cognizant of, you know, how an American talks is different than how, you know, an Israeli talks, right? Um, so, and anytime you can get that kind of training, but the one thing I do really want to stress here is, and this is just my own, this gets in my crawl, it's not necessarily about the pipeline. There are a lot of great candidates out there currently. This is not just about getting, obviously we need to get, you know, more kids into STEM or, you know, whatever fields we need to, but there are still a lot of great candidates out there currently who are, not pipeline, if you will. And so think, you know, look outside your own biases to figure out like who's already out there that you can use, you know, internally, you know, or even demand somebody on your team or externally from outside counsel. So. I think that's yeah. a great comment. And the only other thing I would add is, is that I think we've made, we're, we're far from perfect, but we've made some progress on gender diversity in our slates and, and, and with law firms. Um, I think there's still a lot of work to do on other types of diversity. And, and um, to, to Lauren's point, there's, there's great candidates out there, but also in building the pipeline, I, what, what I would put out to this team is, if we think about our summer internships and programs, just targeting the really truly underrepresented and even in our current environment um, as as beneficiaries of those programs is something that that we're thinking about. All right, very good. 
So let's move on to our next topic. So we'll circle back to um, litigation funding again, Lauren. And so the question is, how do we prepare for, or, or what do you do to prepare for, and what do you expect during a litigation funding evaluation process, and what does that entail? Okay. Yeah. So actually, there's you you'll get a, a confidentiality agreement in place. It's reciprocal, obviously. Um, you know, both sides want want that in place. Um, then you will, you know, have a discussion. If you have counsel already, um, you can have a discussion with outside counsel um, or, you know, internal counsel just generally about the case. They're going to want to understand the stage of the case, right? If you've already been spending money or have a budget, you know, sharing that information is helpful. Um, so, but, you know, in terms of IP specifically, like I said, you're going to want to know, you know, here are the patents that are issued that we either expect to assert or that, you know, we think are going to be asserted against us or have been or we have asserted and have been asserted against us. And having all that material readily available, um, you know, like I mentioned before, file histories, potentially wanting to talk to experts or people internally who may be witnesses. Um, so there's, and so the, the, the first stage is usually kind of like figuring out, okay, what kind of case is this? This is something we can move forward on. Usually the next stage is a term sheet stage. This is usually um, now where you have talked about, um, you know, you've, you've, you've had a discussion about what the financial terms are going to be, whether, it, you know, it's, uh, you know, how much funding is going to be necessary, if there's going to be a cap on returns, you know, what, what the timing is going to be. It's going to be a little different for, for every deal. But usually there's an exclusivity period associated with that. It can be 30 days, 60 days, depending on the deal, where the funder is going to want to know that you're not shopping this around to anybody else. That now they're going to be, you know, and so there may be um, getting other external um, experts involved to look at, you know, like say there's a, you know, if it's a medical device or maybe a regulatory issue, right? And that, you know, they're going to want to talk to somebody on your regulatory team or there's a commercial issue, you know, but so, so that's the kind of the, the, the term sheet stage, if you will. And that's when you're really into to heavy duty dil diligence. And then you have the, the actual, um, you know, getting to the agreement documents. Um, and then there'll be after the documents, you know, I didn't mention this before, but m the majority of litigation funding is passive. So what do I mean by that? You know, the funder does a lot of work up front in terms of diligencing, understanding, um, you know, what the, what the merits of the claims are, you know, what the returns are going to be, et cetera. But then, um, you know, the, the funder doesn't have say or control over the litigation or settlement. So they kind of step aside at that point, but they're going to want to monitor. They're going to want to have, you know, understand, um, especially, you know, if you're in active litigation, you know, per, a lot of times the funders are paying the law firms directly. So the funders going to want to understand what's coming up, you know, trying to figure out kind of making cash available, um, you know, for the outside firms. Um, so there is a monitoring component to it, you know, as you, and then as you get up closer to settlement, you know, the funder is probably going to want to be apprised of what's happening, um, you know, and, and I can tell you from experience that, you know, we've had situations where, again, it's the relationship building. Here is another voice of, you know, people who are highly competent, you know, in this area, you know, almost all the funders are ex-attorneys, you know, who it's another set of eyes on your case. And so we had um, a situation where one of our counterparties was going into settlement discussions and they just wanted to run the number by us. And we said, we think it, that's too low, go higher. And they were able to get a much favorable, you know, and then I, we said, talk to your outside counsel about it, see what they think, you know? And so again, it's, it can also be a sounding board right, of, you know, another set of advisors if you need it. So that's kind of start to finish. I hope that, you know, gives you enough understanding of the process. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and just real quick, how, how, I mean, how long does that process take? Is this like weeks, months? Like, it, um, Generally, I mean, for a commercial dispute, you know, probably, yeah, I would say like a month is probably a good, you know, a you know, let's say it's a $2 million funding commercial dispute for things that, and it depends on how mature the case is, right? So if you're coming in early on, 
and this is going to be kind of like a licensing, you know, leading into litigation campaign, you're probably talking more, that's going to be more involved. You're talking months, right? But the funder wants to get to a point where they're going to be able to say no to you so that you can decide if you want to move on or find somebody else. Like, you know, a good funder will get to that point quickly for you. And they're going to do it in a way that, look, I don't want to ruin your chances later, you know, because remember my threshold for risk is going to be different sometimes than the company's threshold for risk, right? So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, I, I'm I'm cognizant of that, that, you know, you may be continuing anyway. You don't want the fact that a funder looked at your case and declined to fund it. Doesn't necessarily mean you won't win. It just might mean that the risk profile doesn't fit with the funder. So, um, so that's the other reason why they want to get to know quickly so that you're not, you know, especially if you're in that exclusivity period. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we're, we're running out of time here. So I've got a couple of fun questions, or at least they're fun in my view. Um, and, and maybe I'll ask this to Sylvia and Mike, because you guys are usually on opposite sides of the V. So I want to get your opinions on this. Um, so the question is, A, how do you judge patent quality? And B, do we have an issue with patent quality? And if so, how do we fix it? <laughs> Sylvia, you want to start? <laughs> Oh, that's a very difficult question. Oh, hey. <laughs> Agreed. On build. that, we agree. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on the build the portfolio side of the world, right? And Mike's on the leverage of the portfolio side of the world. And so we look at patents uh, at very different points in time, to say the least. Um, and also after lots of things have happened with a patent application or even with an idea. So for me, on the build side of the, of the equation, and, and we're not talking about these uh, litigation wise. Um, you know, what, you, what you're thinking about is what is the purpose of this asset, right? Is it to protect against copycats? Um, is it to try to branch out in a, in a research way in a new technology direction, right? And that will tell you how the claims go really, as well as the prior art and whatever happens through the patent offices, not only in one jurisdiction, but multiple jurisdictions. And so I think of it as uh, kind of like clothing. You know, we're trying to go for a, a one size fits all outfit. Well, that could be a super broad patent claim set that you start off with, but then uh, patent, patent prosecution happens and it's like one size fits most one size okay this is this is definitely a small it's not it's no longer a small medium large thing going on and then at one point you might have to completely change your paradigm and say okay this is a size six men have different sizing um women it's it's fascinating because it's size six from one manufacturer is completely different than a size six from another manufacturer right and that's really what patents are more like and then okay well it's size six with alteration and then you have to throw that all away and say, okay, this is going to be a, a bespoke, tailored patent, and this is what we got. And when we're going to tailor it exactly to this situation. Um, so you get a patent at the end of the day, it's not at all what you thought it was. Um, however, when you're leveraging it, if someone is exactly the same size as you, the exact same dimensions, boy, that patent is going to be worth a lot. It might be very valuable. On the other hand, if they're a lot taller, um, a, a, they're a male instead of a female, you know, I don't know what a size six turns into if you try to put a, a guy in it. Um, it might not work. It might be completely value less. Um, and so the, the interesting thing, and, and we're going to go right back to the beginning, is the feedback loop, right? Is if this portfolio was being built to be one size fits all, and it does not fit all at the end of the day, then you need that feedback loop because otherwise people are gonna to continue to try building portfolios that they think are one size fits all, but only fits models. On the other hand, if they're trying to build a bespoke, you know, this person, this vendor, this size, whatever, this weight, and the litigation team or the licensing teams tries to license it to somebody who doesn't fit that profile, um, then we need a feed forward loop. This is what it was designed for. I'm glad you tried to leverage it for this purpose, but I'm not really that disappointed that it didn't work. Right. I don't know, Mike, right. what, do, what do you got to add? Well, that's really well said and used in a way that I could never accomplish it. What I would say is I think we've 
the problem quality of patents rather there's uh we've lost the balance in the system we lost the balance in the system from prosecution through litigation through appeal and so there's a perception more than a reality in my view um about the quality of patents and, and the state of patents in the United States right now. I mean, I've no, spoken in a full day conference covering this subject, so it, it can go in, in many, many, in many different ways. Um, but my view is more about the imbalance in the system that's caused people to buy into certain narratives and view the patent system or the patents themselves to be more problem than they, problematic than they actually are. In other words, there's been an overcorrection over the last 15 years or so, but particularly with the AIA and um, that has allowed for an, an increase in whatever you want to call it, predatory infringement, efficient infringement, whatnot, that has created, frankly, opportunities for Lauren and, and created opportunities um, for others in the marketplace, but also extreme challenges for real innovators. So he did a rough like, but yep. we're going to get cut yeah, in that's five it. seconds. I'm I do want to thank the panel. This is a great panel. I appreciate everyone coming. Hopefully everyone got a lot out of this. And uh, thank you. We're going to talk about a number of points here that we hope all the rest of you find interesting. I wish we were here in person so we could feed off, you know, feedback from the audience. But we do look forward to seeing some questions, hopefully, in the Q&A. Um, we're going to look through the lens of no matter how big or small or what type of company you have, budget is always a consideration and there's there's just simply never enough money to do everything. And then we're also going to look a little bit about the pan pandemic and how that may have changed some of the things of the way that we do business and maybe even a look a little bit um, toward the future. So um, with that uh, segue, I used to work in radio, we're going to, I'm going to throw it to Sanjeev, who's going to start us off talking about a little bit about surviving the pandemic. Sanjeev. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Marie. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, you know, the, uh, the pandemic's been kind of an interesting uh, case uh, work-wise because uh, Dell has, from a, you know, the only time that I've been here and even well before, been very um, committed to the idea of uh, a distributed workforce and um, not just for itself, but as, as something that it, it wants to uh, help its clients bring to uh, uh, to life as well. Uh, so, you know, we were already used to a decent amount of, of remote working um, as, as a team. Um, and you know, particularly after 2016, when we merged with EMC and we got a bunch of uh, people in Massachusetts and other places where we didn't uh, have, have them before, um, you know, it's become very much the uh, uh, the normal um, in a way that uh, I think would have horrified um, my partners in uh, private practice um, back in you know the, the Stone Age, um, who were very much more in the uh, uh, you know butts in seats uh, uh, mode of uh, of legal practice. Uh, so you know we were well situated to handle that. It has been a challenge navigating some some changes, um, and particularly in terms of of uh, personnel uh, changes and, and bringing people in um, and so forth. And then um, as the environment shifted, you know, some of the things that our businesses were doing were shifted as well. Uh, a lot more social media marketing, for example, um, than we were doing before. Some products that may have been, um, you know, that were not slated to come out till later, come out earlier because they're more suited for remote working uh, and so forth. Um, so it's it's been a very interesting uh, um uh, change, but you know, we just uh, reported record-breaking quarterly results, so it's obviously doing uh, going very well for us in that sense. Good to hear. Yeah, you know, I'll just talk briefly um, that you know we didn't know what to expect. You know, we don't sell a product. Um, we have volunteers that go out and do things all around the world, and suddenly they couldn't be with, with other people. So we didn't really know how that was going to affect things. Um, but we have our regular company, and then we also have a charitable foundation. And we've actually done very well with fundraising um, over the past 18 months, um, exceeding expectations with our foundation. That money is very much needed because there's a, even more to be done worldwide. But we were very happy uh, to see that. Hey, Chris, could I uh, turn this to you a little bit? Um, you uh, looked through, I think you were going to talk a little bit about how you've been through, we've been through some recessions and other market challenges before and how this is going to sure. affect or not affect this point. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I, I was thinking back when we were working on this outline over all the different ways that 
I've had to adapt that most of us on this call or on this presentation have had to adapt depending on how long we've been practicing. And, you know, it's getting scary that I'm coming up on, on 25 years. That's not something I ever thought I'd, I'd say, <laughs> but, you know, I, I was at the patent and trademark office when they went through a reduction in force. They had a huge, massive hiring binge in the, in the late nineties. And I came in at the tail end of that. And then they had a reduction in force. And I, I, I was lucky to have avoided that. But, you know, I've seen the boom and bust cycle over and over. Then we had the dot-com bust, the financial meltdown. I was in-house for that. And though we weren't really affected, um, a lot of our customers were. I mean, we were an apparel company, but a lot of spending that, you know, might have gone to luxuries was cut back and that affected us greatly. And that affected how we practice law in the legal department. Um, you know, how do we on a budget? What do we keep? We as trademark attorneys know we're going to need this stuff in the future. But how do you convince that to a, a, a team that's slashing budgets? So I, you, you really just have to stop, slow down. You know, we're going to get through pandemic, but how do we, how do I now as a partner in a completely different role, help my clients weather this storm? It is going to come to an end, but what can we do to help them through this right now? Right. Some, some very uh, fair points. And Chris, I just want you to know, we're getting a little bit of breakup and reception with you. We've lost your picture and your okay. audio, um, but I, okay. I trust that you'll come back. I can hear you again, but I can no longer see you. Um, and my own system is now giving me trouble. So let me um, see if there's somebody else, either Michael or Monique or Megan, who might want to talk about this um, topic just briefly while I try to get the rest of myself signed back on. Um, yeah, this is technology is so great. Okay. Yeah. So, so, oh, go ahead, Megan. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'll just jump in and, you know, comment on it a little bit that, you know, Goodwill is, um, uh, we're made up of 156 organizations across America. So, um, you know, the pandemic, the interesting thing about it is, you know, Goodwill is very well known for its retail stores. And so there was a lot of impact to our retail stores being open um, during the pandemic, which, you know, with that loss of income, then had with it a loss of personnel. And, um, you know, the, the, interesting thing from Goodwill's perspective is it's also a time coming out of the pandemic when um, our services are most needed. You know, we, uh, our mission is to help those with disabilities and other disadvantaged uh, individuals get jobs or job training. And, um, you know, at a time during the pandemic, I mean, this is when a lot of our services are need, but we're also then battling the budget. And with that too, we've also found that you know, we're seeing a lot more fraud come up, um, a lot more use of our trademark that is, you know, being used inappropriately to try and get people to apply for jobs that are not um, goodwill jobs. So, so we're seeing this, you know, uptick of need and uptick of use of our brand or misuse of our brand and the need to protect it. But we're a dues-based organization, so we have the impact of the resources to be able to continue to provide that additional level of support. So. It's been a really um, interesting dynamic for the organization to to balance those needs, balance the the increased need for support of the mission and protection of the brand, but recognizing that you know our members who are you know funding the the work that we do at the national office, um, you know are impacted by their stores being closed and donations being made and that sort of thing. So you know, interesting um, um, dynamic for us there. Interesting. Thanks, Megan. Monique or Michael, do either of you have anything to add? Sure. I would just say that from my perspective, I'm coming at this a little bit differently in that I've been through maybe three different um, acquisitions and sales of the company, uh, of companies that I've been at over my career. And through each of those events, you sort of realize how important it is to have your IP assets as well as team actually put in a, in a strategically aligned so that they are we are working together with the business and that your resources are 
you know, in the are not too big, not too small, but really speak to, you know, the the adaptability and and the needs of the business as well. So, I think that it's that we were positioned well at you know it, 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 to go through a pandemic where we knew that we were going to have to, you know, tighten the belts a little bit and be able to pull back. Um, but then because we would sort of gone through the exercise of what's most important to us, it enabled us to really be nimble and know where we could spend money and where we where we wouldn't be able to. Thank you. Michael, do you have anything on this topic? Well, sure. I, uh, I'll say a couple of things. First of all, um, I guess the pandemic has, uh, you know, really uh, instilled in us the uh, idea that we, we always have to be resilient. It's the importance of resilience, and I think um, always it's it's a it's a recognition that we are uh, it's important to be able to evolve uh, our practice and how we do things. And I think here at Mattel, you know, we're a people culture. Um, you know, we're a meeting culture. You know, we love to present to each other in person, and we're creating toys uh, which really require, you know, designers to be together. You know, you know, handle the products. It's a tactile type of design. Um, you know, you, you can imagine. So, you know, the, um, you know, when we left the offices back in uh, Friday the thirteenth, uh, March, uh, Fri Friday March thirteenth, twenty twenty, right. Um, and by the way, how do I know that? Because I'm back in my office now. I came back in and it was like a time capsule. I had, I had all the emails I printed out that day, Friday, March 13th. You know, all my notes and all that. So it was, it was, uh, it was sort of funny. I took some pictures just to see. But, um, but look, I mean, we adapted, right? And we were, became resilient. And I think the, um, you know, what my team always thought, my IP team always thought is that we could kind of, we didn't really have to be in the office necessarily. And then we were able to prove that that was true, right? We, and we recognized, you know, we were over-reliant probably on paper um, and uh, that we were doing more things now electronically. Um, and we were able to meet with each other in a way that, uh, that still worked, uh, still worked for us. And then in terms of, you know, evolving, you know, we, you know, no question the pandemic um, increased the importance of online sales. Now more, you know, than 33% of Mattel's revenues now come from online sources. And that's increasing where we are where we thought we'd be five years from now. And that's just accelerating, accelerating even today as, as more and more parents needed toys to be able to distract their kids while they were home and also um, you know, more and more uh, grandparents just got used to, uh, people who were purchasing online, for example, got used to buying. So we, we, you know, the importance of our online IP protection program just became paramount. Um, uh, and um, and that's, that's, that's much different. So, so those are some of the ways that we, we, we've changed. When we got back to the office, you know, we looked at all these piles of paper we had around that we hadn't seen for over a year. And I thought, why do we need this? You know, and now we're starting to scan things and get and really become a more digital office. And so that, you know, that no doubt will save us money in terms of printing, ink, paper, time, um, and filing and storage costs. And so that's how, that's kind of how um, the pandemic has affected our, our practice over here in our business. Thank you, Michael. I think, you know, all of you made some excellent points. The, the fact that we always thought we could, we didn't really need to be in the office and suddenly we, we've now proved it. I think that's an excellent point because, you know, every company is different, especially up at the C-suite and everybody has different views on whether they want the workforce here or whether they don't care if you're working from anywhere. And I think now the ability to say, we, we can work from anywhere, it's hard to refute that. We've done it for 18 months. So I think it, it changes a lot of things. I can tell you that um, I'm a little paper intensive um, and we've gotten away from a lot of that. We still do some things paper, but we do more and more and more just that. We just, as it takes time though, to get things scanned in and then to drop them into the database. And I mean, that takes time too. So sometimes it's actually just faster to continue with what you've been doing. Cause I, I got nervous at one point that we were getting too far ahead of ourselves trying to convert and yet we weren't really caught up doing it. So I was kind of unwilling to move forward until we caught up with where we were. So um, it's a work in progress. 
uh, but I think we all see that it's possible. We're going to turn now to a little bit, or everybody can talk just a little bit about the business model of their company and then kind of merge into um, a brand model discussion. And I'd like to start with you, Megan, because I feel like you've already started that discussion with your company. In fact, so I don't even know how much you have to add, but I think that you have something. I think that you have something. I'm getting an echo. Um, but anyway, Megan, anyway, I'll, I'll start with you because you did kick this up. Is, are other people hearing me twice or is that just me? I, I hear you a little bit twice. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see what happens when Megan starts to talk and we'll know if it's just me. <laughs> Thank you, Joe Marie. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just to kind of reiterate, you know, um, Goodwill has a, we, we have what's called a federated model. So um, I work in the national office, uh, Goodwill Industries International. And then we have, um, like I mentioned, 156 autonomous Goodwill organizations throughout North America. So that's the U.S. and Canada. We also have um, license agreements with um, other Goodwill organizations in 13 other countries. So um, one of our biggest um, responsibilities in the national office is to, we own the trademarks, um, we own the brand, we, we're tasked with protecting them. Um, and, you know, we really focus on, you know, kind of looking at um, the brand model of it, you know, not only making sure that we are creating a family of marks that, you know, one is, is strong. You know, we, we receive arguments regularly that goodwill is a generic term and can't be trademarked. But in fact, we do own the trademark for goodwill um, in a number of different uh, classes for goods and services. And, you know, we work really hard to protect that. And we do that to the benefit of all of our members to make sure that they continue to be able to use the mark to carry on the mission of goodwill. Um, so, you know, we have, uh, you know, a relatively small um, family of marks and we, we did that intentionally. We really, um, and I know we'll get into this later, but, you know, really just trying to make sure that we have a strong, small group of goodwill formative marks um, that we protect and uh, we license then those to our members and to uh, the organizations in other countries. So, um, that's really it. It's it's somewhat of a, a complicated structure when you get into the details, but from the trademark side, it's pretty straightforward. We we have our members, we're a member organization. They pay dues. Those dues help support the services that they receive for us, which includes largely the protection of the brand. Thank you, Megan. Uh, I don't know. Who, would somebody else like to go next? Otherwise, I can just I'll go in order of what's on my screen. Um, but Monique, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, so my company is NBC Universal, and we do a lot of different things. You are probably most familiar with NBC Universal for our Universal Pictures division, uh, as well as our Illumination group, which does fun things like Despicable Me. And uh, Thing 2, which is coming out later this year, we also have all of our uh, television channels, such as NBC, Telemundo, um, USA, Sci-Fi, Bravo, plus international channels, Universal Channel being among them. And we also have our theme parks, um, which are around the world. And my team supports all of our businesses worldwide. We also have a streaming service called Peacock um, that we managed to launch during the pandemic. So we were very busy over the course of the pandemic. Uh, and we do a little bit of everything. That's the fun part about the business is that, um, you know, whether or not it's supporting our uh, studio where we are opening new restaurants and creating stages that have special lights that I didn't even know there were such things or helping launch a new streaming service. And um, we do a little bit of everything. So my team is a central resource and we support each of those different lines of business. Um, across all of their IP needs. So whether or not it is um, on the trademark side, on the prosecution side, clearance, uh, we do all of that. I think we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about that um, later, but that's a little bit about NBC Universal and how we are structured. Thank you, Monique. How about you, Michael? Well, thank you, uh, Joe Marie. Well, look, we, I'm at Mattel, and we are um, one of the world's leading 
toy companies, you might think of us that way. Uh, we are expanding uh, our brands, of which, of which we have many uh, you're familiar with, no doubt, Barbie Hot Wheels, Fisher Price, American Girl, you know, Matchbox, um, and many, many others. Thomas, uh, we're expanding all of our brands. Uh, you're really into entertainment spaces now, into live events, and really um, trying to uh, tap into the potential of our IP. And, you know, when I got here 20 years ago, it's amazing I've been here 20 years, um, that uh, we were just a toy company, really. And, you know, just a couple of years ago, we had a, a CEO who joined and he, uh, his mantra has been, and you, you'll hear him uh, say this publicly, that we are an IP driven company. And, and so often when I give my, uh, you know, new hire orientation uh, presentations about IP, you know, I, uh, you know, I say, to, I say to the new hires, you thought you joined a toy company, really you joined an intellectual property all the things that we're doing here with, with it. So so we are doing a lot of things. You'll see Barbie uh, out in the movies in a year or so. Uh, we have a live movie coming out with Margot Robbie as, as Barbie. It'll be quite interesting. We have a couple of great directors uh, and writers on that. Um, and, um, you know, we're doing, we're partnering with some of the studios like uh, NBC Universal, for example, to take some of our other IP. I'll just give it, I'll throw one out there, Magic 8-Ball will be a movie about that uh, coming out. You know, we're really discovering, um, and, and we have a lot of writers who are tapping into the uh, magic of the brands from uh, our childhoods. Um, and uh, it's, it's, gonna be, uh, it's gonna be very fun. So, so um, you know, my particular, my team deals with everything trademark, copyright, trade secret, domain name, um, and you know, IP due diligence, uh, all of that. So we, we're really uh, doing almost everything. There is a patent lawyer who I want to, I, I thankfully leave out the patents to him. Although of course we have to coordinate on a lot of things. So we're coordinating closely with the patent side. And we're also, um, my team's involved in anti-counterfeiting and um, running, uh, you know, organizing raids and, and, and things of that nature. So we are sort of a, one-stop shop for everything IP, which kind of which kind of makes it nice uh, for me because you have a whole picture, you you know what's going on constantly, and you're managing your team. I think it resources effectively across many many large brands. So we're a house of brands, I would Got say. It. Got it. Thank you, Michael. You may have noticed uh, that Chris Turk has dropped off. That's just temporary. He's having some issues being able to hear his audio and periodically his image freezes. So he's hoping that he can correct that by logging off and logging on. If not, I'm going to call out um, Adam and or Audrey. We're having trouble reaching you. If, if he has additional trouble, maybe you could help. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it to you, Sanjeev. Uh, thanks. So, you know, a lot of people think, uh, hear Dell and they think a computer company and and that's entirely understandable I mean that's the uh, that's the origin story right so the the, uh, the, the um, college kid building uh, computers in his dorm room and um, th then going on to become one of the youngest then one of the youngest uh, fortune 500 CEOs um, you know it's one of those real uh, uh, American success stories that, that people uh, like to talk about but I think calling us a computer company is is really very uh, limiting um, in the sense that it's a, fr a portion of what we do. Uh, what we really see ourselves as is a, a company that's um, developing the technologies to, to drive human progress and uh, to, to bring those technologies to bear on the digital transformation of our uh, society uh, from, the, uh, from the cloud uh, to the edge. Uh, so, you know, if you think, um, you know, within my within my lifetime, and I'm a, I like to think I'm not that old. You know, you go from where a, a company maybe needs one computer to to do the books and uh, um, uh, you know maybe create some uh, ad content uh, to where a, any kind of business starting up today needs a, a much larger infrastructure uh, in terms of IT to to just get started. Um, and that's just the way things are are going right now. The amount of of IT we're consuming. Uh, is is just risen um, exponentially. And you can see these charts of you know how many um, how much data is growing and and uh, um, computing uh, power is being 
uh, deployed, you know, and, and things that uh, quantities that were kind of theoretical numbers uh, when I was in, in high school and college, uh, like gigabytes and terabytes and petabytes are, you know, common uh, uh, common currency. And the thing we used to save all of our, our uh, papers on in, in college is now something that my uh, child knows as the save icon, having never actually encountered the, the particular storage device that is represented by that, uh, by that picture. Uh, and that's where, where, where we sit. You know, we're, we are a uh, cloud to edge IT solutions company uh, operating both in, in uh, things you can touch, uh, the, uh, the uh, physical products, but also in the uh, services space and cloud space. And one of the things we're very excited about is uh, our new uh, Apex uh, IT as a service uh, offering, um, which is designed to be a scalable IT deployments um, that can adjust to the business uh, needs and really uh, you know, grow and or collapse as as the business uh, businesses needs might change uh, in terms of how much compute storage networking um, is, is being utilized and you know that's kind of the model that, that things uh, seem to be going towards uh, so unlike Mattel we are very much a um, uh, branded house model, not a house of brands model, meaning we really try to key things off of a small uh, cohort of, of core brands. Uh, you know, I hear the, uh, the the phrase around here periodically, one throat to choke. Um, and from the customer's perspective, uh, that's what they that's what they want um, when they uh, when, when they have an issue. They want one throat to choke, um, and and we're. Uh, we're going to be that throat, um, and or we 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 know we are going to be that throat. So we we um, uh, try to tailor our conduct accordingly. Uh, so you know we do have very valuable trademarks, and you know we have a, a substantial portfolio. Um, but we you know we're would really try to key everything to the core brands, um, so that there's that one unifying value proposition. And then a lot of our trademark um, strategies flow downstream from that. Um, uh, our team is, and legal is responsible for the maintenance of the portfolio, a trademark portfolio for um, the domain name portfolio. Uh, but there are a number of things that happen with trademarks that, that you know, we're not involved in day to day. For example, all, all of our suppliers have you know, permissions to use our, our trademarks to build out uh, the, the products they're offering for us. Uh, you know, those agreements were, were made some time ago by my predecessors and you know, we don't get involved much in the day to day of that. Um, and then there are things that, that are sort of adjacent, like fraud, um, security fraud, support fraud, warranty fraud, uh, sometimes that come in as, as trademark issues and we cooperate with our security and fraud teams uh, on, those, uh, on those matters. Um, so uh, it's a very collaborative uh, practice with those, uh, those, those groups and, uh, um, and it's been fun. You know, I've been here for 10 years. It's one of the best jobs I've had. How nice. That's so refreshing to hear. Thanks, Sanji. Um, Chris is still having a little trouble signing back on. So I'll just talk briefly about my own company. And if he doesn't come on in another minute or two, we're just going to move ahead um, on the outline. So uh, I, as mentioned, I work for Rotary International, which is the Worldwide Association of Member Rotary Clubs. Um, we have Rotary International. We also have the Rotary Foundation, which is our charitable arm. We have um, 35,000 or 40,000, depending on how you count them, uh, member clubs. We're in 200 countries and territories, uh, and we've been around since 1905. Um, we handle, the Rotary International owns the IP on behalf of all of the membership and the foundation. Everything is owned by Rotary International. We administer all of the um, protection, policing protection enforcement uh, plan from our home offices, which are here in Evanston, just outside Chicago, Illinois. It's our world headquarters. Um, and then we do have nine, eight or nine, again, depending on how you count them, international offices around the world. And we do get uh, support from teams in each of those offices and working with our membership to help to um, apply and implement uh, guidelines for use of the mark as are implemented by our board of directors with, um, as advised, hopefully by my team um, and we also have a team in india that uh, helps us with some local licensing things and the rest of the licensing is run mainly from um, our offices here um, so there's there's a team of us licensing reports directly with to the intellectual property team uh, we 
as I said, we, we do all these things with the marks. We also run the domain name portfolio. We'd rather not, but nobody else wants it. Um, <laughs> this is this. And we know that even if we, at this point, we know that even if we were to successfully lobby for it to be moved, um, perhaps to IT or somewhere, uh, they wouldn't, we think, place the same emphasis on the need for the level of protection that we think is needed in order to support the trademark protection program. And so we've kept it because we feel that it, they one feeds the other and it just makes a little bit more sense. We do go to them for issues from time to time and they're very helpful, but um, we, we run it because nobody else wants it. Um, we work really closely with our um, communications team, our public relations team, some of our other teams, um, but protection of the marks is definitely a function um, here of legal. We are, I don't know, I feel like I have to pick one of these labels. Um, we are, we're, you know, Rotary is our main brand. And so, you know, I heard Megan talk a little bit about protecting the goodwill mark. Well, Rotary, you know, it's a dictionary word and we can't protect it very well for vehicles in class seven. But we are really strong if you want to use it about membership clubs, um, philanthropic activity associations, things like that. Um, so we face some similar challenges where it's not like it's a coined mark, but we do have use since 1905 and from the early 1900s in, in most other countries. And there's Chris, hello, welcome back. Um, and so uh, for the most part, we, are, we can be pretty strong in our classes, in our area, and then there's just areas where we just simply don't have, um, we just don't have exclusive rights. Um, so, Jim, I just have to, I just have to mention that, you know, we also have universal, it's not, good. could not be <laughs> easy to do, but, but we are all entrusted with, you know, having to try to do it. <laughs> right. And I think every company has a challenge like that. You know, certainly when we re tried to register Rotary International, the first thing we're asked to disclaim is international. Same thing with Rotary Club, we're always asked to disclaim club, but we don't want to ever disclaim Rotary because that's our only really... <laughs> big part and so we're able to overcome that and um i'm happy to say we probably wouldn't be able to in, in other classes but you know we don't use it to mean rotate so if we're using it in a generic sense for some piece of machinery that rotates i think we'd have a lot less uh, success but we're not using it for that it was originally adopted because back in 1905 the meetings rotated between the offices of the different members and that's where rotary club came from but today that's not what it's used for and no one's that interested in more of the rotary history or uh, i promise not to take more of your time oh chris we've just lost you again i was just about to go to you um, so I don't know if somebody on the technical end can maybe give Chris a little bit of help, but he's now off again. Um, Adam, I believe you have Chris's cell number, so I'm hoping somebody can reach out to Chris and maybe we can get a little help. But in the meantime, um, we're just going to move forward. Um, and so one of the things we talked about, I mean, this is supposed to be about brand versus budget. So nobody ever has enough budget. I work for a nonprofit. It's a big nonprofit, but it's still a nonprofit. It doesn't matter, big or small, for-profit, nonprofit. There's never enough money to do your wish list. And so you have to prioritize things. So Sanjeev, I think you were going to lead us off. We're going to start talking about, and there's, and there's some related topics that may get, we may not go in order. They may, we may just sort of talk about them in a blended way, but we're going to start with, you know, to register or not to register. How do you look at that? So, um, as I said in my, my earlier comments, that uh, a lot is, sits downstream from how you you um, you brand and and the, the the naming strategy. And if you're you're following more of the branded house type of of model, uh, you proliferate a, f a fairly small number of of uh, core uh, core brands. And really, if you're doing it, you know, strictly as a a, a branded house, you may just have the one master brand. Um, that is your your focus, and everything that comes after it is is communicating to the the uh, customer what it is that they're they're buying in sort of a clear, understandable, descriptive, and unprotectable way. Um, so that can can be one way to um, to manage your um, your registration decisions, um, because the, for the things you file, you can file them in a more limited way, but you also have a little more limited number of things that that you are filing. Um, you know, but it but it involves uh, everybody kind of following the the uh, uh, the plan, and that can and that plan obviously can can uh, change over uh, over time. Uh, you know, so I you know we try to encourage people to create things that don't require us to go through the registration process and at a business level. 
but when we you know have something that we think may be valuable that maybe there's there's some room to assert some exclusivity in then we start you know looking at we, where are the where are the, the key markets where the the where's our our money coming from and really f key first on those um and then you know uh, move outward uh from uh from that uh you know you can't file everywhere at at once it's just not uh, it's just not practical but you can uh, sort of break up the world into different um, hierarchies of of uh, countries and and decide okay this is the kind of thing that merits you know a level one uh, search versus a level uh, two depending on you, you know how many how extensive the use is how uh, long it's going to last and um, and also the the uh, um, honestly the the uh, risks of or the costs of, of having to do a course correction if that becomes necessary as well. Um, so it, there's a lot that goes uh, that goes into it, um, but you know you really do want to to have a, a good knowledge and good dialogue of, with your your business clients as to where they need the protection because that's where they're going to market and uh, and keeping that that uh, dialogue uh, constant. And you know maybe. You'll you'll find yourself in a situation where you know maybe there's some corner of the world that you uh, you, you you missed, and that's kind of the risks of the um, uh, 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 of the game. And um, you, know, you sometimes will hit those, but hopefully it'll be you know, fairly fairly rare and in fairly peripheral uh, areas. Thank you, Sanjeev. I mean, I think for all of us, you know, it, it's a it's there's no one answer, and it's it's a complex thing and it's probably, and I know for me it is, it's it's fluid. And I think some of it is, you know, being aware enough um, to be able to anticipate what's coming and to make sure you try to put money in the budget and then leave enough room for flexibility for all the things you just never anticipated that are going to come up. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to react in the right way um, when you can. I want people to know that Chris now says that Remo has totally frozen his computer. Absolutely nothing is working. So I would again in encourage Adam or Audrey or someone on the tech side to please try to reach out and maybe help Chris a little bit. I've asked him to keep trying. But in the meantime, we're just going to valiantly move forward without him. <laughs> Look, here, there he is again. <laughs> and hi, Chris. Hi. Um, Chris, do you want to talk before we lose you? I'm going to go to you really briefly, just quickly rather, in case we lose you again. Um, if, you, if you have anything to add about either the um, business model slash brand model, I know that doesn't apply to you so much at your current position, but perhaps from before. And then we've already moved on to to register or not to register. And I, I feel mm -hmm. like if you have anything to say on those, we're going to go to you in, just in case we lose you again. Sure. With, with respect to the, the brand model, uh, I, I've worked in, in various different uh, models or, or matrix, matrixes, uh, matrices before. And as I mentioned on our last two discussions when we were preparing for this, thankfully, I, I never really had an issue uh, with budget. Sure, budgets were tight, and at times we didn't have the money to do everything we wanted. But uh, I was able to... Um, always do what needed to be done uh, because we had a dedicated IP budget within the legal department that was funded by the various brands that we owned. Um, and so even when times were tight and we were cutting headcount, et cetera, uh, we still had the money to do what we needed to do in terms of protecting the intellectual property. And I, I feel that has served me well now uh, at a law firm because I'm dealing with literally every kind of model there is. Um, service providers such as you and, and Megan, you know, with Goodwill and, and Rotary to, uh, and I don't mean, this is not a, a, a slight or a negative, but to a one brand company like Sanji, like Dell. I know there are other brands, but it's yeah, primarily yeah. one. To versus, versus Michael, which is more akin to where I used to work, VF Corporation, where we have dozens or hundreds of brands. And so I represent everybody now, including solo entrepreneurs to Fortune 500 companies. And so just, well, so it, it's been a great benefit seeing 
uh, today, all, all the different models uh, has been invaluable in, in navigating the pandemic um, for everybody, it's, but, but especially for me in my practice. And I, I, I apologize for rambling. I'm still trying to get caught up. A, as to register or not to register, I, I was always a firm believer in uh, registering. Um, at least if you are using it as a trademark, a, a quick adverti advertising campaign, perhaps not. Um, but now dealing with a more diverse group of clients, um, sometimes there are benefits to not registering. Um, and I won't go too deep into that, but some clients simply don't have the money. They just want to be sure that they can use something without having the risk of me or, or Sanjeev or Michael or you or Megan or Monique sending a cease and desist letter. And that's all they really need is some reassurance. And and so in, in that case, you know, there there may be a benefit to, to clearing but not registering. Um, so anyway, I hope that helps. It does, Chris. And, you know, before I turn to the rest of you, because we want all your perspectives, but this is something to think about as well as we're talking about this topic is I've heard a number of discussions um, recently where there seems to be a trend away from registration, not for everything, not for old venerable brands that are going to be around for a long time, um, but for a lot of the new things that maybe popped up during the pandemic that just aren't simply going to be around for that long, that the model of getting a registration, which could take a year or two, and then renewing it in 10 years. People aren't looking at 10 year increments anymore. They're gonna be long done with that before 10 years comes around. They're gonna be on to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And so the model that has always mm -hmm. served us of registering and then renewing every 10 years and having a brand that's gonna last for a hundred years, that's not necessarily the trend for companies in the future. And so that is affecting things as well. And if, it, if that starts to take hold with any kind of volume, then Trademark offices around the world, including the one here in the U.S., may need to do some reevaluations of their fee model um, in order to um, survive. I know that um, a number of the trademark offices rely on the the application fee, but even more on the renewal fees. Like some offices don't really make money on the application; they really make money on the renewals. If people aren't going to be renewing, if they're just going to apply and then let it go, I mean, that's something to consider for the future as well. And so that's just something to keep in mind, maybe um, as we continue the discussion. So I've kind of lost track where we are on the register, not register, because I was very anxious to get Chris in in case we lost him again. So please, whoever hasn't addressed this topic yet, please feel free to jump in. I think that's Monique and Michael, but I can't remember. And, yeah. Oh, and Megan. Sorry. Yes. Here you are. You're right next to me. On you, you want to go ahead? Oh, well, I, I mean, I'd love to jump in and just, you know, kind of what, what Chris was saying and, and Joe Marie too, you know, this idea of, you know, clearing it to use it versus clearing to register. And, and you know, we run into that um, regularly with Goodwill. You know, we have a, an extremely creative marketing department, but we also have 156 members who, most of which also have very extreme, uh, creative marketing departments. And, you know, there there's the first thing that you know the discussion that we always engage in is you know what is what is the intent behind this you know how long is this going to be around how long are we going to be using it how many is it going to affect the network as a whole or is this just for one or two member organizations and um you know we as part of our licensing agreement we don't allow our members to register their own trademarks so they you know are coming to us to say can we use this can we register it? Everybody wants to register, but we're, we, we really limit that decision on whether to register or not to, is it a trademark that one is gonna be around long enough for us to spend the money and spend the time to register it, to maintain it, to make sure that we can, um, we're continuing to use it and monitor it. Um, but then also really, is it benefiting a majority of the network? Because if it's not, then again, our role as the national office is to continue to make sure that we're doing what we can to benefit the brand as a whole and benefit all of the members, not just one or two of them that might um, have a really great you know, campaign idea, 
but uh, isn't going to be something that we're gonna do long-term and to benefit everybody. So, you know, we kind of really tackle those two subjects together of the idea of to, to clear it, to use it, um, clear it, to register it. And what does that mean from, you know, Joe Marie, I think you made this comment, you know, we can, we can certainly plan for the, the maintenance and, and the fees that go along. We can budget for those of what we know but if we're constantly looking at, okay, are we adding more and more and we can't foresee what those are, you know, that has a huge impact to our budget. And, and our, um, our, for Goodwill Industries International, you know, our um, trademark budget is just part of our legal budget. So, you know, we don't have a wholly separate um, budget to cover these costs. We, we're all folded into one. And so it, it definitely is a, um, a really good conversation that we have to have with with not only our membership but with the marketing departments as well to really figure out where does it make sense um, and in what classes you know what goods and services are really going to be going to be impacted by this and then perhaps what we don't need to renew and, what we don't need to keep going forward and that's always the hardest thing is to call the portfolio um, yep. I'm, I'm not good at that um, yeah, especially, always, yeah, especially when you have marks that are, you know, 50, 75, 100 years old, like we do have some that are established marks. And then the question is, are we still using them? Are we going to, should we continue right. to use them? Um, so yeah, constant, constant discussion. Right. And, you know, so we've sort of blended these topics together to register or not to register with, um, to clear or not to clear. And they're, they're really, they're so interrelated. So I'm just going to say, you know, to clear or not to clear, when we're lucky enough to get the opportunity to clear first <laughs> before they start using something. I'd like to say that that happens 100% of the time, but um, it happens, I wanna say that with a great substantial amount of the time, but I can't say it happens 100% of the time. And then we're pulled in when it's like, what happened here? Why didn't we know about this? And, and I know we're not the only ones. Um, I like to think, oh, that something failed somewhere. Everyone else must be doing this better. And then the more people I talk to, there's always, there's always cracks and failures. And if you're not given the opportunity to clear something, then you know there you are scrambling to do whatever you need to do if it's already in use to try and get rights or perfect rights um, that maybe you wouldn't have been advised to go that direction if they had come to you earlier. And I'm happy to say that is not that it's the exception, but it totally happens. Um, so with that, um, Michael. You want to you want to add your point of view? Sure, I'll jump in here. Sure, let me let me give you the Mattel context for this, really. So, you know, as we talked about, Mattel is a house of brands, mm -hmm. not a brand house. I'm so jealous of Dell and Lego that only have one brand to worry about. It seems, you know. Um, I um, uh, sorry, sorry, I was just giving a call. Um, but uh, but look, we, we have to consider you know, what our evergreen brands are, what's going to be around, you know, and then uh, the other context is, is that, you know, you know, we have all these brands and we have what we call a, a ton of SKUs out there, like products that also have maybe sub brands and then secondary brands, tertiary brands, product names. Um, and what do you register there? What's going to be driving revenue? What's going to be TV advertised, all of that. And, um, and then often, you know, a toy may be out just for a season, a SKU, uh, and a successful SKU may last maybe a year or two. And so then why would you register if you're not even going to get a trademark registration in a little while? So, and, and I'll say a couple of things. So when I got here 20 years ago, I remember, you know, we, we looked at the Barbie uh, portfolio, just where Barbie was registered, and we had holes all over the world, right? In fact, there were some countries where Barbie wasn't even registered in class 28 for the toy category right so you know we'll get into this a little bit more but we had to get budget to do that right and and so we did that um and um and so th that's obvious and then we go we go through that type of uh, discussion with you know senior leaders here like where where can we spend what's mo what's the most important you know I, I heard this a couple of different ways from a couple of different people already but when we're going through do we register or not? We all, you know, we often do. We, we kind of blend into the clear. This is a blend of the, into the clearance part of this, but it's, hey, do you really do you want to use the name only, or do you or do you want to own it? There's two. I always tell my clients, my team tells their clients, there's two questions here really, when we're giving you the advice on the results. Do you want to use it? Then do you want to own it? 
there's it's possible that you can you can use it but not own but not own it <laughs> and um and so but the first question is is can you use it and how how badly would you feel if a competitor were to use the same language how badly would you feel now especially because of the pandemic that you know we need trademark registrations just about we you know they're almost a necessity to deal with online ip enforcement issues so that kind of changes the equation a little bit about whether you want to register how much is that particular brand that name driving your revenue so so those are the kind of questions we deal with at the top yeah it's a, it's an interesting balance monique I will just add on to Michael's. I think that NBC Universal, we are similar in that we have so many different brands. Um, every title of every television series that we do is a brand. Main characters, set pieces are all brands. We also have a robust uh, merchandising program. So all of those things that Michael was just talking about, we do them also. So we um, get involved in all of the different products uh, for every season, for every single one of our lines. So whether or not, you know, um, to Despicable Me, which is bigger, Trolls, that's a large one, um, versus, you know, a Chili Willy or, you know, something smaller. Saturday Night Live even is considered one of our smaller brands. Um, we have to consider all of those as brands. And so when we're talking about thinking our, about our registration or even our clearance, we really have to think about buckets. And buckets, you know, just like Michael was talking about whether or not they want to own them or not. But then I think the other aspect is that we are a global company. So just our, our consumer products offices, uh, you know, are, are scattered, you know, all over the world. So each of those offices have their own concerns about, you know, whether or not you have protection in Japanese uh, for Japan for every single mark that you have in your portfolio. Clearly, the answer cannot be, yes, I have coverage for everything, everywhere, every time, for every brand that's being that's being created. So there definitely has to be a conversation about prioritization, risk concerns, timing, all of those go into the to the conversation because you will find that you will not be able to to have the money to do everything that you want to do, even on the clearance and registration front, let alone the enforcement side, because that also falls under myself as well and all of our anti counterfeiting. So we have to have that same bucket of money that's available for both sides. And so you just have to find that right balance of how you're going to use those funds. Well heard. And I know that our audience, um, the, the registrants today are, are probably fairly advanced. So we, we're not, we're not going to cover some of the basics, but you know, one of the things that popped into my mind when Michael especially was talking about, you know, you go back and you do a review and you see where do you have coverage and what are their holes. You know, a lot of those countries, Michael, I'm guessing, where you didn't have the class 28 registration are not necessarily use-based use countries. They may be, you know, first to file countries. And so it becomes even more important. So maybe the lesson here is do a periodic review of your trademark portfolio. Um, but I did think of that as, as it came to mind. Um, does if does anyone? You know, I don't see any questions in the um, Q and A. So um, does anyone else have anything on this topic? Otherwise, I think we'll move uh, on in our outline. All right. So next, um, we thought we would talk a little bit about returns on investment (ROIs). Um, why measure? What to measure? How to promote? And then we're kind of going to tie that in a little bit with um, benchmarking. So I think um, Monique, I think you were going to start us off with that. You had some interesting things that we talked about in one of our prep calls. Sure. Um, I think as we were talking about ROI, we were also talking about you know what, how do we do that? What is it useful? And you know concerns that we should be thinking about as we're think, as we're considering how to bench how how what to measure, and certainly for us it was a question of how, how, in addition to our day jobs, how do you, what's the kind of data that you need? What are the metrics that you're going to need in order to demonstrate that one, you might need more money or two, you might need more headcount or three, you know, you're, you're just, you know, where, where is everything? So certainly one of the things that we had to consider is do you use internal resources to do this or do you use external resources to do this? And for example, we turned to external docketing software that had the ability for us to be able to 
uh, to be able to identify how many clearances have we done you know, at a given time, how many applications have we filed, how many renewals are we, are we filing, so that we actually have some ability to, to quantify that, as opposed to, you know, we also were looking at, you know, on our enforcement front, working with a vendor to do online monitoring. That also will produce results. So you'll be able to see how many takedowns that you're doing at any at any time. But I think one of the one of the concerns is that if you're doing your takedown successfully, does that mean your takedown number should go up or down? And uh, and as we were talking about, technically, if you're doing your job, they should go down. But the reality of that is not quite the case. There will always be more out there. So is that the kind of data that you're actually looking for? And um, and so just having the data isn't necessarily going to be enough. Thank you, Monique. And I think, Chris, you had some specific thoughts on this subject, especially dealing with um, realism. Yes. Um, it's important to be honest, both with yourself, but also with your brand and your and your company's management um, as to how you are quantifying the value of what we are doing. Uh, how many takedowns, sure, it's easy enough to measure how many takedowns you're doing. And, you know, so I remember talking to, um, you know, an outside company that was doing takedowns for the English Premier League, which is now, you know, being streamed here in the US by NBC Universal. Um, and, you know, they, they were attempting to put a value on it. Uh, we were attempting to do something similar in terms of how do you value a, a takedown for a product uh, on eBay or Amazon, whether it's counterfeit or gray market. And, you know, sometimes uh, you'll see a listing for, you know, a gross, you know, 12 dozen counterfeit jackets or, or pairs of Nikes or, or Timberland boots, whatever. And you take it down, but then it pops right back up again. And you take it down and it pops right back up again. And so we were getting numbers from our outside company that were, we've taken down a million counterfeit listings for jackets. We're saving you hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's not really the case. And you don't have credibility when you take that to your company's management and say, you know, we stopped the sale of this many counterfeit jackets because they were just being reposted. And so it's important to whatever metrics you use, it's important that you be able to back them up. Um, and, you know, re related to say streaming, I learned a lot from a gentleman, I don't recall uh, who it was, um, but he was in the digital piracy team at at, um, at Adobe, and and his view was, you know, some people that are stealing your software are never going to pay for it. But those that are, that's the ones you want to capture, and that's the ones you want to be able to convert uh, with your anti counterfeiting program, your anti screening, your anti piracy program. And so it's important, in my view, that. Uh, if you want to keep your budget, if you want to grow your budget, if you want to um, have credibility with your management team, that you be realistic in the numbers that you're quoting. Thanks, Chris. That's really helpful. Um, I don't know if any if the, any of the rest of you have um, things you'd like to contribute to this topic, either um, from your own perspective or to react to some of the things that Monique or Chris said. Um, I know we had some vibrant discussion on this earlier. Um, we have half an hour left and a bunch of topics left to cover. So um, if you have something to add to this topic, I encourage you to do so. Um, but if not, I'll, I'll move on. I, I guess I'll just have one, one, a uh, couple quick, quick points. Um, uh, when when it comes to the um, uh, the online enforcement, I think, I think educating your 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 leadership and and business about what what is involved and and um, you know that yes, and not, should the numbers be going down? I mean, ideally, but we all know it's the reality uh, we're in. It's it's uh, it's it's gardening. It's uh, it's weed control. It's not. Um, 
something like yeah, that. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, it's it the the, the lawn is is great now, but it, you have to to keep uh, to keep at it. Um, and I, I think what can help, uh, in addition to the, the 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 numbers, which you know somebody could poke behind it and say, well, you haven't really stopped our counterfeiting problem. Um, just my response says, well, you haven't stopped making products either. So it's, <laughs> they kind of go together. Um, but also having some good some good. Uh, anecdote stories to, to, to pull out that you can really highlight for your management when you're presenting these things. You know, we had a, a case recently where we got a, um, a counterfeiting uh, victory in uh, uh, a Chinese uh, civil case where they doubled, the appeals court doubled the damage award um, that the district uh, court awarded. Well, that's a great result. Is it, you know, you know huge amount of money in the, the scheme, you know, the, the perspective of a $50 billion company, you know, maybe it's not a huge amount of money, but it's still, it's a great story to, to tell about that you are, you're doing the, this, this kind of work and pursuing and bringing the bad guys to something uh, approaching justice. Um, so I think that's, um, that's important. And you do want to, uh, on, on the, the uh, portfolio side, kind of avoid the trap of trying to be like the patent people um, and measure your your productivity by the number of, of applications that you you file because there's a lot of reasons to file a trademark application and they are not a proxy for anything um, in the same way like you know patents are considered a proxy for innovation um, and you know it's important to keep those two two streams distinct um, which can be challenging when you know um, most uh, companies, mine included, the, uh, the the patent and the trademark uh, sides of, of uh, the uh, legal function are in the same roll-up. Um, you know, they, they have the same uh, senior e executive sitting over over them, and that person very often is a patent lawyer um, as you go further up the, uh, the, the chain there. So, you, you know, the, the, there's a, t a bias towards viewing those um, the number of trademarks you file as a product a proxy for your productivity when when that's not really uh, that accurate. And so, you know, doing the edu work of education um, is key to to um, setting the, the meets and bounds of, of what your value, you know, your value proposition is. Yeah, Joe Marie, can I just jump in and, and add a comment to what Sanjeev just said, Please. which is, you know, this is kind of an apocryphal a anecdote. But again, it's it's not always the numbers, but it's again, it's being realistic and having a good story. And I remember talking to somebody, uh, you know, it was at uh, an International Trademark Association meeting and it was kind of like my portfolio is bigger than your portfolio kind of conversation. And this person was bragging that they only file single class app because they want to show their superiors that they have more trademarks. And going back to your earlier point about to register, not to register, uh, you know, and renewals. Well, when it comes time for renewal, yeah, sure, you may be paying per class, but if you're paying somebody like me, your outside lawyer, to do it, filing one renewal for a five-class application is a lot cheaper than filing five single-class renewals. And so it's not the numbers don't always tell the true story. And like I said, be able to back them up and have a good anecdote, like, like Sanjeev said. You know, that, that's interesting. I wonder, if this isn't something that we discussed before, but how do people count their marks? When people say, how many marks do you have? Or how many registrations do you have? Do you count the number of registrations or do you count the number of total classes? Uh, I, mean, I do registrations. I do registrations. registrations. Maybe I should be doing classes. Yeah. I think it depends well, on your, it depends on who's asking. I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right, because sometimes more isn't better, right? Because uh, okay. sometimes you get the, why do we have all this? Right? But then a I'm, lot of I'm, times it is because you're talking about protection for, you know, particular classes. So they actually want to know classes because it's actually how much protection you have. So it depends on who's asking. So I guess the answer is know the data, count them both ways, and then <laughs> be nimble of what you actually <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, interesting. Um, you know, Sanjeev, you're very good at helping with the segues to from one topic to the next because you've already started us on the educating clients to maximize IP value while saving costs. Um, do you have anything further to add to that? Um, I, you know, so I'm I really sort of talking, I was talking about educating your your 
um, your management and right. your business about what their the the the, the expectations are. But right. um, I think it's it, it you know you you. Um, I mean, you want to do the education on what what you can offer. I mean, legal legal within the context of a, a um, the the corporate setting is never a a, a um, revenue generator. It's a cost center, and so as such, uh, you know, you're always having to to justify the the um, your existence um, and, and what you're contributing to the uh, um, uh, to the company bottom line and. Uh, it's a um, you know educating them as to educating the, the business as to why you know why we do certain things you know why don't we uh, let you use uh, the trademark as a as a verb in the advertisement you know why um, you know why is that that uh, that a problematic uh, uh, thing thing to, to to do why do we you know why why if you're coming out with something as truly a, a new product do you create your own generic um, uh, term for it, and and uh, uh, you know, then a, a apply a, a distinctive name to it. Um, it. You know, having those 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 discussions, even doing like a basic trademark one hundred and one type presentation to your your naming decision makers uh, and so on, can be a value to to getting them in the right mindset to to understand what um, what it is they need to be doing and and um, you know where they want to to invest their um, their, their resources, um, you know, because at every trademark is in some sense a, a, a consumer or customer education project as well. Um, it, it, it's nothing without the, the spend behind it to, um, uh, to, to build it into something that that's really can be protected. I mean, you, you register trademarks basically to sue people for um, infringement. I mean, that's that's the primary reason to, to, to do it. And, and you need to build, they need to build, they need to build, the business needs to build that value in. And so when, when you've, you've got something where um, maybe it's on the, the, the cusp, some people will say, well, you really, you should, we should, we really want to register this. So do you really want to do that? Are you really prepared to spend the money to, to, um, to make that a worthwhile proposition? Because it's not just the fees that we spend to, we, we pay to the, you know, government or uh, to the law firms that, um, that create the value. It's you guys doing the work in the marketplace uh, to make that happen. This is really where you want to put your 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 chips in, in, on this. Um, there's kind of this 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 view of of the registration has some kind of magic powers to to create um, to create value and and um, you know sort of educating of, of the business about you know, what it is registration does and doesn't get you is it can be can be valuable. Um, it's probably easier in a company with a more of a branding model like mine um, than with something more more like Michael's, where um, you know I expect. And Michael, you can correct me totally if I'm wrong about this, but you've got diff your your Hot Wheels and Barbie are probably their own uh, cost centers with their own P and Ls uh, and their own uh, um, uh, view of the of the world, and that's a different framework for for decision making, I think, than than what I'm looking at on, on uh, under my branding model. Michael. Uh, well, yeah, that's uh, that, that's probably true. I think um, you know when um, you know you're looking at a Barbie or a Hot Wheels or a Fisher Price. I mean, that's um, that's pretty important, um, and um, it's um, you know uh, you know part of this is just looking at the value. Um, you know, what, what what's generating revenue, right? Really. Um, but it is challenging to, uh, it is definitely challenging to, across many brands, educate all of the people uh, that need to be educated about, you know, how to maximize value there, for sure. And, you know, and I think we're looking at a, at a couple different things. We're looking at, I think education in itself is such a big thing. In, in just education about branding and protection and the costs associated with it, you know, even, even aside from the IP value while saving costs aspect. I mean, education, just that aspect is so important. And I think it's a big part of what all of us do. Um, we all do it probably differently, but it's not something we can just not do because I think it's something that we all understand. I'd like to think well, but I don't think it's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't think it's intuitive necessarily 
for people that aren't on the legal side, aren't in the brand side. So I think it's an important part of what we do. And then to talk a little bit, just back to the IP as an investment versus a cost center. You know, Sanjeev, I think it depends how your budget is set up. My budget, I have a revenue side too, because licensing revenue comes into my budget. So I have a revenue side and an expense side. Um, and to go a little bit to what Megan said before, I have an IP budget that is part of the overall officer of the general office of the general counsel budget but it is a discrete part that i administer with my team um, and because licensing is a part of that you know we see the revenue come into it and we look at how much is coming in and we say well look this is how much we took in this is this is paying for the brand protection program um, and some years it pays for it better than others but um that's that's kind of the idea and and we're lucky in that way that um, and we we fought over the years when they talked about moving parts of it um, into other areas, depending on where some of the revenue was being generated from or for which marks. Um, and we've tried to keep as much of it as we could with within our budget because it makes a good story at budget time. Mm -hmm. um, and we've also looked at if parts of it were to be moved out to more correlate with the areas that are doing more of the work that there were a way it could reflect in the budget and then be booked out. So I'm not a, I'm not a finance expert, but I think those are all things um, to think Jeremy, about. I think that's so lucky because we, at, 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 you know, we are an IP licensing business, essentially. Like, I mean, we create content, which creates the, you know, and then we license it out for, you know, whether or not it's toys or, you know, otherwise, or we're using it in our theme park. So it's all about what we can use, but we don't get to use, we don't get to take the benefit. Right. So, so it's, um, it's always challenging. And I know I've encountered situations where, we have to pay for everything and we use the, uh, the business's money and we have lots of different P&Ls across the entire business. We have to use P&Ls from folks, but then it doesn't always align with how people are getting money in. So that becomes really difficult to manage because if there are times when one business unit doesn't have what they need, because they needed those registrations downstream, but you're, at, you know, you have a lot of different competing interests. I think when it comes to, um, you know, when when your licensing activity is not exactly aligned with your, with your registration activity. Right, and obviously we're 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 not a licensing company. We're we're structured very differently. So for us, it's really sometimes we have to. It's obvious, I think, at your company that we have to own this so that we can license it. Sometimes at my company, it's not that obvious. And we're talking to teams. And when we get to the um, working with the C-suite um, discussion, it's, it's sometimes a little more challenging to make the correlation between why it's so important to put the money to invest to protect these marks and the domain names associated with them when we're not we're not a products company. Um, why do we need this? For you know, don't we just need a couple of these? Why do we need all this? We've got our volunteers out there doing whatever they're doing, and it can be, it can be a hard story to tell. And so it's we're lucky that we can at least say, but look at what we brought in. <laughs> you know, at least at least in this way, look at what we brought in. Um, and then one of the things that came up in one of our preliminary discussions is we talk a lot about what does it cost um, to protect this? Do, can we afford to protect this? But what if we lost the mark? What's the cost of that? And can we really afford that? And to maybe do some education from that through that lens or from that perspective. So I don't know if anybody had any other um, thoughts on this topic. Hearing Chris, okay. So I'll jump in and say when I was in house, you know, I was very lucky enough. For the most part, we didn't really lose marks. By, by lose, I mean mistakes or inability to fund something um you know even when budgets were tight our core marks were always protected and and perhaps not in every single country but in every country where we had significant significant sales they were protected but what i always found interesting about the educating clients part and working with the c-suite part was we're discontinuing this brand 
Oh, but by the way, we, we don't want anybody else to ever use these trademarks. So what can you do? Make, make sure nobody gets to use these, ever. but we don't want to invest any money in it. Um, so that, that's always a fun conversation. And, and that is, is frankly the more important conversation I think is, you know, in, in education is, you know, how, at least here in the U.S., you have rights if you're using but not registering necessarily, but, but overseas, it's, it's usually the flip, flip side of that. And so how do you work, how do you educate your, your management team on that? Like, and I don't know how often I received emails, it was at least once a year, you know, either directly from upper management or forwarded on from a board member about i just was backpacking somewhere in the himalayas and i saw this mark that you know used to be used by lee 10 years ago make them stop <laughs> you know and so here we are talking about brand versus budget <laughs> and, and so we waste good money just to make a board member happy you know it's not, <laughs> it wasn't smart but we did it um so there you are so i, I think that's you know how to avoid losing something yes that's important but also how to how to educate your team on what they're giving up is also important and, Thank you. oh sorry go ahead megan no i was just going to add to that too because kind of the other the twist in it again from a nonprofit side is it's not even just how not to lose it but how not to lose the I, I hesitate to say the goodwill associated with it, but the, the reputation, the the um, the value of it, and you know when we when we're enforcing our trademarks, you know we have we do that on multiple levels. You know we we run into often the really good-hearted person who wants to support our cause that is misusing the mark, using it without permission, you know, devaluing the brand in some way, but in a in a way that they're trying to help, and so. There's a, a lot of work that we do too to, to make sure that we're continuing to build the value in the mark by educating um, you know, supporters of our mission to use the marks correctly. So it's it's you know, there's an extra to wrinkle on our end of, you know, yes, we educate you internally, um, but we're also educating externally and making sure that, you know, we'll never ever get the revenue side of that, you know, the person who loved us and raised money and donated it, that doesn't come back to the education that we provided that particular person, but it, it definitely continues to grow, grow the brand and reduce the amount of cost there is to, um, to our team and to the organization to enforce it when we're constantly reinforcing that education message. Thank you, Megan. Um, I just want to remind the team, it looks like we've got about 11 and a half minutes left, so we'll get through the next topic or two. Um, and I want to say to the audience, we had kind of envisioned this as like a fireside chat, and I hope someday we can do this in person. It's wonderful to have the opportunity through platforms like Remo. But I think if we were all sitting in armchairs in a circle, it would be a different type of interaction. So um, thanks, everybody, for piping up and for being reactive. Um, let's talk a little bit about working with the C-suite, since it seems like we have started to touch on that organically already. Michael, you wanna lead us off? Sure, I'll just lead off here. I'll, look, I'm lucky because I've got my CEO going around uh, to investors uh, you know, in the media. You'll see him on you know, Mad Money with Kramer saying we're an IP driven, high performing toy company, right? So like, hey, I'm like, I got my budget then, right? Um, but uh, not, not always the case. And partly, um, you know, I heard a lot of uh, the others talk about the different models that they have where Monique, you know, has budgets sort of scattered and, and, um, and well, Mattel's model is I own the budget, right? Which is great because I have a lot of control, right? It's also bad because there's not a lot of visibility to like what I do, right? It doesn't really, they tell me to register something. They tell me to go after something. They don't see it on their, uh, you know, on their PL, on their cost center, on their budget, they're not responsible for it. And a, and a funny anecdote is, you know, a few years ago when Mattel was doing a lot less well than we're doing now, you know, somebody went out and hired a, a bunch of consultants to figure out where we could save money. And so they come in to talk to me and my team. And, you know, we meet with the business and I'm looking across at the president of our company. He's like, yeah, 
tell me what you do. <laughs> and I'm like, what? You know, and so we had to explain it and all this and try to, you know, justify what we were doing, which of course means, you know, how do we, how, how do you have to deal with the C-suite, right? It's like education, which we've talked about, you've heard that theme, communication, right? And then I heard that, you know, we had the discussion about ROI. That is so important how we prove our why. It's hard. It's one of the toughest things we have to do. But I like the the point Sanjeev and Chris, I think, made have that story. Got to have a story. You have a story somewhere. Even if it's just one, just have that story. And, and you know, depending on what your company is and where you are, um, you know, should have an IP policy and some kind of an actionable plan that the C-suite, you know, is buying into. So, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's, really, that's really critical. So, um, so uh, you know, I, I think in terms of talking with the C-suite, you know, continually sharing the successes that you have, right? And then also discussing the potential horrors and the war stories that you've been through are also important because, you know, they, they see that you're doing a raid in China and you've arrested people and, and or you've, you know, removed um, all the counterfeit Uno off of, you know, Amazon one, you know, one day, at least for a day. Um, and then, and then, um, or, you know, or they start seeing this, that's great. But then also, um, you know, when it does come up that another party is using a brand, you know, keep those, keep those uh, PowerPoints going. I have a PowerPoint uh, that I have set aside for like notable events and interesting things. I just, as soon as I see an image, in a comparison, I just throw it on there and I have it, right? And then we build PowerPoints after every case that I have. Every, I build actually this into the budget and I tell our, our litigators, after we're, when we win, you're doing a PowerPoint so that I have that later, right? To, in order to show the, you know, to sort of tell the story uh, about why that was important. When they, you know, and then, and then um, you know, look, the other thing I'm doing is I'm gonna, you know, we're setting up now we're setting up a virtual website for the law department and having an IP section there with a little trophy room of all the counterfeits that we've caught and captured over the years and all the successful stories and then you know, pointing people there. But when people come back, we're gonna have also a trophy case <laughs> of all the counterfeits. Literally. It just constantly reminds them of, of, of how, how important it is. And I'm going to come back to the story that I told a little bit ago when we, I got to Mattel 20 years ago and there were gaps in the Barbie brand. You know, you're going to have people in the C-suite, we're going to get it, like I do now, fortunately. And then of course, and then in the beginning, I kind of had somebody there, there too, said, Barbie's our flagship brand. Here is what it's going to cost to, if you want to take Mattel to the next level, really to protect our flagship brand. And you know what? I got it, right? It, it, it took a couple million dollars, you know, and they just stamped it. There we go. There's your budget. Thanks. That doesn't happen. That was like, I, I was incredibly amazed. Um, and, um, but that doesn't really happen with every brand, of course, because we all have limits. Um, but um, you'd be surprised without the education, um, without actually the communication with your C-suite, they're just going to think you're doing it anyway. And, we, and it becomes a thankless task, right? And, and when something does go wrong, it's going to be why or why won't what what happened? So so communication, communication, communication. No, I think that's a great point. I think when you said there's just no visibility, um, I think that that applies to a lot of us. We're only visible if there's a problem, right? Why didn't we have this as opposed to just when everything's going well and we're administering our own budget? Because my budget is set up like yours, but I mean, yours is much larger than mine. But it's set up the same way where if it's all running smoothly and I'm staying within my budget, nobody sees it. Um, and But you're right, communication, education, and key. Having people upstairs that get it is just amazing. Um, and I've had everything from, this is fantastic, we need to be doing more of this, to what do we need this for? I mean, and... And so education becomes um, enormous. I am mindful of time, and I want those of you who want to weigh in on this to be able to have the opportunity to do so. No, Sanji. No, no? I was going to say we, we have a question in the Q and A that we oh, should I probably see that. Um, address. So, would anybody like to tackle that? Let me read it for the uh, audience. If you're not seeing it, as in-house counsel, do you work directly with the marketing teams in the company 
or do you also oversee the legal issues with advertising marketing excuse me companies hired for specific marketing campaigns okay i can answer that real quick yeah. uh so i'm going to say i work directly with the marketing teams there is another lawyer who manages advertising type issues and her she and her paralegals dotted line reported to me so there are ip issues that are of course involved in that interesting maybe each of you can address that. yeah uh, my, my, our structure is a little bit uh, different. I mean, yes, I, I work uh, directly with the marketing teams. They're, they're one of my main client groups. Uh, there are other lawyers who handle some of the more traditional advertising uh, types of, uh, of issues, um, promotions and things like that. Uh, they do not report uh, into me. They, they are actually in a whole separate uh, reporting tree uh, un, under the, uh, the, the CMO's um, staff lawyer. So, uh, but uh, I work frequently with them. Um, uh, on on projects, Monique or Megan. I also work directly with our marketing teams. We have multiple multiple uh, marketing teams, so they don't report in, but we work across um, from our IP groups. The the marketing function is sort of in a different tree, and so but all the IP issues end up coming uh, coming through me. I've got nothing, nothing really new to add there. Also, just you know, working directly with our marketing team in house, and any IP issues that come up, they'll come um, through our marketing team and into me. Chris, even from the outside perspective, or from when you were with VF, well, from my time in house, you know, the answer was both. Um, and I owned the IP, I owned the relationship, and marketing was supposed. to to listen to me like i had the final say my team had the final say and so it was always enjoyable when they said oh well we've already gone to outside council in this country or wherever and they said it's okay and that <laughs> conflicted with our position um and so that was always fun and so now i'm very cognizant of that when i work with in-house teams sometimes them i'll say michael or sanji what do you want me to say Right. I don't want to contradict you guys. So like, wh what do you want the answer to be? Um, because, you know, I know that they own it. Uh, and from my time in house, there was nothing I hated more than the marketing teams. I disagree. And I've, I've engaged my own counsel from my budget and they said, it's okay. Yeah. Cause when the, when the company gets sued, it's my, me and my team that's defending. It. So right. I'm like, we own it check with us. So now as an outside counsel, I, I, I'm crystal clear with marketing teams. Have you spoken to your in-house counsel? Or when it's in-house counsel asking me for a second opinion, I say, you know, look, I'll give you my opinion. And then afterwards, tell me what you want so that we're on the same page. Yeah. And it, it, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say, it's interesting you say that, Chris, because oftentimes when I'm seeking an opinion from outside counsel, I deliberately withhold my thoughts on it because I would I don't want the outside mm -hmm. opinion to be affected by the exact impulse that you're you're well, uh, talking me, about. Me, I mean I may I may take that, that, that because I was present the uh, report up to the the client um, uh, about it. So it's interesting. It's just interesting perspective. I get where you're coming from, but I I'm just saying that well, I let, often let deliberately don't want that. Yeah, no, no, no. Let me be clear. You, you ask me my opinion, and I'll go, Sanjeev. I think it's X Y Z. Mm -hmm. And then after you and I have discussed it, I'll say, but what do you want me to write in the yeah. email to you that you can forward on? Like, yeah. I, I get it. I give you my unvarnished opinion. But okay. then I say, you know, what do you need from me? Yeah. And if you can give it, you will. Yeah, exactly. Because sometimes it's a matter of tailoring some of those thoughts. And yeah. yeah. So we, it, it, at my company, we work directly with the communications group. If, any, I, if it goes according to plan, if anybody's going to go to outside counsel, we do and then we write up the opinion um usually based incorporating that if we need to so uh i'm happy to say that diversity is at the forefront of everybody's minds because uh at the one of the earlier panels this morning i asked the in-house counsel uh, a question about how important diversity is um, it was a bit of a softball question. I, I knew what the answer was, but I was happy that everybody on that panel piped in and said that it's hugely important, especially for the outside counsel that they hire. 
So I, I wanted to tee off this program just with some background information. I know everybody listening in knows that diversity is hugely important, but I wanted to, to uh, mention some facts that have been published recently in various publications. Uh, the ABA Commission on Women in the Profession, of which I was a member and Araceli is a member, uh, has, has published a number of important reports. The most recent one is called In Their Own Words. And that states the disparity between men and women in law firms appears relatively early. Women are substantially more likely than men to leave their positions before partnership is decided. And women continue to disappear even after making partner. After the JD publication found that 40% of women and 49% of men were still employed in private practice after 12 years. Women of color fare even worse than white women and have the highest rate of attrition from law firms. Women of color represented almost 19% of the first and second year associates who left their firms in 2018 and 12% of all lawyers who departed that year. Another report by the Commission on Women in the Profession, the ABA's Visible, Visible and Visibility, Women of Color in Law Firms is the title. And it reports that women of color felt that they're missing out on desirable assignments, being denied formal and informal networking opportunities, missing client development and client relationship opportunities, and being denied promotion opportunities because of their race and or gender. They also reported finding it harder to meet billable hour requirements and build a book of business necessary for advancement in law firms, which was due in part to their relative lack of access to the very opportunities and relationships that would allow them to do so. They felt that they're often treated as tokens and trotted out to clients only when it would help the firm look good, but not necessarily in ways that help them further their own careers. Now, those are pretty staggering facts, even today. I know when I started law school about 27 years ago, the, the big issue was how many women were, were entering law school and graduating. The, the number of women and men have, have even out a lot. But in law firms, there's still a huge disparity. So I'm going to turn to our panel here, and any of you can pipe in, but I'd, I'd like for each of you to share your own experiences um, with some of these issues and, and uh, tell us what you think. So I'll, I'll kick off because I'm actually not at a law firm. <laughs> I'm at the Center for Reproductive Rights, so I'm at a global NGO. And, you know, part of why I, you know, care about this work and, and care about this panel and sharing and talking to you today is because for those of you um, who may be at a non-for-profit, which is a type of corporation, we suffer from the same afflictions that uh, women and women of color and people of color suffer in the private sector, whether it's in a law firm space or in a in-house counsel space. Um, there is a dearth of diverse lawyers um, and there's some just some added challenges that I know I experienced in really maintaining my commitment to working in public interest. But even then I had to do stint or did stints um, in the private sector as in-house counsel. And that's because of the financial cost. Um, you know, we're asking a lot of lawyers who are coming, especially lawyers of color, uh, including myself to you know, take these vows of poverty uh, when we're not coming from families of accumulated wealth. Um, you know, there's this lack of awareness of DEII. You know, a lot of folks think, well, you must work in public sector. It's so different than from being at a law firm. People must be woke. And that's almost a double challenge because uh, folks think they're woke. Uh, but then you hear a lot of the same comments like, you're so aggressive. Oh, being ambitious. That's not a really, you know, he we're here to do the Lord's work. Why are you being ambitious um, in your goals or what you're trying to achieve? And so a lot of the same challenges around gender, around the intersection of gender and race, you, you see them. You see that the hierarchy is the same. You have a very robust, you know, entry level staff attorneys. And then you have that thin thinning out as you go up to middle management and CEO levels where you see fewer and fewer people of color in some, you know, in some organizations, fewer women. Uh, I remember being a young lawyer in legal services, all the supervisors were men, all the staff and line attorneys were women. Uh, so we suffer from a lot of the same afflictions and I've had to navigate a lot of the same problems that 
my counterparts um, in law firms or in public sector or in um, private sector had to experience, except I just wasn't getting paid as much. <laughs> and I had other challenges um, that come with being in, in any sector, in any particular workplace. So I'm gonna stop there because I know that other folks definitely want to, uh, to chime in. Anyone else? Sure, I'll go next. Oh, go ahead. Does this matter? I'll go. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm also not in a law firm, and I'm actually, um, but I've been in law firms, right? And so <laughs> not that that gives uh, so it gives me a little credibility in things that I've talked about. So um, I currently am at Abby. I uh, I sit in this role. It's a newly created position, and it's it's in Abby's legal department. And my job is we have a company wide enterprise chief. Um, diversity and inclusion officer, but again, my goal, my role is primarily in the legal department, and so that you know, push out the initiatives we have, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. But we, you know, one again is make sure our matters are staffed with fifty percent women, and um, an increase. Uh, participation by underrepresented attorneys, and this is at the partner level. So it's not even associates. It's we're making sure that our matters are staffed with um, with the, with women and underrepresented attorney at a very senior role and substantive matter. And the reason this is important um, is because I can't. Uh, when I took this role, it was right at the beginning of COVID, actually, and when I was looking for my next thing to do. I thought, well, you know, I remember right at the beginning of COVID, all these firms, you know, they were being asked to stop work, right? Because no one knew what was going on. I know companies were um, asking their law firms to stop pencils down. And, you know, my fear was that what was going to happen was what happened, you know, 10, 11 years prior during the recession um, when I was in the law firm world. Um, now, I was very lucky because I was a bankruptcy attorney. So back then in a recession, I'm pretty busy. So I had hours, but I knew so many um, women and diverse attorneys who didn't have those types of hours. And so again, when they started laying off this, um, attorneys, many, many women and um, attorneys of color were being laid off. And the cover was, oh, well, they didn't have the hours, but in reality, well, no one ever gave it to them, right? And so again, you know, fast forward now, we want to make sure that again, I mean, we we have good work and we want to make sure it goes to women and underrepresented attorneys. And it's by doing that and just basically forcing it, that's what's going to change some of these um, experiences, right? Because how many times was I taken off work? Uh, I mean, I'm working on a matter and it was given to someone else, uh, a male, because my 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 the part my you know managing partner was well I want him to make partner and I'm thinking well what about me right um, again how many times did I not get invited to client dinners oh well I thought you might want to be home with your family yeah okay but you know the the white male always got invited and, and got come along and I have no I don't want it this is not a white male bashing <laughs> and please don't think that it is just you know it just those are the experiences that I had and just so you know my husband is a white male and I love him dearly and um and I think most of you all know him um because um I think this is the first time like I I'm on a conference or a panel and I'm being asked oh are you Michael's wife because he's usually Joy's husband <laughs> so let me pass on to the next person Actually, before um, you, you made some interesting comments, both you and Araceli, uh, Joy, yeah. and, um, I, I'm anxious to hear from Brianna and Keisha as well. But obviously, the the, the statistics that I, I stated at the outset, um, I am interested, and I think the audience might be interested in knowing, and you all have touched upon this, how they apply in-house as well. Because uh, the background for a lot of the research uh, explains that uh, pay disparity is one of the big reasons women leave law firms and they go in-house or they leave law firms and they start their own firms or um, not getting the opportunities like Joy mentioned is another reason. And some women in, in the research even said, you know, uh, you give us the hardest tasks to do, but then you don't give us credit for it. 
and um, the the male partners. And like you said, this isn't uh, you know a male bashing hour, mm -hmm. um, but we we can't skirt the issue. I mean, there there's there's an issue here, and um, you know, women not being invited for various opportunities because somebody assuming you need to get home with your family. Well, on the flip side of things, a lot of the men are paid higher, at least according to the research, because those in charge of the pay scale stated that the men have families to support. Uh, so, I mean, we could go on and on and on, but Brianna, maybe it looks like you were ready to speak next. I'm curious to know how all this plays out in house because you're in, uh, Keisha and I are the only two in law firms. Right, and Keisha, I know you were ready to say something. Do you want me to go or do you want to go? Oh, you go ahead and I'll just, I'll anchor at the end. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm in, I'm in, <laughs> I'm in house as well, but I also have been at a big firm and a small firm. So, um, and and prob I think I'm probably at my fifth or sixth company by now. And you know, the reality is, um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to to be here. And Lisa, thank you for continuing to make this a topic of conversation because there's there's so much to be talked about. And and then the question is, what action are we taking? Because it it continues to happen over and over and over. And I've seen it for years. I'm a 20 plus year attorney. And, um, you know, there's been there's been times when um, I, you know, I've, I've been given an opportunity to 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 go either to a law firm or to a company. And of course, I think sometimes you, you know, I in my situation, sometimes I question like, Okay, why why am I here? Because you're trying to to meet a a quota or a number, right? In hiring diverse candidates, um, or am I here because I'm the right person? I hope I'm here, you know, that I'm the right person, and I'm also not necessarily trying to meet a quota, but that you're actually trying to do something to um, to open up opportunities for for diverse candidates. Um, but at the same time, too, then it's once you have people in. The, in, in the space, then what are you doing to help develop them? And how are you inviting them to the table? Are you inviting them to these conversations? And are you actually making the effort to, to develop and provide opportunities? Or is it, I'm gonna, you know, you, you're in, and now I'm gonna create a ceiling so that you're you're stuck here and you can't move forward. And I had a situation, you know, um, one of the things we talked about was, you know, war stories. And I was thinking through my background and. And I had a situation where um, there were three of us that were kind of director levels and, and then had teams of attorneys under us. Um, and again, this is not a male bashing, you know, again, same disclaimer as everybody else, but it was two white males and myself, right? And when it came to um, promotion time, the other two were promoted and I wasn't. Right. And that came with a salary increase. And there was no context to why other than um, we were all working on on several deals and their deals had closed and mine had been delayed. And it was for things that were outside of my control. Right. But yet we were all doing similar work. We had actually all been told we were up for promotion. And all of a sudden I was in the situation where I'm being told, you know, to of the three colleagues, I'm the one that doesn't, you know, get promoted. And, um, and so again, it's, you know, what are we doing to bring to bring people in and then help develop them and make sure that we're, we're not only um, creating this diverse candidate pool, but we're also providing those opportunities for them across the board. And, and one of the things that I'm, I'm excited about, I at at Yum Brands, I joined a year ago. I was at Microsoft before, and Microsoft has always been also a leader in the space of diversity and inclusion, which I really appreciated everything that they were doing. And and you know, Yum's doing um, a, a lot of the same things. And I'm I'm thankful to be at the table to have these conversations about what are we doing for outside counsel? What are we doing for the people that we're bringing in? Um, how are we holding people accountable? And how are we making sure that it's not just you know that it's that if you're, you know, just like Joy mentioned, and I, I love the position that you have there is, it's not just about holding them accountable and making sure that the team looks diverse, but who are the people that are actually doing the work and are you giving people those opportunities? Yeah, so. absolutely. Uh, and I can attest to everything Joy's doing because she's, um, she's getting involved on a very national 
visible level. I know all of you are, and we're going to hear at some point in this hour what each of you are doing um, to really further the or or help the issue. Um, but Keisha, last but not least, before you you say something, Brianna reminded me um, when she sort of echoed my "this is not a, a male bashing hour." Uh, interestingly, I, I have found women to be an obstacle as well. And uh, I, I'll give you my personal example of that. Uh, I was at a law firm as a young associate and um, there was a very senior woman partner who was um, one of the early members of the firm. It was a fairly, about a 70 attorney IP boutique. And she said that we would, I was always very involved in association work. I'd always grown up around that and believed in that. I still do, and I'm still very involved. And she said that we will never support you if you want to run for president of the Women's Bar Association. I mean, literally said that to me directly, and my tongue was tied. And um, she was an impediment to my future at the firm, and I left the firm because of her. And um, and that's a sort of a sad story, but it happens all the time. So it, it really isn't just men. I mean, what, what we're talking about here is disparity uh, about how women are treated versus men, but often it's women at the top it, or it's men at the top, it's both. It, so it's not pointing any fingers at anybody, it's, it's pointing a finger at the problem no matter who's causing it. And, and there are lots of reasons for the cause. Keisha? Uh, thank you, Lisa. And, and I actually want to echo um, Lisa's comments because that has been my observation. I would say some of my biggest champions are actually men. Um, Other than- You know, women, women I, you know, I, there's a lot of issues there. <laughs> but anyway, um, we press on. Um, so, you know, uh, I would say, you know, this issue of diversity is, it's, it's, it's personal, I can, as you can tell. Um, and uh, there's some degree of frustration, I would say, because I remember when I first entered the profession um, about 15 years ago, it was a big topic. I mean, I think the ABA had recently issued a report. I still have that little book on my bookshelf here today, um, you know, about I guess the statistics that were, were kind of gathered and the things that should be done. And really, I would say in my observation, very little has changed. Um, and I would kind of echo some comments that Joy made that, um, you know, with the recession that we had um, in 08, uh, in that time frame, that actually things got worse, um, as crazy as it sounds. Um, and so it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a continuous thing trying to um, move the needle forward. I would say for me, it's part of um, my motivation in getting involved into FIDIPL, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, which is an organization um, that um, came about through the collaborative efforts of um, various bar, bar associations to really try and make a, a difference in um, advancing diversity in IP. So I'm a vice president and member of the board of trustees of that foundation. Um, but I would say personally, I mean, it's it's been quite a journey. Um, I would say in my observation, um, these, these issues are very, in most times I would say for me, I think they're very subtle. I mean, so subtle that sometimes you're not even sure what happened. Um, and, you know, that's a challenge, I think, with dealing with unconscious bias or conscious bias, because really, to be honest, you can't really tell. Um, I mean, read somebody's mind. Um, but I would say I've been relatively lucky um, in, in many respects because I've spoken to other individuals where their stories are very harrowing, to say the least, um, where they actually face blatant um, cases of, of bias. Um, I would say that, um, you know, what I have observed over the years is that um, quite frequently, you know, there is the little things that actually become, you know, the real obstacles. So, for example, um, I would say the course of uh, a diverse associates or in a women, a female associate um, course, you know, has been charted before they get to mid-level. 
Um, because a lot of times what will happen is that, you know, in terms of the law firm paradigm, which I am a product of a lot, you know, large law firm, and then I went off and, and um, did my own thing, opened my own shop about seven years ago, um, is that the, the assignments that a young associate needs to really demonstrate their skill, to be able to build skills so that they can be able to do more complex matters, you know, female associates, associates of color, they don't get those opportunities. And for those who may have gotten a bite at the apple, a lot of times is that if they make a misstep, you know, it, it's just like done at that point because, you know, they're being held to a different standard, whereas somebody else, um, Maybe, you know, it's like, well, it's, it's, a, it's a mistake that any young associates would make if it's a woman, if it's somebody of color. It's like, oh, my God, you know, this is what we were expecting anyway. So they essentially have kind of, um, you know, it, it's like they're, it's predictive to, to some degree, right? And so what will happen at that point is like, well, Keisha doesn't do a good job, so I'm not going to give her anything else. Um, other stories that I have heard in the past as well is where um, if, you know, associates of color, diverse associates, you're being asked, and I have experienced that myself, I remember as a summer associate, it was very disconcerting, um, where, you know, I, I would say for me, I, I mean, I have a PhD in organic chemistry, you know, and I remember it was a technical issue for a patent and I'm being asked multiple times, are you sure? And I was like, this is my field. Why are you asking me if I'm sure? You know, because I, the person that was in the room did not have the level of technical skill that I had, but I have spoken to other individuals, also um, diverse backgrounds who have similar experiences where, you know, when they, they're given an assignment, it's, it's as if there is a, um, doubt that's inserted into whether or not they will be able to complete that task at hand. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that, I would say, you know, it's it's something that um, we've talked at nauseum, in my opinion, um, about all these issues, because it's the same conversation we've been having for the last, in my, from my experience, 15 plus years, um, and something different has to be done. I think um, the traditional route of really trying to hold large fir law firms accountable, I, I do have my doubts as to how much yield that will really give because in the past, that's really what has been done um, versus really looking into other avenues like, you know, what I've um, found out in my time, kind of getting more involved in this diversity issue as part of being part of the nipple is that, for example, um, a lot of women who leave, and I actually found this out when I left and did my own firm, is that a lot of women disappear, but they actually don't go away entirely. They go off and they hang their own shingles or they join a very small firm um, and they are invisible. They become invisible. Um, and so, you know, I, I think as we look towards really making an impact, you know, I think corporations who are, are well positioned, actually, I would say the biggest drivers of change in this area um, is to really give those smaller firms the opportunity to grow. Because though, if you can get these women owned firms, you know, kind of give them those support in those early years, they're going to become that mid level firm and then that large firm, and then it will keep on paying dividends. So I, I feel like to move forward, we have to do something different. The same thing about kind of holding the feet, um, large firm feet to the fire. I think that's just that's just not it's not, not going to take us where we need to go. If yeah, all all really if, good points, Keisha. And you know, I started my firm 19 years ago. Kind of hard to believe, and I I left. Uh, I was a partner at a major law firm, and you know, I I left my colleagues, I like the work, but I was really tired of the politics and the subtleties that you mentioned. And um, I was actually one of the earlier women to start an IP practice. And it's literally been the most rewarding thing I've done. And the hardest thing, honestly, is when women come to me and I mentor a lot of women and, and men, but a, a lot of women, they come to me all the time because I respond to everybody. And, you know, what do you tell them? They, they A lot of them don't want to go to big firms or don't want to go in-house because the, the problems are all, you know, the same everywhere. 
And, uh, you know, I know, Keisha, you're maybe feeling a little negative or the conversation is getting tiring about diversity, but I think we do have to keep talking about it. I know a lot of people do roll their eyes um, when they hear that word and they think, okay, it's just an initiative. I have to comply because the, my client is telling me, you know, I have to comply, but let's hope it gets better than that, than just filling a, a quota. I think the, the women on this panel are a great example of knowing that the firms they're hiring aren't just filling their table with you know, a, a group of minorities and women just to satisfy what they're looking for. Because I know for a fact that Brianna and Joy, especially who I've worked with, uh, they're, they're looking for substantive expertise from women and minorities. They're, they're not just tokens. Um, so I think it's a really important conversation to have and, and to, to keep it going. Can, can I just, just jump in though? I mean, I think my frustration has been that we also are not having, we're still not having very honest conversations about diversity. Like we, we put, and I'm having been on in-house counsel, we put in-house like it's on a pedestal. But if you look at Law Geek's survey in 2019, where they surveyed 34,000 general counsels, the profile of a typical general counsel is male, 35 to, to 54, and only nine plus years of experience. I don't know a woman lawyer of any color or shade who would ever think that she's able to be a general counsel after nine years of experience. And I think that's a reality. And I think that, you know, I, I think we, we love to hate law firms because they sometimes, especially big law firms, they're such an easy target. But I think we have to have really honest conversations about what's happening. And, and I'll just take, you know, my area in, in, the, in the global work we do around reproductive rights, we got a lashing last summer for having so many white women led organizations, um, you know, which is, you know, kind of like the, the, the parallel to this, right? To, you know, in-house majority of general counsels being male. So I think part of the challenge we're having is that we really have to have honest conversation that no place is perfect, but some are doing some good things, some are, maybe failing on some things, but really have an honest conversation. And and also among women, you know, one of the other reports, uh, Lisa, as you know, that the ABA did was this talk isn't cheap about women, both white women and women of color having honest conversations about what our challenges are and, and not really um, addressing what are some of the underlying challenges. I think we've all talked about how we've all had issues with female and male supervisors mm -hmm. of all stripes. So I, I think that, we we just we don't we're just we're still i still feel frustrated we're not having really honest uncomfortable conversations about it yeah so aerosoli and and everybody what what are the challenges i don't i don't disagree with what everybody is saying here but what are the hurdles because especially for those of you that are in house i mean at least you're addressing the the law firm problem because you can you can demand that your clients have a certain profile uh, of lawyers that that you're working with but but in-house even i mean what what are the obstacles why why can't we talk honestly about this i mean people are I mean, the conversation is happening well one of the reasons they brought me in is so they could do it right and i think a lot of people yes they they're exhausted or or what happens is um my role or role similar or people who you know they're the diversity representative at their firm or their company. I mean, that's not their full-time job. That's, you know, again, they volunteer for it because it's important to them. And then, and obviously for years, that's what I was doing prior to. And so, um, so my last job before I took this role, I was actually a general counsel. I was um, for five and a half years for the economic development arm for the city of Chicago. And, you know, I had to work to get that title, right? I actually, how did I do it? I created the position myself. I made myself, um, you know, in a place that they needed a lawyer. I was there, I was doing the work. I became the general counsel. Prior to that, again, my work was in law firms. Um, but, you know, you talk about uh, what we do at Abby, again, one of the reasons I took this role is because we really mean it, right? Um, even though we're demanding that our firms um, make sure they increase their diversity, we're, you know, look, we, we are a company that we're trying to practice what we preach too. And just again, okay, 
our bench has in the past like years since I've been there, again, the increase um, in diverse and women attorneys is just, I mean, it's triple. A big part of it, again, um, I think, Brianna, you asked, is it because we're trying to meet a quota? No. I think what it is, is we're trying to create an environment where there are more attorneys and more diverse attorneys. And so people feel comfortable applying, right? Um, I wish I could show you, um, our, we just printed a, a year in review handbook about all the new faces that joined us in the past 18 months. And when you look through it, it's like the United Nations and they're all people from just amazing backgrounds, right? Um, we have scientists backgrounds. We, again, we have journalists. We, um, it's just amazing the different type of people that, that are here now. And a big part of it is because prior, prior, you know, in the old days, um, we're actually in, uh, Abby sits in North, it's not even Chicago. It's like almost Wisconsin. And um, a lot of people work there, um, you know, when they were looking for, when they had open positions, they just called their, you know, friends and family, right? And a lot of it happened to be people who look like them. And um, and then as they started realizing that we are not getting the talent we need, how do we diversify? You know, one of the targeted um, uh, initiatives we put in place is, but, where are you looking, right? And so you make a conscious effort to make sure that um, when I have an open position, it goes to the NAMWOLF team, the National Association of uh, Women and Minority Owned Law Firms. It goes to um, the NBA and not the basketball team, uh, not the basketball league, right? The National Bar Association. Um, it goes out to NAPABA, MCCA, um, the black women lawyers. I mean, we are pushing our open positions, um, you know, out to a much larger population. Our, our talent recruiters, we want to make sure that um, when we ask for uh, recruiters, that they actually are diverse because they're the ones with the network, right? They know where the talent is. And by working with them directly, we realize that we, we're demonstrating that, look, we have a really good culture here that is welcoming and, and it's growing. And so people, you know, people actually want to come and apply now. And I think if you do that, that's, that's one of the things that's very encouraging, right? Because before just people just didn't think that way. And so when you asked about the obstacles and barriers, it wasn't really there. It was just a different way of thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just going to echo that. I think a, a lot of it is, you know, when we talk about obstacles um, or barriers or whatever, you know, why are, why is that needle not moving as quickly as we want it to? And, um, and, and the question is, like, what exactly are we doing? How are we measuring those metrics? And, and I think, you know, Joy, you touched on the recruiting piece. Like, are we looking in the right places? I mean, I know today there are still some law firms, some big law firms that only go to certain law schools mm -hmm. they still do today right or or they or they want students with a certain grade point average or whatever it may be they have some very very strict criteria because i have a lot of those partners that will reach out and say hey if you know of an opportunity for for this particular person that i'm mentoring you know they're awesome they're great can you know but they're not at the right school and so we can't bring them into the firm and so the fact that in, in 2021, almost 2022, that is still occurring is really, um, it, it's not going to help move the needle forward, right? And so then the question is, how do we, those of us who are in these positions, do things that we need to to make sure that we're creating those opportunities, opening those doors, increasing our, our area and span? I mean, I, I meet with our recruiters all the time. One is because... Like when I first came in, I was a one person show for digital and technology. And then I've now had the opportunity to hire six people. And um, and so when I worked with my recruiter, I'm like, you know, did how they're like, well, we're not really getting much input. Well, where exactly are we looking? Right. And so as soon as I, I put it on LinkedIn and connected it to the H and BA, I had tons of people, right? And the Asian Pacific group and the African American and the Nat like what's that network that we're using because if we keep going to the same places we're going to continue to get the same results right and then i think the other piece to it too is not just 
um, the pipeline and what we're where we're recruiting. But the other one is um, is what are we doing once we also bring in you know people and and the other one is is just retention and what we're doing and. Um, I, I had an opportunity to go to a conference on diversity and inclusion a while back and the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks, Cynthia Marshall spoke. And one of the things I really love that she said, and Lisa, you may have heard me say this before is that, you know, we're, we're, um, when we're bringing, we're bringing people in, we, we, we need to invite them to the dance, but it's not just about the invitation to the dance. It's about showing them how to dance and then actually inviting them to dance. And so, you know, how, what's that mentoring? What's, how are we making sure that we're that we're growing and developing people and letting them know that there's opportunities to be in the position of general counsel or assistant general counsel or you know these C-suite positions? Um, so there's got to be. And then I think the other thing that Araceli said that I really really liked was that we're not really having the authentic conversations, right? We dance around the issue, but we're not being authentic and genuine about hey, we really have to do something different. So. Yeah, well, those phenomenal comments, all of those. And actually, that's a great lead into the question that was um, posted in the Q&A box by Elania uh, Torres. Sorry uh, if I pronounced that wrong. Um, but, you know, we're talking about senior women and she asked a good question, which is for young attorneys or rather young in our career, what can we do since we don't have a seat at the hiring table or places of influence yet? Uh, so, you know, we've been talking so much about women who are a little bit, well, so starting when you're an associate, but then moving up the ranks. But what about the, the really young attorneys who uh, either are looking for a job or um, probably don't feel comfortable either in-house or in a law firm speaking up um, against maybe uh, somebody that is bothering them or unfair treatment or, you know, we're all sort of taught to keep our mouths shut because if you don't keep your mouth shut, uh, you're not going to move forward. And that's really a sad fact, but it's true. Um, so, <laughs> Sorry, you know, I laugh because every time I hear that, I'm like, don't be the best thing no one ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, kind of on a on the same level. I I will never ever forget this as long as I live. I was a uh, I think I was a fifth year associate at my first firm, and I was I forget the title I was given, but I was sort of um, uh, had the title of being a mentor to, or I was like an ombuds, um, ombudsman where people could come to me with problems. And there was a woman who came to me. Uh, she was a young patent attorney, patent associate, and she was being harassed by a senior male associate who was up for partner. And I, and uh, and the harassment was pretty bad. So I I urged her to go to HR. And I told her I would go to HR for her if she wanted me to. Um, and I told her I'd also go to the managing partner of the firm. She did nothing. She, she was afraid. Uh, she was afraid no matter who went and, and told on this guy that she, would afraid, she was afraid it would affect her career. And she left the firm. And she went to, actually she went to the same firm I ultimately went to where I became a partner and um, I, I'm pretty positive. I actually haven't looked her up in a while, but I think she ultimately made partner at that firm. But how sad is that? Um, and she was a young associate. So sort of like the question that was just posed, what do you, what do, you do for the young people? I mean, what do you, what do you tell them? Um, so, so, I mean, I'm trying actually, you know, cause your, your anecdote about the harassment brought to mind one that I actually, um, and one firm that I was at, uh, a colleague of mine also was sexually harassed by a, a senior associate. And she shared it with me one day. We went to lunch and I said, that's just crazy. I mean, we need to go and talk to the, the practice, you know, the, the partner for our practice group. And she did. And the firm handled it in a way that I have to say I was, I was jaded at that point. I really was because... I don't think it was handled in a way that was truly addressed. First of all, it was questioned whether or not it really happened. I mean, when she told me, I believe, because I mean, who would make up something like that, you know? Right. Um, so it was like, you know, they were questioning her whether or not she, you know, um, it was true. 
then you know like they they try to you know i guess you have their compliance for hr whatever it is and then he because he was her direct supervisor and she felt unsafe it was that bad she felt, actually felt unsafe um and you know they separated them where he didn't supervise her anymore but then after a few months they they put it back right and then it turned out after i left the firm that he had done this to like a member of the legal staff. I mean, like the um, legal secretary as well. This was not the first time. Um, and so, you know, that's maybe for another discussion, but you know, like I would say, you know, speak up. I mean, I wouldn't put yourself in an unsafe situation, but it kind of getting back to the original question. I, I think, you know, one, one approach is really when you're a young associate, like the truth is that you don't really have a, a lot of power uh, but you have to find other ways to be able to to move forward and that you're not yeah. really kind of impacted. So I would say, like, try and find, like, a mentor. And I know a lot of law firms have mentorship programs. I've been through a few of them that they typically don't work. But try and find somebody who can, you know, it can be your sounding board, can give you advice based on their own experiences. You don't have to be in the firm, can be outside your organization. Um, and, you know, so they can give you advice, like, you know, if, if you feel that in your early years, you feel that you're not getting opportunities, they can tell you, okay, maybe you should cut your losses here and move on to another firm, yeah. you know, because it's just not worth fighting for. Yeah. But I would say like your, your best thing until you can be able to kind of get the credibility and the, the that kind of quote unquote power is really to lean on others, you know, to get advice so you can know how to navigate. Yeah, absolutely. Any uh, can, I add, can I add? To, I'm going to add to that also. Um, I was fortunate that I didn't have those type of um, situations, uh, situations in the law firm, in the law firm that where I work. Where I work. But I will say I that. Say that um, Everybody think, needs to mute. Uh, there, there we go. Okay. But um, I will say that I've been in situations where I'm being harassed by the client. Or I'm working on matters, right? And so when you bring that up, you, you know, you get a don't just don't do anything that's our biggest client so don't upset them yeah right so, but i'd actually um you know i want to go back to what brianna was saying earlier about what do we do about the pipeline and demonstrating for young attorneys what is out there and where we recruit um lisa can we talk about the different projects and the yeah, initiatives please, we have? Stay away, please good so this is my again my favorite part of this job i have two projects one involves lisa and that's hiring minority and women-owned law firms. Again, while yes, we are encouraging the large law firms that we spend to increase um, diversity within um, the firm, we also want to make sure we give opportunity to, um, again, uh, women, again, minority women-owned law firms. Because if you think about it, part of the reasons they started is because they were just tired of being in the big firms, right? I mean, they have the talent, they the, they have the client support, and at some level, they're like, you know what, what we, we, we should just start our own firm. And by doing that, um, you know, they, like Lisa, very developed niche practice areas. You know, one of the things we want to do is go find those firms, right? Go find those and, and give them opportunities. But the other one is my other favorite project is, um, Again, Brianna asked about the firms recruiting about at the same, if you don't recruit at the right schools, or you don't uh, um, recruit um, with a certain grade point um, average. So my next project is, um, my, my other favorite project is, we, we call it our HBCU law schools. So there are only six HBCU law schools left in the country, if you can believe it. Um, it's, it used to be 23 because of funding, support, it has now dwindled to six. Um, again, firms, when we ask them, hey, are you recruiting at HBCU law schools? They say yes, and I ask them, that's not Howard, because again, that's kind of the trend. Okay, it's acceptable to recruit at Howard now. It used to not be, now it is. But then what about the other five? Um, so we work with three of the other five, um, NCCU, North Carolina Central, FAMU, Florida um, A&M, and Southern University Law School, which is um, actually in my hometown, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which I know very well. These are three, the other two schools, Texas Southern, they do quite well in Texas, um, and UDC, which is in DC, and, and by the benefit of them being in DC, they, they have a lot more access to other opportunities. You know, they don't need to just look at law firms. They have government um, 
opportunities. But again, so I we work with these three schools. We met with them. We came together and we tried to work out partnerships um, with them that how can we better prepare your students, right? Because not everyone's going to be the valedictorian. Not everyone's going to be, um, you know, have the best grade and, and for all sorts of other various reasons. And so when we met with the schools, what they asked us, they asked us a couple things. One, can you bring people to our school to recruit, right? And we're like, yeah, and why wouldn't we? Um, two, can you help us work on programs? Like, well, one, what do you look for for you know attorneys that work at Abbey? Is it a skill set? Is it um, something that you know something you, that can be taught? Um, and you know, even learning how to like work a deal, right? I mean. And so what we're trying to do is work with them on programs, you know, whether it's, um, again, with a bunch of my IP colleagues, you know, helping, like teaching um, the students. This is what go, this is either the steps like in a patent prosecution to what look for, right? They teach this um, oh, you, uh, PTAP class, PTAP certification. So we're having IP attorneys help um, teach these schools with science backgrounds. Um, again, so again, that's something they can, you know, help give them a legs up, right? Um, what else is there? Again, teaching them, you know, going in, helping them interview, helping them showcase where their other talents are, right? Like, um, and, and, you know, bringing them to our, like we create this one, one L internship program where students come and apply. And, you know, we don't pick the students from the biggest name schools or with the best grades. We pick the students that, have you know the, the, the potential, right? They, 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 you know, just something happened in their life um, that just whatever obstacle and barrier just preventing them from being there. But you know, they're they're high performers. They're driven. They're hungry. And we brought those kids in, spent eleven weeks with them, and now, like, with you know, again, our support, like, I mean, it, it, it's it's trajectory changing for them, right? Like, they would have never been looked at by any of these law firms, like. Our interns are now, they started this program a few years ago. Well, not since I've been here, we expanded it. I mean, they're being hired by all the big firms. And again, so, you know, they have the ones who were here, um, you know, they're being hired by the Finnegan's. <laughs> um, my, by um, FAMU, her um, student with the science background and her training this summer about patent prosecution, patent litigation. She got an offer from Finnegan, right? Um, another one got one from Latham. Again, we are trying to make sure whatever obstacle there is, if there's a way we can help fix it, we want to do that. So. Yeah. Let me let others have a chance. I could go on and on. <laughs> no, Joy, that's terrific. And I can attest to the fact that you really walk the talk and so does Abby. I mean, everything you're doing for for the law students and the, the young lawyers is really phenomenal. Um, I just want to add that I think everybody on here knows who's been practicing law for quite some time that it's not just where you went to law school that's going to make you a good lawyer. I have hired people that have been incredibly bright, but they had not the best judgment or they didn't know how to manage cases or they weren't responsive with clients or they weren't respectful of clients. And, uh, you know, they're not going to last. So it takes a, a lot of well-rounded people to ultimately be a good lawyer. And I'm glad that you are working with NAMWOLF and looking to these uh, avenues to, to hire the right people. Anybody else want to pipe in? I know, Keisha, you want to mention Fidipple and what you're doing? Yeah, so that was about to do that. So, Tell people um, what Fidipple is. So um, Fidipple is it's a mouthful, but uh, it is foundation for um, the advancement of, of um, advancing diversity in IP law. We recently changed our name to be more specific. But it's kind of in line with what Joy is discussing. Um, you know, we have been around for about 20 years, kind of under the radar, and we had been giving um, scholarships to diverse applicants, um, you, know, you know, in patents, trademark, and in copyright kind of um, fields. And uh, basically, we would just, you know, provide us uh, financial um, support in, in, the, in the form of a scholarship. Um, and, you know, we really had, um, you know, some real kind of soul searching in the last few years and decided to retool the program that we have 
to become a high touch program because the one thing that we um we observed was there's an issue not just with the pipeline but there's an issue when it comes to attainment um and our thoughts were in terms of addressing the pipeline is you know can we provide uh candidates with opportunities so that they can be their best their best selves so as part of the high touch program you know uh, they get um, internships, so, you know, as you know, as part of the program, you know, we are we are partnering with law firms, with corporations to give individuals opportunities to get some experience in the patent field um, before they even get the chance to apply for a job and essentially start to help to build their resume. Um, and we also provide mentorship support. So there, you know, at this point, the mentorship program and Lisa is um, the chair for for that committee um you know is focused on partnering with various members of the board of trustees but you know these are individuals who are in-house who are in law firms um that can provide um the wealth uh, of their experience in in the ip field and be able to share that with their mentees and really be a sounding word for them um and the ex expectation is that you know we've had a lot of interest i should say from stakeholders from law firms from corporations in terms of the scholars that we have and these scholars are coming from from um hbcus they're coming from berkeley from um, harvard i mean we, we basically we don't really limit for our program um where the um prospective scholars could apply from but they can apply from anywhere um and at the, this point the program is limited to um, STEM trained individuals. So we are, um, you know, we as part of our retooling, rather than just um, accept individuals who are already in law school, we are trying to now recruit from um, individuals who are thinking about going to law school, who have engineering backgrounds or they have other science background, because you know there is some amount of, um, you know. You don't have enough in the pipeline when it comes to diverse candidates of STEM, STEM training. It, it isn't an issue. I mean, you, to be frank, you have, and that's something that was uh, an issue when I was in graduate school. You just don't have a lot of people who are diverse um, that have STEM training. I mean, it's an issue in those fields, but as, as you can imagine, you know, patents, for example, you know, we get like a subset of that group and that group is already anemic. So yeah. it trickles down for us as well. We have uh, four minutes left, so Brianna and then Lisa. Quick. Yeah, and I'll just say something just really quick. I, I think to answer the question that was in the chat about what can you do, I think the key is um, what I'm hearing also is just about, you know, one is we we are in positions to be mentors. So all that to say that for students who are listening, like it's really important or young lawyers, right, to be um, reaching out and um, when when you hear speakers say reach out to me. I, I'm happy to be a mentor. Like we really mean it. I have tons of mentees and happy to talk to anybody. So I think that's key is for us to serve as, as mentors. I think the other thing too is, um, is that, you know, we talked about a, lo a lot of different bar associations that you can join. And, and a lot of times the bar associations and law firms or organ or corporations are coming together and, and working to find opportunities as well. Um, whether it be for internships or for um, mentorships or any of the above. I know I can speak to the Hispanic National Bar Association. Um, Jorge Gonzalez, who's at, at AbbVie and myself, has served as co-chairs for the IP law section for a few years. And, you know, Microsoft had started the Intellectual Property Law Institute where we would bring in um, you know, students who were ready to their second and third year of law school, ready to graduate with with science background or an interest in going into soft or hard IP. Um, Microsoft also had done some other companies will hire internships where they're like, we know you just graduated from law school. You may not have a an offer at a, at a big firm, but come in and we'll help train you. And then we can connect you with law firms or other organizations or we'll hire you ourselves. So um, anyway, Araceli, I didn't know if you had anything in the last three minutes. Yeah, right. yeah. And Keisha, thank you for everything you're doing with Fadipal. Phenomenal, phenomenal organization. Brianna, thanks for your remarks. Araceli, close it, close it down. 
I will just say, I'll end it with a piece of advice. Uh, we're often over-mentored, under-sponsored, and never coached. And I think that it's great to have mentors, but find a sponsor, someone who you can tie your brand to, and start saving your money and get a coach. Don't rely on your organization to get that for you, no matter whether you're public, private, or at a law firm. If you were sick, you would still go to the doctor, right? Your career is such a big part of your life, so invest in yourself. Um, because how can you expect anybody else to if you don't? So I think that's what I would say. Um, and we have to sometimes forge our own paths. As Ellie, I love that about the coaching because ironically, after this session, I go meet with my coach. So I <laughs> love that. <laughs> you know, I, I have never heard that. And I've been doing this for 8 billion years. So I'll give you about one minute to explain to me and maybe everybody else. What do you mean by a sponsor? If you're Say you're Eliana who asked that question. What do you tell her? What do you mean by a sponsor? One find, find a sponsor, someone who has power, who can speak truth to power behind yeah. closed doors, who if you run into a problem, they have the gravitas to mitigate any backlash. Mm -hmm. Or on the flip side, they are on the inside. They know who's getting assignments. They know how to influence uh, allocation of assignments. They do hiring. They do promotions. I mean, those are sponsors, which is not always a mentor you can you're anybody can mentor you someone can you find a sponsor it happens a lot of ways i mean i've i've like yeah. asked people to be my sponsor i've worked towards that or i've had people say i want to sponsor you and i'm like well go on and sponsor me I just <laughs> you know? i've never heard of this this is so. phenomenal hey daryl you can use another hour <laughs> it is it is it's definitely a thing but i would say like you know you need uh, in the last few seconds you know that's something that because uh, a young young associate or young um that you look for that if you don't have one of those a sponsor or mentor you may want to find somewhere else because and that's going to be your indicator of success absolutely Everybody, thank you so much you guys are awesome highest respect for all of you honestly <laughs>